Dramatis Personae of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae, narrated by Mary J. Lord Don Charles of Aragon, read by Sarah Partial. Lord Juan Fernandez de Velasco, read by Sarah Partial. Senor Don Pietro Enriquez de Acevedo, read by Joseph Partial. Duca Feria, read by Joseph Partial. Bravo One, read by Johnny Alexander. Bravo Two, read by Tricia G. Lucy, read by Kay Hand. Don Abondio, read by Eduardo Courtright. Perpetua, read by Beth Thomas. Renzo, read by Larry Wilson. Betsy read by Isabella Bruce. Agnes read by Lindsay Anderson. Don Roderick read by Lambda. Maid read by Ethel Bruce. Zeka Garbuyi read by Joseph Tabler. Brother Galdino read by Tricia G. Gentleman read by Eduardo Courtright. Gentleman's Brother read by Jason in Panama. Friar, read by Michelle Eaton. Father Christopher, read by Eduardo Courtright. Voice 1, read by Christine G. Voice 2, read by Lydia. Voice 3, read by Tricia G. Voice number 4, read by Jesse Yoon. Voice 5, read by Michelle Eaton. Voice 6, read by Michelle Eaton. Ruffian One, read by Michelle Eaton. Aged Domestic, read by Lydia. Podesta, read by Lian Yao. Count Attilio, read by Beniamino Massimo. Tony, read by Thomas Peter. Tony's Wife, by Ethel Bus. Manico, read by Gabi. Servant, read by Lydia. Grizzo, read by Jason in Panama. Landlord of the Inn, read by Michelle Eaton. Gervais, read by David Purdy. Constable, read by Melanie T. Ambrose, read by Lian Yao. Messenger, read by Catherine. Friar Fazio, read by Recording Person. Ruffian Two, read by Sonia. Boatman, read by Gabi. The Friar Superior at Monza. Read by Tricia G. Gertrude, read by Sarah Terry. Father of Gertrude, read by Thomas Peter. Uncle, read by David Purdy. Attendant, read by Michelle Eaton. Abbess, read by April Walters. Vicar, read by Jason in Panama. Princess, read by Kay Hand. Prince, read by Thomas Peter. Traveler, Read by Catherine. Woman One, read by Michelle Eaton. A Boy, read by Lydia. Man One, read by David Purdy. Stranger, read by Gabby. Porter, read by Lian Yao. Angry Mob Member One, read by Christine G. Angry Mob Two, read by Michelle Eaton. Angry Mob Member Three, read by Tricia G. Angry Mob Member 4, read by Michelle Eaton. Angry Mob Member 5, read by Eva Davis. Angry Mob Member 6, read by Sonia. Ferrer, read by Eduardo Courtright. Coachman, read by Lynette Geisel. Superintendent, read by Thomas Peter. Guide, read by Lindsay Anderson. Host in Milan, read by Lian Yao. Customer 1. Read by Lydia. Customer 2, Milan. By Jason in Panama. Boy 2. Read by Beniamino Massimo. Hostess. Read by Kay Hand. Officer 1. Read by David Purdy. Officer 2. Read by Michelle Eaton. The Notary. Read by Zames Curran. Passerby 1. Read by Lydia. Passerby 2. Read by Tricia G. Passerby 3. Read by Lindsay Anderson. Old Woman One. Read by Ethel Bus. Host in Gorgonzola. 
Read by Lian Yao. Customer One. Read by Michelle Eaton. Customer Two. Read by Lindsay Anderson. Customer Three in Gorgonzola. Read by Gabi. The Merchant. Read by Jason in Panama. Fisherman. Read by David Purdy. Silk Worker. Read by Lydia. Bartolo. Read by John Burlinson. Courier. Read by Lydia. Quarters by Ethel Bus. Count. Read by Thomas Peter. Father Provincial. Read by Jason in Panama. Francesco Rivola. Read by David Purdy. Giuseppe Ripamonte. Read by David Olson. The Unknown. Read by Adrian Strowett. Bravo 3. Read by David Purdy. Bravo 4. Read by Tricia G. Emissary of Egidio. Read by Sonia. Nibio. Read by Michelle Eaton. Old Woman 2. By Ethel Bus. Egidio. Read by Lynette Geisel. Martha. Read by Sarah Terry. A Priest. Read by Beniamino Massimo. Crossbearer. Read by Michelle Eaton. Cardinal Federigo Borromeo. Read by Larry Wilson. Valid. Read by Benemino Massimo. The Tailor. Read by Lian Yao. Woman 2. Read by Michelle Eaton. Young Daughter. Read by Lydia. The Young Son. Read by Asher Gravi. Curate. Read by David Purdy. Donna Prosette. Read by Jesse Yoon. Don Ferrante. Read by Tricia G. Don Gonzalo, read by Tricia G. Dr. Tadino, read by Beniamino Massimo. Woman 3, read by Lydia. Historian, read by Lian Yao. Governor, read by Tricia G. Monato 1, read by Tricia G. Monato 2, read by Michelle Eaton. Friend of Renzo, read by Lian Yao. Sentinel, read by Gabi. Man 2, read by Lynette Geisel. Woman, Plague Victim 1, read by Michelle Eaton. Woman, Plague Victim 2, read by Lydia. Woman 3, read by April Walters. Woman 4, read by Sonia. Commissary 1, read by Eva Davis. Commissary 2, read by Tricia G. Monitor 3, read by Recording Person. Father Felix, read by Michelle Eaton. The Widow, read by Sarah Terry. Listener, read by Lydia. The Marquis, read by Tricia G. Bergamaskin 1, read by Lydia. Bergamaskin 2, read by Michelle Eaton. Bergamaskin 3, read by Sonia. Neighbor, read by Michelle Eaton. End of Dramatis Personae. Chapter 1 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 That branch of the Lake of Como, which turns towards the south between two unbroken chains of mountains, presenting to the eye a succession of bays and gulfs formed by their jutting and retiring ridges, suddenly contracts itself between a headland to the right and an extended sloping bank on the left and assumes the flow and appearance of a river the bridge by which the two shores are here united appears to render the transformation more apparent and marks the point at which the lake ceases and the Ada recommences to resume however the name of lake where the again receding banks allow the water to expand itself anew into bays and gulfs the bank formed by the deposit of three large mountain streams descends from the bases of the two contiguous mountains, the one called St. Martin, the other by a Lombard name, Resegone, from its long line of summits, which, in truth, give it the appearance of a saw, so that there is no one who would not, at first sight, especially viewing it in front, from the ramparts of Milan that face the north, at once distinguish it, in all that extensive range, from other mountains of less name and more ordinary form. The bank, for a considerable distance, rises with a gentle and continual ascent, then breaks into hills and hollows, rugged or level land, according to the formation of the mountain rocks and the action of the floods. 
its extreme border intersected by the mountain torrents is composed almost entirely of sand and pebbles the other parts of fields and vineyards scattered farms country seats and villages with here and there a wood which extends up the mountainside lecco the largest of these villages and which gives its name to the district is situated at no great distance from the bridge upon the margin of the lake nay often at the rising of the waters is partly embosomed within the lake itself a large town at the present day and likely soon to become a city at the period of our story this village was also fortified and consequently had the honor to furnish quarters to a governor and the advantage of possessing a permanent garrison of spanish soldiers who gave lessons in modesty to the wives and daughters of the neighborhood and toward the close of the summer never failed to scatter themselves through the vineyards in order to thin the grapes and lighten for the rustics the labors of the vintage from village to village from the heights down to the margin of the lake there are innumerable roads and paths these vary in their character at times precipitous at others level now sunk and buried between two ivy-clad walls from whose depth you can behold nothing but the sky or some lofty mountain peak then crossing high and level tracks around the edges of which they sometimes wind occasionally projecting beyond the face of the mountain supported by prominent masses resembling bastions whence the eye wanders over the most varied and delicious landscape on the one side you behold the blue lake with its boundaries broken by various promontories and necks of land and reflecting the inverted images of the objects on its banks on the other the adda which flowing beneath the arches of the bridge expands into a small lake then contracts again and holds on its clear serpentining course to the distant horizon above are the ponderous masses of the shapeless rocks beneath the richly cultivated acclivity the fair landscape the bridge in front the opposite shore of the lake, and beyond this the mountain, which bounds the view. Towards evening, on the seventh day of November, 1628, Don Abondio, curate of one of the villages before alluded to, but the name of which, nor of the house in the lineage of its curate, we are not informed, was returning slowly towards his home, by one of these pathways. He was repeating quietly his office, in the pauses of which he held his closed breviary in his hand behind his back, and as he went, with his foot he cast listlessly against the wall the stones that happened to impede his path, at the same time giving admittance to the idle thoughts that tempted the spirit, while the lips of the worthy man were mechanically performing their function. Then, raising his head and gazing idly around him, he fixed his eyes upon a mountain summit, where the rays of the setting sun, breaking through the openings of an opposite ridge, illumined its projecting masses, which appeared like large and variously shaped spots of purple light. He then opened anew his breviary, and recited another portion at an angle of the lane, after which angle the road continued straight for perhaps seventy paces, and then branched like the letter Y into two narrow paths. The right-hand one ascended towards the mountain, and led to the parsonage, Cura. That on the left descended the valley towards a torrent, and on this side the wall rose out to the height of about two feet. The inner walls of the two narrow paths, instead of meeting at the angle, ended in a little chapel, upon which were depicted certain long, sinuous, pointed shapes, which, in the intention of the artist, and to the eyes of the neighboring inhabitants, represented flames, and amidst these flames certain other forms, not to be described, that were meant for souls in purgatory, souls and flames of a brick color, upon a ground of blackish gray, with here and there a bare spot of plaster. The curate, having turned the corner, directed, as was his wont, a look toward the little chapel, and there beheld what he little expected and would not have desired to see. At the confluence, if we may so call it, of the two narrow lanes, there were two men, one of them sitting astride the low wall, his companion leaning against it, with his arms folded on his breast. The dress, the bearing, and what the curate could distinguish of the countenance of these men, left no doubt as to their profession. They wore upon their heads a green network, which, falling on the left shoulder, ended in a large tassel, from under which appeared upon the forehead an enormous lock of hair. Their mustachios were long and curled at the extremities, the margin of their doublets confined by a belt of polished leather, from which were suspended, by hooks, two pistols. A little powder-horn hung like a locket on the breast. On the right-hand side of the wide and ample breeches was a pocket, out of which projected the handle of a knife, and on the other side they bore a long sword, of which the great hollow hilt was formed of bright plates of brass, combined into a cipher. By these characteristics they were, at a glance, recognized as individuals of the class of bravos. This species, now entirely extinct, flourished greatly at that time in Lombardy. For those who have no knowledge of it, the following are a few authentic records that may suffice to impart an idea of its principal characteristics, 
of the rigorous efforts made to extirpate it, and of its obstinate and rank vitality. As early as the 8th of April, 1583, the most illustrious and most excellent Lord Don Charles of Aragon, Prince of Castelvetrano, Duke of Terranova, Marquis of Avola, Count of Burgetto, High Admirable and High Constable of Sicily, Governor of Milan, and Captain General of His Catholic Majesty in Italy, fully informed of the intolerable misery which the city of Milan has endured, and still endures, by reason of bravos and vagabonds, publishes his decree against them, declares and designates all those who comprehended in this proclamation to be regarded as bravos and vagabonds, who, whether foreigners or natives, have no calling, or, having one, do not follow it, but, either with or without wages, attach themselves to any knight, gentleman, officer, or merchant, to uphold or favor him, or in any manner to molest others. All such he commands, within the space of six days, to leave the country, threatens the refractory with the galleys, and grants to all officers of justice the most ample and unlimited powers for the execution of his commands. But, in the following year, on the 12th of April, the said lord, having perceived that this city still continues to be filled with bravos, who have again resumed their former mode of life, their manners unchanged, and their number undiminished, puts forth another edict, still more energetic and remarkable, in which, among other regulations, he directs that any person whatsoever, whether of this city or from abroad, who shall, by the testimony of two witnesses, be shown to be regarded and commonly reputed as a bravo, even though no criminal act shall have been proved against him, may, nevertheless, upon the sole ground of his reputation, be condemned by the said judges to the rack for examination, and although he make no confession of guilt, he shall, notwithstanding, be sentenced to the galleys for the said term of three years, solely for that he is regarded as, and called, a bravo, as above mentioned and this, because His Excellency is resolved to enforce obedience to his commands. One would suppose that at the sound of such denunciations from so powerful a source, all the bravos must have disappeared forever. But testimony of no less authority obliges us to believe directly the reverse. This testimony is the most illustrious and most excellent Lord Juan Fernandez de Velasco, Constable of Castile, High Chamberlain of His Majesty, Duke of the City of Freas, Count of Harro and Castelnuovo, Lord of the House of Velasco, and of that of the seven infanti of Lara, governor of the state of Milan, etc. On the 5th of June, 1593, he also fully informed how great an injury to the common weal and how insulting to justice is the existence of such a class of men, requires them anew to quit the country within six days, repeating very nearly the same threats and injunctions as his predecessor. On the 23rd of May, then, 1598, having learnt with no little displeasure that the number of bravos and vagabonds is increasing daily in the state and city and that nothing is heard of them but wounds murders robberies and every other crime to the commission of which these bravos are encouraged by the confidence that they will be sustained by their chiefs and abettors he prescribes again the same remedies increasing the dose as is usual in obstinate disorders let every one then he concludes carefully beware that he do not in any wise contravene this edict since in place of experiencing the mercy of his excellency he shall prove his rigour and his wrath he being resolved and determined that this shall be a final and peremptory warning but this again did not suffice and the illustrious and most excellent lord the signor don pietro enriquez de acevedo count of fuentes captain and governor of the state of milan fully informed of the wretched condition of this city and state, in consequence of the great number of bravos that abound therein, and resolve wholly to extirpate them. Publishes on the 5th of December, 1600, a new decree, full of the most rigorous provisions, and with firm purpose in all that rigor, and without hope of remission, they shall be wholly carried into execution. We are obliged, however, to conclude that he did not, in this matter, exhibit the same zeal which he knew how to employ in contriving plots and exciting enemies against his powerful foe, Henry the Fourth, against whom history attests that he succeeded in arming the Duke of Savoy, whom he caused to lose more towns than one, and in engaging in a conspiracy the Duke of Biron, whom he caused to lose his head. But as regards the pestilent race of bravos, it is very nearly certain that they continued to increase until the twenty-second day of September, 1612 on which day the most illustrious and most excellent lord don giovanni de mendoza marchese della hinojosa gentleman etc 
governor, etc., thought seriously of their extirpation. He addressed to Pandolfo and Marco Tullio Malatesti, printers of the royal chamber, the customary edict, corrected and enlarged, that they might print it to accomplish that end. But the bravo still survived. To experience, on the 24th of December, 1618, still more terrific denunciations from the most illustrious and most excellent lord, Don Gomez Suarez de Figueroa, Duke of Feria, Governor, etc., Yet, as they did not fall, even under these blows, the most illustrious and most excellent lord, Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordova, under whose government we are made acquainted with Don Abondio, found himself obliged to republish the usual proclamation against the bravos, on the fifth day of October, 1627, that is, a year, a month, and two days previous to the commencement of our story. Nor was this the last publication, but of those that follow, as of matters not falling within the period of our history, we do not think it proper to make mention. The only one of them to which we shall refer is that of the thirteenth day of February, 1632, in which the most illustrious and most excellent lord, the Duke of Feria, for the second time governor, informs us that the greatest and most tedious crimes are perpetrated by those style bravos. This will suffice to prove that, at the time of which we treat, the bravos still existed. It appeared evident to Don Abondio that the two men above mentioned were waiting for someone, and he was alarmed at the conviction that it was for himself, for on his appearance they exchanged a look as if to say, "'Tis he. Rising from the wall, they both advanced to meet him. He held his breviary open before him, as though he were employed in reading it, but nevertheless cast a glance upward in order to espy their movements. Seeing that they came directly towards him, he was beset by a thousand different thoughts. He considered in haste whether between the bravos and himself there were any outlet from the road, and he remembered there was none." He took a rapid survey of his conduct, to discover if he had given offence to any powerful or revengeful man, but in this matter he was somewhat reassured by the consoling testimony of his conscience. The bravos draw near, and kept their eyes upon him. He raised his hand to his collar, as if adjusting it, and at the same time turned his head round, to see if any one were coming. He could discover no one. He cast a glance across the low stone wall upon the fields. No one. Another on the road that lay before him. No one except the bravos. What is to be done? Flight was impossible. Unable to avoid the danger, he hastened to encounter it, and to put an end to the torments of uncertainty. He quickened his pace, recited a stanza in a louder tone, did his utmost to assume a composed and cheerful countenance, and finding himself in front of the two gallants, stopped short. "'A senor curate,' said one of them, fixing his eyes upon him. "'Your pleasure, sir,' suddenly raising his eyes from his book, which he continued to hold open before him. "'You intend,' pursued the other, with the threatening and angry mien of one who is detected an inferior in an attempt to commit some villainy. "'You intend to-morrow to unite in marriage Renzo Tramolino and Lucy Mondella.' "'That is,' said Don Abondio with a faltering voice, "'that is to say, you gentlemen, being men of the world, are very well aware how these things are managed. The poor curate neither meddles nor makes they settle their affairs amongst themselves and then then they come to us as if to redeem a pledge and we we are the servants of the public mark now said the bravo in a low voice but in a tone of command this marriage is not to take place neither to-morrow nor at any time but my good sirs replied don abondio with a mild and gentle tone of one who would persuade an impatient listener but my good sirs deign to put yourselves in my situation if the thing depended on myself you see plainly that it does not in the least concern hold there said the bravo interrupting him this matter is not to be settled by prating we need a know nor care to know any more about it a man once warned you understand us but fair sirs you are too just uh, too reasonable but uh, interrupted the other comrade who had not before spoken but uh, this marriage is not to be performed or uh, with an oath he who performs it will not to repent of it because he will not have the time with another oath hush hush resumed the first orator the senor curate knows the world and we a gentleman who have no wish to harm him if he conducts himself with judgment Signor Curate, the most illustrious Signor Don Roderick, our patron, offers you his kind regards. 
as in the height of a midnight storm a vivid flash casts a momentary dazzling glare around and renders every object more fearful so did this name increase the terror of don abondio as if by instinct he bowed his head submissively and said if it could be suggested to me oh suggested to you who understand latin exclaimed the bravo laughing it is for you to manage the matter but above all be careful not to say a word concerning the hint that has been given you for your good if you do him if you understand the consequences would be the same as if you performed a marriage ceremony but say what answer are we to carry in your name to the most illustrious signor don roderick my respects speak more clearly signor cura that i am disposed ever disposed to obedience and as he spoke the words he was not very certain himself whether he gave a promise or only uttered an ordinary compliment the bravos took or appeared to take them in the more serious sense tis very well good night signor curate said one of them as he retired together with his companion don abondio who a few minutes before would have given one of his eyes to avoid the ruffians was now desirous to prolong the conversation gentlemen he began as he shut his book without again noticing him however they passed on singing a loose song of which we will not transcribe the words poor don abondio remained for a moment as if spellbound and then with heavy and lagging steps took the path which led towards his home the reader will better understand the state of his mind when he shall have learned something more of his disposition and of the condition of the times in which it was his lot to live don abondio was not as the reader may have perceived endowed with the courage of a lion but from his earliest years he had been sensible that the most embarrassing situation in those times was that of an animal furnished with neither tusks nor talons at the same time having no wish to be devoured the arm of the law afforded no protection to a man of quiet inoffensive habits who had no means of making himself feared not that laws and penalties were wanting for the prevention of private violence the laws were most express the offences enumerated and minutely particularized the penalties sufficiently extravagant and if that were not enough the legislator himself and a hundred others to whom was committed the execution of the laws had power to increase them the proceedings were studiously contrived to free the judge from everything that might prevent his passing sentence of condemnation the passages we have cited from proclamations against the bravos may be taken as a faithful specimen of these decrees notwithstanding this or it may be in consequence of this these proclamations reiterated and reinforced from time to time served only to proclaim in pompous language the impotence of those who issued them or if they produced any immediate effect it was that of adding to the vexations which the peaceful and feeble suffered from the disturbers of society impunity was organized and effected in so many ways as to render the proclamations powerless such was the consequence of the sanctuaries and asylums and of the privileges of certain classes partly acknowledged by the legal power partly tolerated in silence or feebly opposed but which in fact were sustained and guarded by almost every individual with interested activity and punctilious jealousy now this impunity threatened and assailed but not destroyed by these proclamations would naturally at every new attack employ fresh efforts and devices to maintain itself the proclamations were efficient it is true in fettering and embarrassing the honest man who had neither power in himself nor protection from others inasmuch as in order to reach every person they subjected the movements of each private individual to the arbitrary will of a thousand magistrates and executive officers but he who before the commission of his crime had prepared himself a refuge in some convent or palace where bailiffs never dared to enter or who simply wore a livery which engaged in his defence the vanity or the interest of a powerful family such a one was free in his actions and could laugh to scorn every proclamation of those persons whose part it was to ensure the execution of these decrees some belonged by birth to the privileged class others were its clients and dependents and as the latter as well as the former had from education from habit from imitation embraced its maxims they would be very careful not to violate them had they however been bold as heroes obedient as monks and devoted as martyrs they could never have accomplished the execution of the laws inferior as they were in number to those with whom they must engage and with the frequent probability of being abandoned or even sacrificed by him who in a moment of theoretical abstraction might require them to act but in addition to this their office would be regarded as a base one in public opinion and their names stamped with reproach it was therefore very natural that instead of risking nay throwing away their lives in a fruitless attempt they should sell their inaction or rather their connivance to the powerful 
or at least exercise their authority only on those occasions when it might be done with safety to themselves, that is, in oppressing the peaceable and the defenseless. The man who acts with violence, or who is constantly in fear of violence from others, seeks companions and allies. Hence it happened that, during these times, individuals displayed so strong a tendency to combine themselves into classes, and to advance, as far as each one was able, the power of that to which he belonged. The clergy was vigilant in the defense and extension of its immunities, the nobility of its privileges, the military of its exemptions, the merchants and artisans were enrolled in companies and fraternities, the lawyers were united in leagues, and even the physicians formed a corporation. Each of these oligarchies had its own appropriate power, in each of them the individual found the advantage of employing, for himself, in proportion to his influence and dexterity, the united force of numbers. The more honest availed themselves of this advantage merely for their defense. The crafty and wicked profited by it to assure themselves of success in their rogueries, and impunity from their results. The strength, however, of these various combinations was far from being equal, and especially in the country. The wealthy and overbearing noblemen, with a band of bravos and surrounded by peasants accustomed to regard themselves as subjects and soldiers of their lord, exercised an irresistible power, and set all laws at defiance. Don Abondio, neither noble, rich, nor valiant, had from early youth found himself alone and unaided in such a state of society, like an earthen vessel thrown amidst iron jars. He therefore readily obeyed his parents, who wished him to become a priest. He did, to say the truth, not regard the obligations and the noble ends of the ministry to which he dedicated himself, but was only desirous to secure the means of living, and to connect himself with a powerful and respected class. But no class provided for the individual, or secured his safety, further than to a certain point. None rendered it unnecessary for him to adopt for himself a system of his own. The system of Donabondio consisted chiefly in shunning all disputes. He maintained an unarmed neutrality in all contests that broke out around him. Between the clergy and the civil power, between persons in office and nobles and magistrates, bravos and soldiers, down to the squabbles of the peasantry themselves, terminated by the fist or the knife, by keeping aloof from the overbearing, by affecting not to notice their acts of violence, by bowing low and with the most profound respect to all whom he met, the poor man had succeeded in passing over sixty years without encountering any violent storms, not but that he also had some small portion of gall in his composition, and this continual exercise of patience exacerbated it to such a degree that, if he had not had it in his power occasionally to give it vent, his health must have suffered. But as there were a few persons in the world connected with himself whom he knew to be powerless, he could from time to time discharge on them his long pent-up ill-humour. He was, moreover, a severe censor of those who did not regulate their conduct by his example, provided he could censure without danger. According to his creed, the poor fellow who had been cudgelled had been a little imprudent. The murdered man had always been turbulent. The man who maintained his right against the powerful, and met with a broken head, must have been somewhat wrong. Which is perhaps true enough, for in all disputes the line can never be drawn so finely as not to leave a little wrong on both sides. He especially declaimed against those of his confraternity, who, at their own risk, took part with the oppressed against a powerful oppressor. This, he said, was to purchase trouble with ready money, to kick at snarling dogs, and an intermeddling in profane things that lowered the dignity of the sacred ministry. He had, in short, a favorite maxim, that an honest man, who looked to himself and minded his own affairs, never met with any rough encounters. From all that has been said, we may imagine the effect the meeting just described must have had upon the mind of poor Donabondio. Those fierce countenances, the threats of a lord who was well known not to speak idly, his plan of quiet life and patient endurance, disconcerted in an instant, a difficulty before him from which he saw no possibility of extrication. All these thoughts rushed confusedly through his mind. If Renzo could be quietly dismissed with a refusal, all would be well. But he will require reasons. And what can I say to him? He too has a head of his own. A lamb, if not meddled with, but once attempt to cross him. Oh, and raving after that Lucy as much enamoured as. Young idiots, who for want of something else to do fall in love, and must be married, forsooth, thinking of nothing else, never concerning themselves about the trouble they bring upon an honest man like me wretch that i am why should those two scowling faces plant themselves exactly in my path and pick a quarrel with me what have i to do in the matter is it i that mean to wive why did they not rather go and speak ah truly 
that which is to the purpose always occurs to me after the right time if i had but thought of suggesting to them to go and bear their message but here he was disturbed by the reflection that to repent of not having been the counsellor and a better of evil was too iniquitous a thing and he therefore turned the rancour of his thoughts against the individual who had thus robbed him of his tranquillity he did not know don roderick except by sight and by report his sole intercourse with him had been to touch chin to breast in the ground with the corner of his hat the few times he had met him on the road he had on more than one occasion defended the reputation of that signor against those who in an undertone with sighs and looks raised to heaven had execrated some one of his exploits he had declared a hundred times that he was a respectable cavalier but at this moment he in his own heart readily bestowed upon him all those titles to which he would never lend an ear from another having amidst the tumult of these thoughts reached the entrance of his house which stood at the end of that little glebe he unlocked the door entered and carefully secured it within anxious to find himself in society that he could trust he called aloud perpetua perpetua advancing towards the little parlour where she was doubtless employed in preparing the table for his supper Perpetua was, as the reader must be aware, the housekeeper of Donabondio, an affectionate and faithful domestic, who knew how to obey or command as occasion served, to bear the grumbling and whims of her master at times, and at others to make him bear with hers. These were becoming every day more frequent. She had passed the age of forty in a single state, the consequences, she said, of having refused all the offers that had been made her. Her female friends asserted that she had never found anyone willing to take her. "'Coming,' said Perpetua as she set in its usual place on the little table the flask of Donabondio's favorite wine, and moved slowly toward the parlor door. Before she reached it he entered, with steps so disordered, looks so clouded, and a countenance so changed, that an eye less practiced than that of Perpetua could have discovered at a glance that something unusual had befallen him. "'Mercy on me! What is it ails my master?' "'Nothing, nothing,' said Donabondio, as he sank upon his easy chair." how nothing would you have me believe that looking as you do some dreadful accident has happened oh for the love of heaven when i say nothing it is either nothing or something i cannot tell that you cannot tell not even to me who will take care of your health who will give you advice oh peace peace do not make matters worse give me a glass of my wine and you will still pretend to me that nothing is the matter said perpetua filling the glass but retaining it in her hand as if unwilling to present it except as the reward of confidence give here give here said donabondio taking the glass with an unsteady hand and hastily swallowing its contents would you oblige me then to go about asking here and there what it is has happened to my master said perpetua standing upright before him with her hands on her sides and looking him steadfastly in the face, as if to extract the secret from his eyes. "'For the love of heaven, do not worry me. Do not kill me with your father. This is a matter that concerns—concerns concerns my life.' "'Your life?' "'My life.' "'You know well that when you have frankly confided in me, I have never—' "'Yes, forsooth, as when—' Perpetua was sensible she had touched a false string, wherefore, changing suddenly her note— my dear master said she in a moving tone of voice i have always had a dutiful regard for you and if i now wish to know this affair it is from zeal and a desire to assist you to give you advice to relieve your mind the truth is that donabondio's desire to disburden himself of his painful secret was as great as that of perpetua to obtain a knowledge of it so that after having repulsed more and more feebly her renewed assaults after having made her swear many times that she would not breathe a syllable of it, he, with frequent pauses and exclamations, related his miserable adventure. When it was necessary to pronounce the dread name of him from whom the prohibition came, he required from Perpetua another and more solemn oath. Having uttered it, he threw himself back on his seat with a heavy sigh, and, in a tone of command, as well as supplication, exclaimed, "'For the love of heaven!' "'Mercy upon me!' cried Perpetua what a wretch what a tyrant does he not fear god will you be silent or do you want to ruin me completely oh we are here alone no one can hear us but what will my poor master do see there now said donabondio in a peevish tone see the fine advice you give me to ask of me what i'll do what i'll do as if you were the one in difficulty and it was for me to help you out 
Nay, I could give you my own poor opinion, but then... But, but then let us know it. My opinion would be that, as everyone says our Archbishop is a saint, a man of courage, and not to be frightened by an ugly fizz, and who will take pleasure in upholding a curate against one of these tyrants, I should say, and do say, that you had better write him a handsome letter to inform him as to how... Will you be silent? Will you be silent? Is this advice to offer a poor man? When I get a pistol bullet in my side, God preserve me, will the archbishop take it out ah pistol bullets are not given away like sugar plums and it were woeful if those dogs should bite every time they bark if a man knows how to show his teeth and make himself feared they hold him in respect we should not have been brought to such a pass if you had stood upon your rights now all come to us by your good leave to will you be silent certainly but it is true though that when the world sees one is always ready in every encounter to lower will you be silent is this a time for such idle talk well well you'll think of it to-night but in the meantime do not be the first to harm yourself to destroy your own health eat a mouthful i'll think of it murmured donna bondio certainly i'll think of it i must think of it and he arose continuing no I'll take nothing, nothing. I've something else to do. But that this should have fallen upon me. Swallow at least this other little drop, said Perpetua as she poured the wine. You know it always restores your stomach. Oh, there wants other medicine than that, other medicine than that, other medicine than that. So saying, he took the light, and muttering, A pretty business this. To an honest man like me, and to-morrow, what is to be done? With other like exclamations, he went towards his bedchamber. Having reached the door, he stopped a moment, and before he quitted the room, exclaimed, turning towards Perpetua, with his finger on his lips, For the love of heaven, be silent. End of chapter 1 Chapter Two of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Two. It is related that the Prince of Condé slept soundly the night preceding the Battle of Roqua, but then he was greatly fatigued, and moreover he had made every arrangement for the morrow. It was not thus with Donabondio. He only knew the morrow would be a day of trouble and consequently passed the night in anxious anticipation. He could not for a moment think of disregarding the menaces of the bravos, and solemnizing the marriage. To confide in Renzo the occurrence, to consult with him as to the means, God forbid, he remembered the warning of the bravo. Not to say one word. Otherwise. Ahem. In this dreadful ahem of the bravo resounded in the ears of Donabondio, so that he already repented of his communication to Perpetua. To fly was impossible and where could he fly? At the thought a thousand obstacles presented themselves. After long and painful deliberation, he resolved to endeavor to gain time, by giving Renzo some fanciful reasons for the postponement of the marriage. He recollected that in a few days more the time would arrive during which marriages were prohibited. And if I can keep this youngster at bay for a few days, I shall then have two months before me, and in two months who can tell what may happen? He thought of various pretexts for this purpose and though they were rather flimsy, he persuaded himself that his authority would give them weight, and that his experience would prevail over the mind of an ignorant youth. "'We will see,' said he to himself. "'He thinks of his love, but I think of myself. I am therefore the party most interested. I must call in all my cunning to assist me. I cannot help it, young man, if you suffer. I must not be the victim.' Having somewhat composed his mind with this determination, he at length fell asleep. But his dreams, alas, how horrible! Bravos, Don Roderick, Renzo, roads, rocks, cries, bullets. The arousing from sleep after a recent misfortune is a bitter moment. The mind at first habitually recurs to its previous tranquillity, but is soon depressed by the thought of the contrast that awaits it. When alive to a sense of his situation, Don Abondio recapitulated the plans of the night, made a better disposal of them, and, after having risen, 
awaited with dread and impatience the moment of Renzo's arrival. Lorenzo, or as he was called, Renzo, did not make him wait long. At an early hour he presented himself before the curate with the joyful readiness of one who was on this day to espouse her whom he loved. He had been deprived of his parents in his youth, and now practiced the trade of a weaver of silk, which was, it might be said, hereditary in his family. This trade had once been very lucrative, and although now on the decline, a skillful workman might obtain from it a respectable livelihood. The continual emigration of the tradesmen, attracted to the neighboring states by promises and privileges, left sufficient employment for those who remained behind. Besides, Renzo possessed a small farm, which he had cultivated himself when otherwise unoccupied, so that, for one of his condition, he might be called wealthy, and although the last harvest had been more deficient than the preceding ones, and the evils of famine were beginning to be felt, yet, from the moment he had given his heart to Lucy, he had been so economical as to preserve a sufficiency of all necessaries, and to be in no danger of wanting bread. He appeared before Donabondio gaily dressed, and with a joyful countenance. The mysterious and perplexed manner of the curate formed a singular contrast to that of the handsome young man. "'What is the matter now?' thought Renzo, but without waiting to answer his own question. "'Signor curate,' said he, "'I am come to know at what hour of the day it will be convenient for you that we should be at the church.' "'Of what day do you speak?' "'How? Of what day? Do you not remember that this is the day appointed?' "'Today?' replied Don Abondio, as if he heard it for the first time. "'Today? Today? Uh, be patient. I cannot today.' "'You cannot today? Why not?' "'In the first place, I am not well.' "'I am sorry for it, but we shall not detain you long, and you will not be much fatigued.' "'But then, but then—' "'But then what, sir?' "'There are difficulties.' difficulties how can that be people should be in our situation to know how many obstacles there are to these matters i am too yielding i think only of removing impediments of rendering all things easy and promoting the happiness of others to do this i neglect my duty and am covered with reproaches for it in the name of heaven keep me not thus in suspense but tell me at once what is the matter do you know how many formalities are required before the marriage can be celebrated? I must indeed know something of them, said Renzo, beginning to grow angry. Since you have racked my brains with them abundantly these few days back, but are not all things now ready? Have you not done all there was to do? All, all you expect, but be patient, I tell you. I have been a blockhead to neglect my duty that I might not cause pain to others. We poor curates, we are, as may be said, ever between a hawk and a buzzard. I pity you, poor young man, I perceive your impatience, but my superiors. Enough, I have reasons for what I say, but I cannot tell all. We, however, are sure to suffer. But tell me what this other formality is, and I will perform it immediately. Do you know how many obstacles stand in the way? How can I know anything of obstacles? Error conditio votum cognatis crimen cultus disparitas vis ordo si sit affinis. Oh, for heaven's sake! How should I understand all this Latin? Be patient, dear Renzo. I am ready to do all that depends on me. I, I wish to see you satisfied. I wish you well, and when I think that you were so happy that you wanted nothing when the whim entered your head to be married. What words are these, Signor? interrupted Renzo with a look of astonishment and anger. I say, do be patient. I say, I wish to see you happy. In short, in short, my dear child, I have not been in fault. I did not make the laws. Before concluding a marriage, we are required to search closely that there be no obstacles. Now I beseech you, tell me at once what difficulty has occurred. Be patient. These are not points to be cleared up in an instant. There will be nothing, I hope. But whether or not, we must search into the matter. The passage is clear and explicit. Antiquam matrimonium denunciet. I'll not hear your Latin. But it is necessary to explain to you. 
but why not do this before why tell me all was prepared why wait it see there now to reproach me with my kindness i have hastened everything to serve you but but there has occurred well well i know and what do you wish that i should do be patient for a few days my dear child a few days are not eternity be patient for how long a time then we are coming to a good conclusion thought don abondio come said he gently in fifteen days i will endeavour fifteen days oh this is something new to tell me now on the very day you yourself appointed for my marriage that i must wait fifteen days fifteen resumed he with a low and angry voice don abondio interrupted him earnestly seizing his hand and with an imploring tone beseeching him to be quiet come come don't be angry for the love of heaven i'll see i'll see if in a week and what shall i say to lucy said renzo softening that it has been a mistake of mine and to the world say also it is my fault that through too great haste i have made some great blunder throw all the blame on me can i do more than this come in a week hmm, and then there will be no further difficulties when i say a thing well well i will be quiet for a week but be assured i will be put off with no further excuses for the present i take my leave so saying he departed making a bow to don abondio less profound than usual and giving him a look more expressive than respectful with a heavy heart he approached the house of his betrothed his mind dwelling on the strange conversation which had just taken place the cold and embarrassed reception of don abondio his constrained and impatient air his mysterious hints all combined to convince him there was still something he had not been willing to communicate he stopped for a moment debating with himself whether he should not return and compel him to be more frank raising his eyes however he beheld perpetua entering a little garden a few steps distant from the house he called to her quickened his pace and detaining her at the gate endeavoured to enter into discourse with her good day perpetua i expected to have received your congratulations to-day but it must be as god pleases my poor renzo i want to ask a favour of you the signor curate has offered reasons i cannot comprehend will you explain to me the true cause why he is unable or unwilling to marry us to-day oh do you think then that i know the secrets of my master i was right in supposing there was a mystery thought renzo come come perpetua continued he we are friends tell me what you know help a poor young man it is a bad thing to be born poor my dear renzo that is true replied he still more confirmed in his suspicions that is true but it is not becoming in the clergy to behave unjustly to the poor hear me renzo i can tell you nothing because i know nothing but i can assure you my master would not wrong you or any one and he is not to blame who then is to blame asked renzo carelessly but listening intently for a reply i have told you already i know nothing but i may be allowed to speak in defence of my master poor man if he has erred it has been through too great kindness there are in this world men who are overpowerful knavish and who fear not god overpowerful knavish thought renzo these cannot be his superiors come said he with difficulty concealing his increasing agitation come tell me who it is ah you would persuade me to speak and i must not because i know nothing i will keep silence as faithfully as if i had promised to do so you might put me to the torture and you could not draw anything from me adieu it is lost time for both of us thus saying she re-entered the garden hastily and shut the gate renzo turned very softly lest at the noise of his footsteps she might discern the road he took when fairly beyond her hearing he quickened his steps and in a moment was at the door of don abondio's house he entered rushed towards the little parlour where he had left him and finding him still there approached him with a bold and furious manner eh eh what has happened now said don abondio who is this powerful personage said renzo with the air of one resolved to obtain an explicit answer 
who is he that forbids me to marry lucy what 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 stammered donna bondio turning pale with surprise he arose from his chair and made an effort to reach the door but renzo who expected this movement was upon his guard and locking the door he put the key in his pocket ah uh, will you speak now signor curate every one knows the affair but myself and by heavens i'll know it too who is it i say renzo renzo for the love of charity take care what you do think of your soul i must know at once this moment so saying he placed his hand on his dagger but perhaps without intending it mercy exclaimed Donabondio in a stifled voice i must know it who has told you come no more excuses speak plainly and quickly do you mean to kill me i mean to know that which i have a right to know but if i speak i die must i not preserve my life speak then the manner of renzo was so threatening and decided that donna bondio felt there was no possibility of disobeying him promise me swear said he never to tell tell me tell me quickly his name or I at this new adjuration the poor curate with the trembling look of a man who feels the instrument of the dentist in his mouth feebly articulated don don replied renzo inclining his ear towards him eager to hear the rest don don roderick muttered he hastily trembling at the sound that escaped his lips ah dog shouted renzo and how has he done it what has he said to you to what what said donna bondio in an almost contemptuous tone already gaining confidence by the sacrifice he had made i wish you were like myself you would then meddle with nothing and certainly you would not have had so many whims in your head he however related in terrible colours the ugly encounter his anger which had hitherto been subdued by fear displayed itself as he proceeded and perceiving that renzo between rage and astonishment remained motionless with his head bent down he continued in a lively manner you have made a pretty business of it indeed you have rendered me a notable service thus to attack an honest man your curate in his own house in a sacred place you have done a fine thing truly to wrest from my mouth that which i concealed from prudence for your own good and now that you know it what will you do when i gave you good advice this morning i had judgment for you and me but believe me this is no jesting matter no question of right or wrong but superior power at all events open the door give me the key i may have been to blame replied renzo with a softened voice but in which might be perceived smothered anger towards his concealed enemy i may have been to blame but if you had been in my situation he drew the key from his pocket and advanced towards the door swear to me said donna bondio with a serious and anxious face i may have been to blame forgive me replied renzo moving to depart swear first said donna bondio holding him tremblingly by the arm i may have been to blame said renzo freeing himself from his grasp and immediately springing out of the room perpetua perpetua cried donna bondio after having in vain called back the fugitive perpetua did not answer the poor man was so overwhelmed by his innumerable difficulties his increasing perplexities and so apprehensive of some fresh attack that he conceived the idea of securing to himself a safe retreat from them all by going to bed and giving out that he had a fever his malady indeed was not altogether imaginary the terror of the past day the anxious watching of the night the dread of the future had combined to produce really the effect weary and stupefied he slumbered in his large chair muttering occasionally in a feeble but passionate voice Perpetua. Perpetua arrived at last with a great cabbage under her arm, and with as unconcerned a countenance as if nothing had happened. We will spare the reader the reproaches, the accusations, and denials that pass between them. It is sufficient that Dona Bondio ordered Perpetua to bolt the door, not to put her foot outside, and if anyone knocked, to reply from the window that the curate was gone to bed with a fever. He then slowly ascended the stairs and put himself really into bed, where we will leave him. Renzo, meanwhile, with hurried steps, and with a mind unsettled and distracted as to the course he should pursue, approached his home. Those who injure others are guilty, not only of the evils they commit, but also of the effects produced by these evils on the characters of the injured persons. 
Renzo was a quiet and peaceful youth, but now his nature appeared changed, and his thoughts dwelt only on deeds of violence. He would have run to the house of Don Roderick to assault him there, but he remembered that it was a fortress, furnished with bravos within, and well guarded without, that only those known to be friends and servants could enter without the minutest scrutiny, and that not even a tradesman could be seen there without being examined from head to foot, and he, above all, would be, alas, but too well known. He then imagined himself placed behind a hedge, with his arquebus in his hand, waiting till Roderick should pass by alone. Rejoicing internally at the thought, he pictured to himself an approaching footstep. The villain appears, he takes aim, fires, and he falls. He exalts a moment over his dying struggles, and then escapes for his life beyond the confines. And Lucy? This name recalled his wiser and better thoughts. He remembered the last instructions of his parents. He thought of God, the Holy Virgin, and the saints and he tremblingly rejoiced that he had been guilty of the deed only in imagination. But how many hopes, promises, and anticipations did the idea of Lucy suggest? In this day so ardently desired, how announce to her the dreadful news? And then what plan to pursue? How make her his own in spite of the power of this wicked lord? And now a tormenting suspicion passed through his mind. Don Roderick must have been instigated to this injury by a brutal passion for Lucy. And she— he could not for a moment endure the maddening thought that she had given him the slightest encouragement. But was she not informed of his designs? Could he have conceived his infamous purpose, and have advanced so far towards its completion, without her knowledge? In Lucy, his own beloved, had never uttered a syllable to him concerning it. These reflections prevailing in his mind, he passed by his own house, which was situated in the centre of the village, and arrived at that of Lucy, which was at the opposite extremity. It had a small courtyard in front, which separated it from the road and which was encircled by a low wall. Entering the yard, Renzo heard a confused murmur of voices in the upper chamber. He rightly supposed it to be the wedding company, and he could not resolve to appear before them with such a countenance. A little girl who was standing at the door ran towards him, crying out, The bridegroom! The bridegroom! Hush, Betsy, hush! said Renzo. Come hither. Go to Lucy and whisper in her ear, but let no one hear you. Whisper in her ear that I wish to speak with her in the lower chamber, and that she must come at once. The little girl hastily ascended the stairs, proud of having a secret commission to execute. Lucy had just come forth, adorned from the hands of her mother, and surrounded by her admiring friends. These were playfully endeavouring to steal a look at the blooming bride, while she, with the timidity of rustic modesty, attempted to conceal her blushing countenance with her bending arm, from beneath which a smiling mouth nevertheless appeared. Her black tresses, parted on her white forehead, were folded up in multiplied circles on the back of her head, and fastened with pins of silver, projecting on every side like rays of the sun. This is still the custom of the Milanese peasantry. Around her throat she had a necklace of garnets, alternated with beads of gold filigree. She wore a bodice embroidered in flowers, the sleeves tied with ribbons, a short petticoat of silk with numerous minute plates, crimson stockings, and embroidered silk slippers. But beyond all these ornaments was the modest and beautiful joy depicted on her countenance, a joy, however, troubled by a slight shade of anxiety. The little Betsy intruded herself into the circle, managed to approach Lucy, and communicated her message. "'I shall return in a moment,' said Lucy to her friends, as she hastily quitted the room, on perceiving the altered and unquiet appearance of Renzo. "'What is the matter?' said she, not without a presentiment of evil. "'Lucy,' replied Renzo, all is at a stand, and God knows whether we shall ever be man and wife. How? said Lucy, alarmed. Renzo related briefly the history of the morning. She listened with anguish. When he uttered the name of Don Roderick, Ah! Uh, exclaimed she, blushing and trembling. Has it then come to this? Then you knew, said Renzo. Too well, replied Lucy. What did you know? Do not make me speak now. Do not make me weep. I'll call my mother and dismiss the company. We must be alone. As she departed, Renzo whispered, And you have never spoken of it to me. Ah, Renzo, replied Lucy, turning for a moment to gaze at him. He understood well what this action meant. It was as if she had said, Can you doubt me? Meanwhile, the good Agnes, so the mother of Lucy was called, had descended the stairs to ascertain the cause of her daughter's disappearance. She remained with Renzo while Lucy returned to the company and, assuming all the composure she could, said to them, The Signor Curate is indisposed, and the wedding cannot take place to-day. 
the ladies departed and lost no time in relating amongst the gossips of the neighborhood all that had occurred while they made particular enquiries respecting the reality of don abondio's sickness the truth of this cut short the conjectures which they had already begun to intimate by brief and mysterious hints End of chapter two chapter three of the betrothed by alessandro manzoni translated by george william fenshaw this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter three lucy entered the lower room as renzo was sorrowfully informing agnes of that to which she as sorrowfully listened both turned towards her from whom they expected an explanation which could not be but painful the suspicions of both were however excited in the midst of their grief and the displeasure they felt towards Lucy differed only according to their relative situation. Agnes, though anxious to hear her daughter speak, could not avoid reproaching her. "'To say nothing to thy mother!' "'Now I will tell you all,' said Lucy, wiping her eyes with her apron. "'Speak, speak!' speak. cried at once her mother and her lover. "'Holy Virgin!' exclaimed Lucy. "'That it should come to this!' and with a voice interrupted by tears she related that a few days previously as she returned from weaving and was loitering behind her companions don roderick came up with her in company with another gentleman that the former sought to engage her in idle conversation that she quickened her pace without lending him an ear and rejoined her companions in the meanwhile she heard the other gentleman laugh and don roderick say i'll lay a wager with you the day following on their return they met them again but lucy kept in the midst of her companions with her head down the other gentleman burst into laughter, and Don Roderick said, "'We will see, we will see.' "'Happily for me,' continued Lucy, "'this day was the last of the weaving. I related the adventure immediately.' "'To whom didst thou relate it?' asked Agnes quickly, indignant at the idea of any one being preferred before her as a confidant. "'To Father Christopher, in confession, mamma," replied Lucy, in a tone of apology. "'I told him all.' The last time you and I went to the church of the convent, you may perhaps recollect my contrivances for delay on that morning, until there should pass some villagers in whose company we might go into the street, because I was so afraid." The indignation of Agnes subsided at once at the mention of a name so revered as Father Christopher's. "'Thou didst well, my child,' said she. "'But why not tell it also to thy mother?' For this Lucy had two very good reasons the one a desire not to disturb and frighten her mother with a circumstance she could not have prevented, the other the dread of placing a secret which she wished to be buried in her own bosom in danger of becoming known to all the village. Of these two reasons she only alleged the first. "'And could I,' said she, turning to Renzo, in a gentle and reproachful voice, "'could I speak to you of this? Alas, that you should know it now!' "'And what did the father say to you?' asked Agnes. He told me to endeavor to hasten my nuptials, and in the meanwhile to keep myself within doors, to pray much to God, and he hoped that if Don Roderick should not see me, he would cease to think of me. And it was then, continued she, turning again towards Renzo, without, however, raising her eyes, and blushing deeply, it was then that I compelled myself, at the risk of appearing very forward, to request you to conclude the marriage before the appointed time. Who can tell what you must have thought of me? but I did it for the best, and from advice, and this morning I little thought—" She could articulate no longer, and burst into a flood of tears. "'Ah, the scoundrel! The villain!' exclaimed Renzo, pacing the room in a violent paroxysm of rage. He stopped suddenly before Lucy, regarded her with a countenance agitated by various passions, and said, "'This is the last wicked deed this wretch will perform.' "'Ah, no, Renzo, for the love of heaven!' cried Lucy. No, no, for the love of heaven. There is a God who watches over the oppressed. But do you think he will protect us if we do evil? No, no, for the love of heaven, repeated Agnes. Renzo, said Lucy, with a more resolved and tranquil air, you have a trade, and I know how to work. Let us go away into some distant place, that he may hear of us no more. Ah, oh, Lucy, but we are not yet man and wife. If we were married, then indeed— Lucy relapsed into tears, and all three remained silent. The deep despondency of their countenances formed a mournful contrast to the festive character of their dress. "'Hear me, my children. Listen to me,' said Agnes, after a few moments. "'I came into the world before you, and I know it a little better than you do. 
the devil is not so frightful as they paint him. To us poor people the skeins appear more entangled because we do not know where to look for the end. But sometimes advice from a learned man, I know what I mean to say. Do as I tell you, Renzo. Go to Lecco. Find the doctor Azeka Garbugli. Relate to him, but you must not call him by this name. It is a nickname. Say to the doctor, oh, what do they call him? Oh, dear, I can't think of his real name. Everyone calls him Azeka Garbugli. Well, well, find this tall, stiff, bald doctor with a red nose and a face as red. I know the man by sight, said Renzo. Well, very well, continued Agnes. There's a man for you. I have seen more than one troubled wretch who did not know which way to turn himself. I have known him remain an hour with the doctor, Azeka Garbugli, be careful you don't call him so, and go away laughing at himself for his uneasiness. Take with you these fowls. I expected to have wrung their necks, poor little things, for the banquet of tonight. However, carry them to him, because one must never go empty-handed to these gentlemen. Relate to him all that has happened, and he will tell you at once that which would never enter our heads in a year. Renzo and Lucy approved of this advice. Agnes, proud of having given it, with great complacency took the poor fowls one by one from the coop, tied their legs together as if she were making a nosegay, and consigned them to his hands. After having exchanged words of hope, he departed, avoiding the high road and crossing the fields, so as not to attract notice. As he went along, he had leisure to dwell on his misfortunes, and revolve in his mind his anticipated interview with the doctor at Zekagarbulli. I leave the reader to imagine the condition of the unfortunate fowls swinging by the legs with their heads downwards in the hands of a man agitated by all the tumults of passion, and whose arm moved more in accordance with the violence of his feelings than with sympathy for the unhappy animals, whose heads became conscious of sundry terrific shocks, which they resented by pecking at one another, a practice too frequent with companions in misfortune. He arrived at the village, asked for the house of the doctor, which, being pointed out to him, he proceeded thither. On entering, he experienced the timidity so common to the poor and illiterate at the near approach to the learned and noble. He forgot all the speeches he had prepared, but giving a glance at the fowls, he took courage. He entered the kitchen and demanded of the maid-servant, if he could speak with the signor doctor. As if accustomed to similar gifts, she immediately took the fowls out of his hand, although Renzo drew them back, wishing the doctor to know that it was he who brought them. The doctor entered as the maid was saying, Give here, and pass into the study. Renzo bowed low to him. He replied with a kind, Come in, my son, and led the way into an adjoining chamber. This was a large room, on the three walls of which were distributed portraits of the twelve Caesars, while the fourth was covered with a large bookcase of old and dusty books. In the middle stood a table laden with memorials, libels, and proclamations, with three or four seats around. On one side of it was a large armchair with a high and square back, terminated at each corner by ornaments of wood in the fashion of horns. The nails which had fallen out here and there from its leathern covering left the corners of it at liberty to roll themselves up in all directions. The doctor was in his morning gown, that is, enveloped in a faded toga, which had served him long since to appear in at Milan, on some great occasion. He closed the door and encouraged the young man with these words. My son, tell me your case. I wish to speak a word to you in confidence. Well, say on, replied the doctor, as he seated himself in the armchair. Renzo stood before the table, twirling his hat in his hand, and began. I wish to know from one as learned as yourself. Tell me the affair just as it is, interrupted the doctor in as few words as possible. You must pardon me, Senor Doctor. We poor people know not how to speak to such as you are. I wish then to know... Bless the people. They are all alike. Instead of relating facts, they ask questions, and that because their own opinions are already settled. Excuse me, Senor Doctor. I wish then to know if there is a punishment for threatening a curate to prevent him from performing a marriage ceremony. I understand, said the doctor, who in truth had not understood. I understand. And suddenly assuming an air of seriousness and importance. A serious case, my son. A case contemplated. You have done well to come to me. It is a clear case, noticed in a hundred proclamations, and in one of the year just elapsed by the actual governor. You shall see, you shall see. Where can it be? 
said he, plunging his hand amidst the chaos of papers. It must surely be here, as it is a decree of great importance. Ah, here it is. He unfolded it, looked at the date, and with a serious face exclaimed, Fifteenth of October, 1627. Yes, yes, this is it. A new edict. These are those which cause terror. Do you know how to read, my son? A little, Signor Doctor. Well, now, c come behind me, and you will see for yourself. Holding the proclamation extended before him, he began to read, stammering rapidly over some passages, and pausing distinctly with great expression on others, according to the necessity of the case. Although by the proclamation published by order of the Signor Duke de Ferreira on the 14th of December, 1620, and ratified by the most illustrious and most excellent lord, Signor Gonzalez Fernandez de Cordoba, etc., etc., had by extraordinary and rigorous remedies provided against the oppressions, exactions, and other tyrannical acts committed against the devoted vassals of his majesty, the frequency of the excesses, however, etc., etc., has arrived at such a point that his excellency is under the necessity etc etc wherefore with the concurrence of the senate and convention etc etc has resolved to publish the present decree and from the tyrannical acts which the skill of many in the villages as well as in the cities do you hear huh? exact and oppress the weak in various ways making violent contracts of purchase of rent etc where is it Ah, here it is. Listen, listen. Who, whether matrimony follow or not. Oh, that's my case, said Renzo. Listen, listen, here is more. Now we will find the punishment. Humph! That they leave the place of their abode, etc., etc. That if one pays a debt, he must not be molested. All this has nothing to do with us. Ah, here it is. The priest refusing to do that to which he is obliged by his office, eh? It appears the proclamation was made purposely for me. Ah, is it not so? Listen, listen. And other similar oppressions which flow from the vassals, nobility, middle and lower classes. None escape. They are all here. It is like the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Here now the penalty. For all these and other similar evil deeds which have been prohibited, it is nevertheless necessary to exact with rigor, etc., his Excellency not annulling orders and commands that whoever the offenders be, they shall be subjected to pecuniary and corporal punishment, to banishment, the galleys, or to death. A mere trifle. At the will of His Excellency or of the Senate, and from this there is no escape, etc., etc. And see here the signature, Gonzalez Fernandez de Cordova, and lower down, Platonus, and here again, Vede Ferrar. Nothing is wanting. Whilst the doctor was reading, Renzo had kept his eyes on the paper, seeking to ascertain for himself its real meaning. The doctor, perceiving his new client more attentive than dismayed, marveled greatly. "'He must be enrolled as one of the bravos,' said he to himself. "'Ah, ah,' exclaimed he, addressing Renzo. "'You have shaved off the long lock. Well, well, it was prudent. But placing yourself in my hands, you need not have done so. The case is a serious one.' You can have no idea how much resolution is required to conduct these matters wisely. To understand this mistake of the doctors, it should be known that the bravos by profession used to wear a long lock of hair, which they pulled over the face as a mask in enterprises that required prudence as well as strength. The proclamation had not been silent with regard to this custom. His Excellency commands that whosoever shall wear hair of such a length as to cover the forehead to the eyebrows will incur the penalty of a fine of three hundred crowns, in case of incapability of payment, three years in the galleys for the first offence, and for the second, in addition to the aforesaid, greater punishment still at the will of His Excellency. The long lock had become a distinctive mark of the loose and disorderly. "'Indeed, indeed,' replied Renzo. "'I have never worn a long lock in my life.' "'I can do nothing,' replied the doctor, shaking his head, with a knowing and rather impatient smile. "'Nothing, if you do not trust me.' He who utters falsehoods to the doctor is a fool who will tell the truth to the judge. It is necessary to relate things plainly to the lawyer, but it rests with us to render them more intricate. 
if you wish me to help you you must tell all from beginning to end as to your confessor you must name the person who commissioned you to do the deed doubtless he is a person of consequence and considering this will go to his house to perform an act of duty i will not betray you at all be assured i will tell him i come to implore his protection for a poor calumniated youth and we will together use the necessary means to finish the affair in a satisfactory manner you understand in securing himself he will likewise secure you if however the business has been all your own i will not withdraw my protection i have extricated others from worse difficulties provided you have not offended a person of consequence you understand i engage to free you from all embarrassment with a little expense you understand as to the curate if he is a person of judgment he will keep his own counsel if he is a fool we will take care of him one may escape clear out of every trouble but for this a man a man is necessary your case is a very very serious one the edict speaks plainly and if the thing rested between you and the law to be candid it would go hard with you if you wish to pass smoothly money and obedience whilst the doctor poured forth this rhapsody renzo had been regarding him with mute astonishment as the countryman watches the juggler whom he sees cramming his mouth with handful after handful of tow when lo he beholds immediately drawn forth from the same mouth a never-ending line of ribbon when at last he perceived his meaning he interrupted him with oh senor doctor how you have misunderstood me the matter is directly the reverse i have threatened no one not i i never do such things ask my companions all of them and they will tell you i never had anything to do with the law the injury is mine and i have come to you to know how i can obtain justice and i am well satisfied to have seen this proclamation the devil exclaimed the doctor opening wide his eyes what a cock-and-bull story you have made so it is you are all alike is it possible you can't tell a plain fact but senor doctor you must pardon me you have not given me time now i will tell you all know then that i was to have been married to-day and here his voice trembled was to have been married to-day to a young person to whom i have been some time betrothed to-day was the day fixed upon by the senor curate and everything was in readiness the senor curate began to make excuses and not to weary you i compelled him to tell me the cause and he confessed that he had been forbidden on pain of death to perform the ceremony this powerful don roderick eh? hastily interrupted the doctor contracting his brow and wrinkling his red nose away with you what have i to do with these idle stories tell them to your companions and not to one of my condition be gone do you think i have nothing to do but listen to tales of this sort i protest be gone i say what have i to do with your protestations i wash my hands from them and pacing the room he rubbed his hands together as if really performing that act hereafter learn when to speak and do not take a gentleman by surprise but hear me hear me vainly repeated renzo the doctor still growling pushed him towards the door set it wide open called the maid and said to her return this man immediately what he brought i will have nothing to do with it the woman had never before been required to execute a similar order but she did not hesitate to obey she took the fowls and gave them to renzo with a compassionate look as if she had said you certainly have made some very great blunder renzo wished to make apologies but the doctor was immovable confounded therefore and more enraged than ever he took back the fowls and departed to render an account of the ill success of his expedition at his departure agnes and lucy had exchanged their nuptial robes for their humble daily habits and then sorrowful and dejected occupied themselves in suggesting fresh projects agnes expected great results from renzo's visit to the doctor lucy thought that it would be well to let father christopher know what had happened as he was a man who would not only advise but assist whenever he could serve the unfortunate agnes assented but how was it to be accomplished the convent was two miles distant and at this time they certainly could neither of them hazard a walk thither whilst they were weighing the difficulties some one knocked at the door and they heard a low but distinct deo gracias 
Lucy, imagining who it was, hastened to open it, and, bowing low, there entered a capuchin collector of contributions, with his wallet swung over his left shoulder. "'Oh, Brother Galdino," said Agnes. "'The Lord be with you,' said the brother. "'I have come for your contribution of nuts.' "'Go, get the nuts for the fathers,' said Agnes. Lucy obeyed, but before she quitted the room, she gave her mother a kind and impressive look, as much as to say, "'Be secret.' The capuchin, looking significantly at Agnes, said, "'And the wedding? It was to have taken place to-day. What has happened?' "'The curate is sick, and we are obliged to defer it,' replied the dame in haste. "'But what success in the contributions?' continued she, anxious to change the subject, which she would willingly have prolonged, but for Lucy's earnest look. "'Very poor, good dame, very poor. This is all,' said he, swinging the wallet from his shoulder." this is all and for this i have been obliged to knock at ten doors but the year is a scarce one brother galdino and when we have to struggle for bread our alms are necessarily small if we wish abundance to return my good dame we must give alms do you not know the miracle of the nuts which happened many years ago in our convent of romagna no in truth tell me well you must know then that in this convent there was one of our fathers who was a saint. He was called Father Macario. One winter's day, passing by a field of one of our patrons, a worthy man he was, he saw him standing near a large nut tree, and four peasants with their axes raised to level it to the ground. "'What are you doing to the poor tree?' demanded the Father Macario. "'Why, Father, it is unfruitful, and I am about to cut it down.' do not do so do not do so said the father i tell you that next year it will bear more nuts than leaves the master ordered the workmen to throw at once the earth on the roots which had been already bared and calling after the father macario said father macario the half of the crop shall be for the convent the prediction was noised about and every one went to look at the tree in fact when spring arrived there were flowers in abundance and afterwards nuts in abundance. But there was a greater miracle yet, as you shall hear. The owner, who, before the nut season, was called hence to enjoy the fruits of his charity, left a son of a very different character from himself. Now at the time of harvest the collector went to receive his appointed portion, but the son affected entire ignorance, and presumptuously replied, he never had understood that the capuchins knew how to make nuts. Now guess what happened then. One day he had invited to dinner some friends, and, making merry, he amused them with the story of the nuts. They desired to visit his granary, to behold his abundance. He led the way, advanced towards the corner where they had been placed, looked, and what do you think he saw? A heap of dry nut leaves. Was not this a miracle? and the convent gained, instead of suffering loss. The profusion of nuts bestowed upon it in consequence was so great, that one of our patrons, compassionating the poor collector, gave him a mule to assist in carrying them home. And so much oil was made, that it was freely given to the poor, like the sea, which receives waters from every part, and distributes abundantly to the rivers." Lucy now reappeared with her apron so loaded with nuts that she could with difficulty support the burden. Whilst Friar Galdino untied his wallet to receive them, Agnes cast an astonished and displeased glance at her for her prodigality. She returned it with a look which seemed to say, "'I will satisfy you.' The friar was liberal of thanks, and replacing his wallet was about to depart when Lucy called him back. "'I wish you to do me a service,' said she. I wish you to say to Father Christopher that I have a great desire to speak with him, and request him to have the goodness to come hither immediately, as it is impossible for me to go to the convent. Willingly. An hour shall not elapse before Father Christopher shall be informed of your wish. I rely on you. Trust me, said he. I will be faithful. And moved off, bending under the increased weight of his wallet. We must not suppose, from the readiness with which Lucy sent this request to Father Christopher, and the equal readiness of Father Galdino to carry it, that the father was a person of no consequence. On the contrary, he was a man of much authority amongst his companions, and throughout all the neighborhood, to serve the feeble and to be served by the powerful, to enter the palace and the hut, 
to be at one time a subject of pastime, and at another regarded with profound respect, to seek alms and to bestow them. To all these vicissitudes a capuchin was well accustomed. The name of friar at this period was uttered with the greatest respect, and with the most bitter contempt, of both of which sentiments, perhaps, the capuchins were, more than any other order, the objects. They possessed no property, wore a coarser habit than others, and made a more open profession of humility. They therefore exposed themselves in a greater degree to the veneration or the scorn which might result from the various characters among men. The friar Galdino being gone. "'Such a quantity of nuts!' exclaimed Agnes. "'And in a year of scarcity!' "'I beg pardon,' replied Lucy. "'But if we had been as penurious as others in our charity, who can tell how long the friar would have been in reaching home, or, amongst all the gossipings, whether he would have remembered?' true true it was a good thought and besides charity always produces good fruit said agnes who with all her defects was a kind-hearted woman and would have sacrificed everything she had in the world for the sake of her child and whom she had reposed all her happiness renzo entered at this moment with an angry and mortified countenance pretty advice you gave me said he to agnes you sent me to a fine man indeed to one truly who aids the distressed and he briefly related his interview with the doctor the dame astonished at the issue endeavoured to prove that the advice was good and that the failure must have been owing to renzo himself lucy interrupted the debate by informing him of her message to father christopher he seized with avidity the new hopes inspired by the expectation of assistance from so holy a man but if the father said he should not extricate us from our difficulties I will do it myself by some means or other. Both mother and daughter employed him to be patient and prudent. Tomorrow, said Lucy, Father Christopher will certainly be here, and he will no doubt suggest to us some plan of action which we ourselves would not have thought of in a year. I hope so, said Renzo. But if not, I will obtain redress, or find another to do it for me. For surely there must be justice to be had in the world. Their mournful conversation might have continued much longer, but approaching night warned him to depart. Good night, said Lucy mournfully to Renzo, who could hardly resolve to go. Good night, replied he, yet more sadly. Some saint will watch over us, said she. Be patient and prudent. The mother added some advice of the like nature, but the disappointed bridegroom, with a tempest in his heart, left them, repeating the strange proposition. Surely there's justice in the world. So true is it that, under the influence of great misfortune, men no longer know what they say. End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni Translated by George William Fenshaw This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 the sun had not yet risen above the horizon when Father Christopher left the convent of Pescarenico to go to the cottage where he was so anxiously expected. Pescarenico is a small hamlet on the left bank of the Ada, or rather of the lake, a few steps below the bridge. A group of houses, inhabited for the most part by fishermen, and adorned here and there with nets spread out to dry. The convent was situated, the building still subsists, at a short distance from them, halfway between Lecco and Bergamo. The sky was clear and serene. As the sun rose behind the mountain, its rays brightened the opposite summits, and thence rapidly spread themselves over the declivities and valleys. A light autumn breeze played through the leaves of the mulberry trees, and brought them to the ground. The vineyards were still brilliant with leaves of various hues, and the newly made nets appeared brown and distinct amid the fields of stubble, which were white and shining with the dew. The scene was beautiful, but the misery of the inhabitants formed a sad contrast to it. At every moment you met pale and ragged beggars, some grown old in the trade, others youthful, and induced to it from extreme necessity. They passed quietly by Father Christopher, and although they had nothing to hope from him since a capuchin never touches money, they bowed low in thanks for the alms they had received, or might hereafter receive, at the convent. The spectacle of the laborers scattered in the fields was still more mournful. Some were sowing thinly and sparingly their seed, as if hazarding that which was too precious. Others put the spade into the earth with difficulty, and wearily turned up the clods. The pale and sickly child was leading the meagre cattle to the pasture-ground, and as he went along, 
plucked carefully the herbs found in his path as food for his family. This melancholy picture of human misery increased the sadness of Father Christopher, who, when he left the convent, had been filled with presentiments of evil. But why did he feel so much for Lucy, and why, at the first notice, did he hasten to her with as much solicitude as if he had been sent for by the Father Provincial? And who was this Father Christopher? We must endeavor to satisfy all of these inquiries. Father Christopher of Blank was a man nearer sixty than fifty years of age. His head was shaven, with the exception of the band of hair allowed to grow round it like a crown, as was the custom of the Capuchins. The expression of his countenance was habitually that of deep humility, although occasionally there passed over it flashes of pride and inquietude, which were, however, succeeded by a deeper shade of self-reproach and lowliness. His long grey beard gave more character to the shape of the upper part of his head, on which habitual abstinence had stamped a strong expression of gravity. His sunken eyes were, for the most part, bent to the earth, but brightened at times with unexpected vivacity, which he ever appeared to endeavour to repress. His name before entering the convent had been Ludovico. He was the son of a merchant of blank, who, having accumulated great wealth, had renounced trade in the latter part of his life, and having resolved to live like a gentleman, he studied every means to cause his former mode of life to be forgotten by those around him. He could not, however, forget it himself. The shop, the goods, the day-book, the yard-measure, rose to his memory, like the shade of Banquo to Macbeth, amidst the pomp of the table and the smiles of his parasites, whose continual effort it was to avoid any word which might appear to allude to the former condition of the host. Ludovico was his only child. He caused him to be nobly educated, as far as the laws and customs permitted him to do so, and died bequeathing him a splendid fortune. Ludovico had contracted the habits and feelings of a gentleman, and the flatterers who had surrounded him from infancy had accustomed him to the greatest deference and respect. But he found the scene changed when he attempted to mingle with the nobility of the city, and that in order to live in their company he must school himself to patience and submission, and bear with contumely on every occasion. This agreed neither with his education nor his disposition. He retired from them in disgust, but unwillingly, feeling that such should naturally have been his companions. He then resolved to outdo them in pomp and magnificence, thereby increasing the enmity with which they had already regarded him. His open and violent nature soon engaged him in more serious contests. He sincerely abhorred the exhortions and injuries committed by those to whom he had opposed himself. He therefore habitually took part with the weak against the powerful, so that by degrees he had constituted himself the defender of the oppressed and the vindicator of their wrongs. The office was onerous, and fruitful in evil thoughts, quarrels, and enmities against himself. But, besides this external warfare, he perhaps suffered still more from inward conflicts. For often, in order to compass his objects, he was obliged to adopt measures of circumvention and violence, which his conscience disapproved. He was under the painful necessity of keeping in pay a band of ruffians for his own security, as well as to aid him in his enterprises, and for these purposes he was necessarily obliged to select the boldest, that is, the vilest, and to live with vagabonds from a love of justice so that, disgusted with the world and its conflicts, he had many times seriously thought of entering some monastery and retiring from it for ever. Such intentions were more strongly entertained on the failure of some of his enterprises, or the perception of his own danger, or the annoyance of his vicious associates, and would probably still have continued intentions, but for one of the most serious and terrible events of his hazardous mode of life. He was walking one day through the streets of the city, accompanied by a former shopman, who had been transformed by his father into a steward, followed by two bravos. The name of the shopman was Christopher. He was a man about fifty years of age, devoted to the master whom he attended in infancy, and upon whose liberality he supported himself, his wife, and a large family of children. Ludovico saw a gentleman approaching at a distance, with whom he had never spoken in his life, but whom he hated for his arrogance and pride, which hatred the other cordially returned. He had in his train four bravos. He advanced with a haughty step, in an expression of insolence and disdain on his countenance. It was Ludovico's right, being on the left side, to pass nearest the wall, according to the custom of the day, and every one was tenacious of this privilege. As they met, they stopped face to face, like two figures on a base relief, neither of them being disposed to yield to the other. The gentleman, eyeing Ludovico proudly and imperiously, said with a corresponding tone of voice, "'Pass on the outside.' "'Pass there yourself,' replied Ludovico. "'The street is mine.' With persons of your condition, the street is always mine. Yes, if your arrogance were a law to others. The attendants of each stood still, with their hands on their daggers, prepared for battle. The passers-by retreated to a distance to watch the event. 
pass on, vile mechanic, or I will teach you the civility due to a gentleman. You lie, I am not vile. Ha! Do you give me the lie? If you were a gentleman, I would soon settle matters with my sword. You are a coward also, or you would not hesitate to support by deeds the insolence of your words. Throw this rascal in the dirt, said the gentleman, turning to his followers. Let us see who will dare to do so, said Ludovico, stepping back and laying his hand on his sword. Rash man, cried the other, unsheathing his own. I will break this in pieces when it shall have been stained with your base blood. They rushed violently on each other. The servants of both sprang to the defense of their masters. The combat was unequal in numbers, and also unequal from Ludovico's desire to defend himself rather than to wound his enemy, whilst the latter intended nothing less than murder. Ludovico was warding off the dagger of one of the bravos, after having received a slight scratch on the cheek, when his enemy thrust at him from behind. Christopher, seeing his master's peril, went to his assistance. Upon this the anger of the enraged cavalier was turned against the shopman, and he thrust him through the heart with his sword. Ludovico, as if beside himself at the sight, buried his weapon in the breast of the murderer, who fell almost at the same instant with the poor Christopher. The attendants of the gentleman, beholding him on the ground, took to flight, and Ludovico found himself alone in the midst of a crowd, with two bodies lying at his feet. What has happened? One, two. He has been thrust through the body. Who was killed? A nobleman. Holy virgin! What destruction! Who seeks finds. A moment pays all. What a wound! It must have been a serious affair. And this unfortunate man. Mercy, what a spectacle! Save, save him! It will go hard with him also. See how he is wounded! He is covered with blood. Escape, poor man, escape. Do not let yourself be taken. These words expressed the common suffrage, and with advice came also assistance. The affair had taken place near a church of the Capuchins, an asylum impenetrable to the officers of justice. The murderer, bleeding and stupefied, was carried thither by the crowd. The Brotherhood received him from their hands with this recommendation. He is an honest man who has made a proud rascal cold but he did it in his own defense. Ludovico had never before shed blood, and although in these times murder was a thing so common that all ceased to wonder at it, yet the impression which he received from the recollection of the dying, dying through his instrumentality, was new and indescribable, a revelation of feelings hitherto unknown. The fall of his enemy, the alteration of those features, passing in a moment from angry threatenings to the solemn stillness of death, this was a spectacle which wrought an instantaneous change in the soul of the murderer. Whilst they were carrying him to the convent, he had been insensible to what was passing. Returning to his senses, he found himself in a bed of the infirmary, in the hands of a friar who was dressing his wounds. Another, whose particular duty it was to administer comfort to the dying, had been called to the scene of combat. He returned in a short time, and approaching Ludovico's bed, said, "'Console yourself. He has died in peace, has forgiven you, and hoped for your forgiveness.' At these words the soul of Ludovico was filled with remorse and sorrow. "'And the other?' asked he anxiously. "'The other had expired before I arrived.' In the meantime the avenues and environs of the convent swarmed with people. The officers of justice arrived, dispersed the crowd, and placed themselves in ambush at a short distance from the gates, so that no one could pass through them unobserved. A brother of the deceased and some of his family appeared in full armor with a large attendance of bravos and surrounded the place, watching with a threatening aspect the bystanders, who did not dare say, He is safe, but they had it written on their faces. Scarcely had Ludovico recalled his scattered thoughts when he asked for a father confessor, prayed him to seek out the widow of Christopher, to ask forgiveness in his name for having been, however involuntarily, the cause of her affliction, and to assure her that he would take the care of her family on himself. Reflecting further on his own situation, his determination was made to become a friar. It seemed as if God himself had willed it by placing him in a convent at such a conjuncture. He immediately sent for the superior of the monastery, and expressed to him his intention. He replied to him that he should be careful not to form a resolution precipitately, but that if he persisted he would be accepted. Ludovico then sent for a notary, and made a donation of all his estate to the widow and family of Christopher. 
The resolution of Ludovico happened opportunely for his hosts, who felt themselves embarrassed concerning him. To send him from the monastery, and thus expose him to justice and the vengeance of his enemies, was not to be thought of a moment. It would be the same as a renunciation of their privileges, a discrediting of the convent amongst the people, and they would draw upon themselves the animadversion of all the capuchins of the universe for this relinquishment of the rights of the order, this defiance of the ecclesiastical authorities, who then considered themselves the guardians of these rights. On the other hand, the family of the deceased, rich and powerful in adherents, were determined on vengeance, and disposed to consider as enemies whoever should place obstacles to its accomplishment. History declares, not that they grieved much for the dead, or that a single tear was shed amongst his whole race, but that they were urged on by scenting the blood of his opponent. But Ludovico, by assuming the habit of a capuchin, removed all difficulties. To a certain degree he made atonement, imposed on himself penitence, confessed his fault, withdrew from the contest. He was, in short, an enemy who laid down his arms. The relations of the deceased could, if they pleased, believe and boast that he had become a friar through despair and dread of their revenge. And at all events, to reduce a man to dispossess himself of his wealth, to shave his head, to walk barefooted, to sleep on straw, and to live on alms, might appear a punishment competent to the offence. The superior presented himself before the brother of the deceased with an air of humility. After a thousand protestations of respect for his illustrious house, and of desire to comply with its wishes as far as was practicable, he spoke of the repentance and resolution of Ludovico, politely hoping that the family would grant their accordance, and then insinuating, mildly and dexterously, that, agreeable or not agreeable, the thing would take place. After some little vaporing, he agreed to it on one condition, that the murderer of his brother should depart immediately from the city. To this the capuchin assented, as if in obedience to the wishes of the family, although it had already been so determined. The affair was thus concluded to the satisfaction of the illustrious house, of the capuchin brotherhood, of the popular feeling, and, above all, of our generous penitent himself. Thus, at thirty years of age, Ludovico bade farewell to the world, and, having, according to custom, to change his name, he took one which would continually recall to him his crime. Thus he became Friar Christopher. Hardly was the ceremony of assuming the habit completed when the superior informed him he must depart on the morrow to perform his novitiate at blank, sixty miles distance. The novitiate bowed submissively. "'Permit me, father,' said he, "'before I leave the scene of my crime, to do all that rests with me now to repair the evil. Permit me to go to the house of the brother of him whom I have murdered, to acknowledge my fault and ask forgiveness. Perhaps God will take away his but too just resentment. It appeared to the superior that such an act, besides being praiseworthy in itself, would serve still more to reconcile the family to the monastery. He therefore bore the request himself to the brother of the murdered man. A proposal so unexpected was received with a mixture of scorn and complacency. "'Let him come to-morrow,' said he, and appointed the hour. The superior returned to Father Christopher with the desired permission. The gentleman reflected that the more solemn and public the apology was, the more it would enhance his credit with the family and the world. He made known in haste to the members of the family that on the following day they should assemble at his house to receive a common satisfaction. At midday the palace swarmed with nobility of either sex. There was a blending of veils, feathers, and jewels, a heavy motion of starched and crisped bands, a confused entangling of embroidered trains. The antechambers, the courts, and the street were crowded with servants, pages, and bravos. Father Christopher experienced a momentary agitation at beholding all this preparation, but recovering himself, said, "'It is well. The deed was committed in public. The reparation should be public.' Then, with his eyes bent to the earth, and the father, his companion, at his elbow, he crossed the court, amidst a crowd who eyed him with unceremonious curiosity. He entered, ascended the stairs, and passing through another crowd of lords, who made way for him at his approach, he advanced towards the master of the mansion, who stood in the middle of the room waiting to receive him, with downcast looks, grasping with one hand the hilt of his sword, and with the other pressing the cape of his Spanish cloak to his breast. The countenance and deportment of Father Christopher made an immediate impression on the company, so that all were convinced that he had not submitted to this humiliation from fear of man. He threw himself on his knees before him whom he had most injured, crossed his hands on his breast, and, bending his head, exclaimed, "'I am the murderer of your brother. God knows that to restore him to life I would sacrifice my own. But 
as this cannot be, I supplicate you to accept my useless and late apology for the love of God. All eyes were fixed in breathlessness and mute attention on the novice, and on the person to whom he addressed himself. There was heard through the crowd a murmur of pity and respect. The angry scorn of the nobleman relaxed at this appeal, and bending towards the kneeling supplicant, Rise, said he with a troubled voice. The offence, the deed truly, but the habit you wear, not only this, but on your own account. Rise, father, my brother, I cannot deny it, was a cavalier of a hasty temper. Do not speak of it again. But, father, you must not remain in this posture. And he took him by the arm to raise him. Father Christopher, standing with his eyes still bent to the ground, continued. I may, then, hope that you have granted me your pardon, and if I obtain it from you, from whom may I not expect it? Oh, if I could hear you utter the word. Pardon, said the nobleman. I pardon you with all my heart, and all, turning to the company, all, all, resounded at once through the room. The countenance of the father expanded with joy, under which, however, was still visible a humble and profound compunction for the evil which the remission of men could not repair. The nobleman, entirely vanquished, threw his arms around his neck, and the kiss of peace was given and received. Loud exclamations of applause burst from the company, and all crowded eagerly around the father. In the meanwhile the servants entered, bearing refreshments. The master of the mansion, again addressing Father Christopher, said, Father, afford me a proof of your friendship by accepting some of these trifles. Such things are no longer for me, replied the father. But if you will allow me a loaf of bread as a memorial of your charity and your forgiveness, I shall be thankful. The bread was brought, and with an air of humble gratitude he put it in his basket. He then took leave of the company, disentangled himself with difficulty from the crowd in the antechambers, who would have kissed the hem of his garment, and pursued his way to the gate of the city, whence he commenced his pedestrian journey towards the place of his novitiate. It is not our design to write the history of his cloistral life. We will only say he executed faithfully the offices ordinarily assigned to him of preaching and of comforting the dying, but beyond these— The oppressor's wrongs, the proud man's contumely— aroused in him a spirit of resistance which humiliation and remorse had not been able entirely to extinguish. His countenance was habitually mild and humble, but occasionally there passed over it a shade of former impetuosity, which was with difficulty restrained by the high and holy motives which now predominated in his soul. His tone of voice was gentle as his countenance, but in the cause of justice and truth his language assumed a character of solemnity and emphasis singularly impressive. One who knew him well and admired his virtues could often perceive by the smothered utterance or the change of a single word the inward conflict between the natural impetus and the resolved will, which latter never failed to gain the mastery. If one unknown to him in the situation of Lucy had implored his assistance, he would have granted it immediately. With how much more solicitude, then, did he direct his steps to the cottage, knowing and admiring her innocence, trembling for her danger, and experiencing a lively indignation at the persecution of which she had become the object. Besides, he had advised her to remain quiet, and not make known the conduct of her persecutor, and he felt or feared that his advice might have been productive of bad consequences. His anxiety for her welfare and his inadequate means to secure it called up many painful feelings, which the good often experience. But while we have been relating his history, he arrived at the dwelling. Agnes and her daughter advanced eagerly towards him, exclaiming in one breath, Oh, Father, Father Christopher, Christopher, you are, are welcome. welcome. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five》Chapter Five of *The Betrothed* by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Five. Father Christopher perceived immediately from the countenances of Lucy and her mother that some evil had occurred. "Is all well with you?" said he. Lucy replied by a flood of tears. "Quiet yourself, poor child," continued he. And do you, turning to Agnes, tell me what is the matter? Whilst the good dame proceeded with the melancholy relation, he experienced a variety of painful emotions. The story being done, he buried his face in his hands, and exclaimed, 
oh blessed god how long he then turned to lucy poor child god has indeed visited you said he you will not abandon us father said lucy sobbing abandon you replied he how should i dare ask the protection of almighty god for myself if i abandoned you you so defenceless you whom he has confided to me take courage he will assist you his eye beholds you he can even make use of a feeble instrument like myself to confound a let us think what can be done thus saying he grasped his beard and chin with his hand as if to concentrate more completely the powers of his mind but the more clearly he perceived the pressing nature of the case the more uncertain and dangerous appeared every mode of meeting it to endeavour to make don abondio sensible of a failure in duty this appeared hopeless fear was more powerful with him than either shame or duty to inform the cardinal archbishop and invoke his authority that would require time and in the meanwhile what was to be done to resist don roderick how impossible the affair being one of a private nature he would not be sustained by the brethren of his order he would perhaps be raising a storm against himself and what was worse by a useless attempt render the condition of lucy more hopeless and deplorable after many reflections he came to the conclusion to go to don roderick himself and to endeavour by prayers and representations of the punishments of the wicked in another state to win him from his infamous purpose at least he might at the interview discover something of his intentions and determine his measures accordingly at this moment renzo who as the reader will readily imagine could not long be absent at so interesting a crisis appeared at the door of the room the father raised his head and bowed to him affectionately and with a look of intense pity have they told you father inquired he with a troubled voice yes my son and on that account i am here what do you say of the villain what do i say of him i say to you dear renzo that you must confide in god and he will not abandon you blessed words exclaimed the youth you are not one of those who wrong the poor but the curate and this doctor do not torment yourself uselessly i am but a poor friar but i repeat to you that which i have already said to lucy and her mother poor as i am i will never abandon you oh you are not like the friends of the world rascals when i was in prosperity abundant in protestations ready to shed their blood for me to sustain me against the devil had i an enemy they would soon put it out of his power to molest me and now to see them withdraw themselves he was interrupted in his vituperations by the dark shade which passed over the countenance of his auditor he perceived the blunder he had made and attempting to remedy it became perplexed and confused i uh, would say i did not at all intend uh, that is i meant to say what did you mean to say you have already begun to mar my undertaking it is well that thou art undeceived in time what thou didst seek friends and what friends they could not have aided thee had they been willing and thou didst not apply to the only friend who can and will protect thee dost thou not know that god is the friend of all who trust in him dost thou not know that to spread the talents does little good to the weak and even if at these words he grasped forcibly renzo's arm his countenance without losing his wonted authority displayed an affecting remorse his eyes were fixed on the ground and his voice became slow and sepulchral and even if that little should be gained how terribly awful renzo will you confide in me that i should say in me a worm of the dust will you not confide in god oh yes replied renzo he only is the lord promise me then that you will not meet or provoke any one that you will suffer yourself to be guided by me i promise said renzo lucy drew a long breath as if relieved from a weight and agnes was loud in applauses listen my children resumed father christopher i will go myself to-day to speak to this man if god touches his heart through my words well if not he will provide some other remedy 
in the meantime keep yourselves quiet and retired this evening or to-morrow at the latest you shall see me again having said this he departed amidst thanks and blessings he arrived at the convent in time to perform his daily duty in the choir dined and then pursued his way towards the den of the wild beast he had undertaken to tame the palace of don roderick stood by itself on the summit of one of the promontories that skirt the coast it was three or four miles distant from the village at the foot of the promontory nearest the lake there was a cluster of decayed cottages inhabited by peasantry belonging to don roderick this was the little capital of his little kingdom as you cast a glance within their walls you beheld suspended to them various kinds of arms, with spades, mattocks, and pouches of powder, blended promiscuously. The persons within appeared robust and strong, with a daring and insulting expression of countenance, and wearing a long lock of hair on the head, which was covered with network. The aged, that had lost their teeth, seemed ready to show their gums at the slightest call. Masculine women with sinewy arms seemed disposed to use them with as much indifference as their tongues. The very children exhibited the same daring recklessness as the parent stock. Friar Christopher passed through the hamlet, ascending a winding path which conducted him to the little esplanade in front of the castle. The door was shut, which was a sign that the chief was dining and did not wish to be disturbed. The few windows that looked on the road were small and decayed by time. They were, however, secured by large iron bars, and the lowest of them were more than ten feet from the ground. A profound silence reigned within and a traveller might have believed the mansion deserted, but for the appearance of four animals, two alive and two dead, in front of the castle. Two large vultures, with their wings expanded, were nailed each at the posts of the gate, and two bravos, extended at full length on the benches on either side, were keeping guard until their master should have finished his repast. The father stopped, as if willing also to wait. Hey, father, father, come on, said one. We do not make it the Capuchins wait here. We are the friends of the convent. I have been within its walls when the air on the outside of them was not a very wholesome for me. It was well the fathers did not refuse me admittance. So saying, he gave two strokes with the knocker. At the sound, the howls of mastiffs were heard from within, and in a few moments there appeared an aged domestic. On seeing the father, he bowed reverently, quieted the animals with his voice, introduced the guest into a narrow court, and closed the gate then escorting him into a saloon and regarding him with an astonished and respectful look said is not this the father christopher of pescaranico the same and here as you see good man it must be to do good continued he murmuring between his teeth good can be done everywhere he then guided him through two or three dark halls and led the way to the banqueting room here was heard a confused noise of plates and knives and forks and discordant voices whilst father christopher was urging the domestic to suffer him to remain in some other apartment until the dinner should be finished the door opened a certain count attilio cousin of the noble host of whom we have already spoken without giving his name was seated opposite when he saw the bald head and habit of the father and perceived his motion to withdraw ho father cried he you shan't escape us Reverend Father, forward, forward. Don Roderick seconded somewhat unwillingly this boisterous command, as he felt some presentiment of the object of his visit. Come, Father, come in, said he. Seeing there was no retreating, Father Christopher advanced, saluting the nobleman and his guests. An honest man is generally fearless and undaunted in the presence of the wicked. Nevertheless, the father, with the testimony of a good conscience and a firm conviction of the justice of his cause, with a mixture of horror and compassion for Don Roderick, felt a degree of embarrassment in approaching him. He was seated at table, surrounded by guests. On his right was Count Attilio, his colleague in libertinism, who had come from Milan to visit him. To the left was seated, with respectful submissiveness, tempered, however, with conscious security, the podesta of the place, whose duty it was, according to the proclamation, to cause justice to be done to Renzo Tramalino, and to afflict the allotted penalty on Don Roderick. Near the opposite to the Podesta sat our learned doctor Azeca Garbulli, with his black cap and his red nose, and over against him two obscure guests, of whom our story says nothing beyond a general mention of their toad-eating qualities. "'Give a seat to the father,' said Don Roderick. A servant presented a chair, and the good father apologized for having come at so inopportune an hour. "'I would speak with you alone, on an affair of importance,' added he, in a low tone, to Don Roderick. Very well, father. 
it shall be so replied he but in the meanwhile bring the father something to drink father christopher would have refused but don roderick raising his voice above the tumult of the table cried no by bacchus you shall not do me this wrong a capuchin shall never leave this house without having tasted my wine nor an insolent creditor without having tasted the wood of my forests these words produced a universal laugh and interrupted for a moment the question which was hotly agitated between the guests a servant brought the wine of which father christopher partook feeling the necessity of propitiating the host the authority of tasso is against you respected signor podesta resumed aloud the count attilio this great man was well acquainted with the laws of knighthood and he makes the messenger of our Gantes, before carrying the defiance of the christian knights ask permission from the pious bouillon but that replied vociferously the podesta that is poetical license merely an ambassador is in his nature inviolable by the law of nations jura gentium and moreover the ambassador not having spoken in his own name but merely presented the challenge in writing but when will you comprehend that this ambassador was a daring fool who did not know the first with the good leave of our guests interrupted don roderick who did not wish the argument to proceed farther we will refer it to father christopher and submit to his decision agreed said count attilio amused at submitting a question of knighthood to a capuchin whilst the podesta muttered between his teeth fully but from what i have comprehended said the father it is a subject of which i have no knowledge as usual modest excuses from the father said don roderick but we will not accept them come come we know well that you come not into the world with a cowl on your head you know something of its ways well how stands the argument the facts are these said the count Attilio. let me tell who i am neutral cousin resumed don roderick this is the story a spanish knight sent a challenge to a milanese knight the bearer not finding him at home presented it to his brother who having read it struck the bearer many blows the question is it was well done he was perfectly right cried count Attilio. there was no right about it exclaimed the podesta to beat an ambassador a man whose person is sacred father do you think this was an action becoming a knight yes sir of a knight cried the count i think i know what belongs to a knight oh if it had been an affair of fists that would have been quite another thing but a cudgel size no one's hands i am not speaking of this sir count i am speaking of the laws of knighthood but tell me i pray you if the messengers that the ancient romans sent to bear defiance to other nations asked permission to deliver the message find if you can a writer who relates that such messenger was ever cudgelled what have the ancient romans to do with us a people well enough in some things but in others far far behind but according to the laws of modern knighthood i maintain that a messenger who dared place in the hands of a knight a challenge without having previously asked permission is a rash fool who deserves to be cudgelled but answer me this question no 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 but hear me to strike an unarmed person is an act of treachery at qui the messenger de quo was without arms ergo gently gently signor podesta how gently gently i tell you i concede that under other circumstances this might have been called an act of treachery but to strike a low fellow it would have been a fine thing truly to say to him as you would to a gentleman be on your guard and you sir doctor instead of sitting there grinning your approbation of my opinion why do you not aid me to convince this gentleman i replied the doctor in confusion i enjoy this learned dispute and am thankful for the opportunity of listening to a war of wit so agreeable and moreover i am not competent to give an opinion his most illustrious lordship has appointed a judge the father true 
said don roderick but how can the judge speak when the disputants will not keep silence i am dumb said the count Attilio. the podesta made a sign that he would be quiet well father at last said don roderick with comic gravity i have already said that i do not comprehend no excuses we must have your opinion if it must be so replied the father i should humbly think there was no necessity for challenges nor bearers nor blows the guests looked in wonder at each other oh how ridiculous said the count Attilio. pardon me father but this is exceedingly ridiculous it is plain you know nothing of the world he said don roderick he knows as much of it as you do cousin is it not so father father christopher made no reply but to himself he said submit thyself to every insult for the sake of those for whom thou art here it may be so said the count but the father how is the father called father, father christopher. christopher replied more than one but father christopher your reverend worship with your maxims you would turn the world upside down without challenges without blows farewell the point of honour impunity to ruffians happily the thing is impossible stop doctor cried don roderick wishing to divert the dispute from the original antagonists you are a good man for an argument what have you to say to the father indeed replied the doctor brandishing his fork in the air indeed i cannot understand how the father christopher should not remember that his judgment though of just weight in the pulpit is worth nothing i speak with great submission on a question of knighthood but perhaps he has been merely jesting to relieve himself from embarrassment the father not replying to this don roderick made an effort to change the subject a propos said he i understand there is a report at melon of an accommodation there was at this time a contest regarding the succession to the dukedom of mantua of which at the death of vincenzo gonzaga who died without male issue the duke of Nevers, his nearest relation had obtained possession louis the thirteenth or rather the cardinal de richelieu wished to sustain him there philip the fourth or rather the count d'olivares commonly called the count duke opposed him the dukedom was then a fief of the empire and the two parties employed intrigue and importunity at the court of the emperor ferdinand the second the object of one was to obtain the investiture of the new duke of the other the denial of his claim and also assistance to oblige him to relinquish it i rather think said the count Attilio, that the thing will be arranged satisfactorily i have reasons do not believe it count do not believe it added the podesta i have an opportunity of knowing because the spanish keeper of the castle who is my friend and who is the son of a dependent of the count duke is informed of everything i tell you i have discoursed on the subject daily at milan and i know from good authority that the pope exceedingly interested as he is for peace has made propositions that may be the thing is in order his holiness does his duty a pope should always endeavour to make peace between christian princes but the count duke has his own policy and 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 do you know signor podesta how much thought the emperor now gives to it do you believe there is no place but mantua in the world there are many things to provide for signor mind do you know for instance how far the emperor can trust this prince of valdistano or di valistai as they call him and if his name in the german language interrupted the magistrate is valenstein as i have heard it uttered many times by the spanish keeper of the castle but be of good courage do you dare teach me replied the count here don roderick whispered to him to cease contradiction as there would be no end to it he obeyed and the podesta like a vessel unimpeded by shoals continued with full sails the course of his eloquence valenstein gives me but little anxiety because the count duke has his eye everywhere and if Wallenstein carries matter with a high hand, he will soon set him right. He has his eye everywhere, I say, an unlimited power. And if it is his policy that the Signor Duke of Nevers should not take root in Mantua, he will never flourish there, be assured. 
It makes me laugh to see the Seigneur Cardinal de Richelieu contend with an Olivar. The Count Duke, gentlemen, pursued he, with the wind still in his favour, and much wondering at not meeting with opposition. The Count Duke is an old fox. Speaking with due respect, who would make any one lose his track? When he appears to go to the right, it would be safest to follow him to the left. No one can boast of knowing his designs. They who are to execute them, they who write the dispatches, know nothing of them. I speak from authority, for the keeper of the castle deigns to confide in me. The Count Duke knows well enough how the pot boils in all the courts in Europe, and these politicians have hardly laid a plan, but he begins to frustrate it. That poor man, the Cardinal Richelieu, attempts and dissembles, toils and strives, and what does it all produce? When he has dug the mine, he founds a countermine already prepared by the Count Duke. None can tell when the magistrate would have cast anchor if Don Roderick had not interrupted him. Signor Podesta, said he, and you, gentlemen, a bumper to the Count Duke, and you shall then judge if the wine is worthy of the personage. The Podesta bowed low in gratitude for an honor he considered as paid to himself in part for his eloquent harangue. May Don Gasparo Guzman, Count de Olivar, Duke of St. Luca, live a thousand years, said he, raising his glass. May, May he live, live a thousand years. years, exclaimed all the company. Help the father, said Don Roderick. Excuse me, replied he. I could not. How, said Don Roderick. Will you not drink to the Count Duke? Would you have us believe that you hold to the Navarre party? This was the contemptuous term applied to the French interest at the time of Henry the Fourth. There was no reply to be made to this, and the father was obliged to taste the wine. All the guests were loud in its praise, except the doctor, who had kept silence. Ha, huh. doctor, asked Don Roderick, what think you of it? I think, replied the doctor, withdrawing his ruddy and shining nose from the glass that this is the olivares of wines there is not a liquor resembling it in all the twenty-two kingdoms of the king our master whom god protect i maintain that the dinners of the most illustrious signor don roderick exceed the suppers of heliogabalus and that scarcity is banished for ever from this palace where reigns a perpetual and splendid abundance well said bravo bravo exclaimed with one voice the guests but the word scarcity, which the doctor had accidentally uttered, suggested a new and painful subject. All spoke at once. There is no famine, said one. It is the speculators who... And the bakers who conceal the grain, hang them! That is right, hang them, without mercy! Upon fair trial, cried the magistrate. What trial? cried Attilio, more loudly. Summary justice, I say. Take a few of them, who are known to be the richest and most avaricious, and hang them. Yes, hang them, hang them, and there will be grain scattered in abundance. Thus the party continued absorbing the wine, whose praises, mixed with sentences of economical jurisprudence, formed the burthen of the conversation, so that the loudest and most frequent words were, nectar and hang em. Don Roderick had, from time to time during this confusion, looked at the father, perceiving him calmly but firmly, awaiting his leisure for the interview which had been promised him. He relinquished the hope of wearying him by its postponement. To send away a capuchin, without giving him an audience, was not according to his policy, and since it could not be avoided, he resolved to meet it at once. He rose from the table, excused himself to his guests, and saying proudly, At your service, father, led the way to another room. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Six.《In what can I serve you?' said Don Roderick, as soon as they entered into the room. Sure were his words, but his manner said plainly, "Remember before whom thou standst, weigh well thy words, and be expeditious." There were no means more certain to impart courage to Father Christopher than arrogance or pride. He had stood for a moment in some embarrassment, passing through his fingers the beads of the rosary that hung suspended from his girdle, but he soon resumed new courage and revived at the haughty air of Don Roderick, 
He had, however, sufficient command over himself to reply with caution and humility. I come to supplicate you to perform an act of justice. Some wicked persons have, in the name of your lordship, frightened a poor curate, and have endeavoured to prevent his fulfilling his duty towards an innocent and unoffending couple. You can, by a word, confound their machinations and impart consolation to the afflicted. You can, and having it in your power, conscience, honour. Speak to me of conscience, when I ask your advice on the subject, and as to my honour, know that I only am the guardian of it, and that whoever dares to meddle with it is a rash man. Friar Christopher, warned by these words that the intention of Don Roderick was to turn the conversation into a dispute so as to win him from his original purpose, determined to bear whatever insult might be offered him, and meekly replied, It was certainly not my intention to say anything to displease you. Correct me, reprove me, but deign to listen to me. By the love of heaven, by that God before whom we must all appear, I charge thee, do not obstinately refuse to do justice to the innocent and oppressed. Think that God watches over them, that their imprecations are heard above, and— Stop! interrupted Don Roderick rudely. The respect I bear to your habit is great, but if anything could make me forget it, it would be to see it worn by one coming as a spy into my house. These words spread an indignant glow over the face of the father, but swallowing them as a bitter medicine, he resumed. You do not believe that I am such. You feel in your heart that I am here on no vile or contemptible errand. Listen to me, Signor Don Roderick, and heaven grant that the day may never arrive when you shall repent of not having listened to me. Listen to me, and perform this deed of justice and benevolence. Men will esteem you, God will esteem you. You have much in your power, but— Do you know? Again interrupted Don Roderick with warmth, but with something like remorse. That when the whim takes me to hear a sermon, I can go to church, but perhaps— Continued he, with a forced smile of mockery. You are putting regal dignity on me and giving me a preacher in my own palace. And to God princes are responsible for the reception of his messages. To God you are responsible. He now sends into your palace a message by one of his ministers, the most unworthy. In short, father, said Don Roderick, preparing to go, I do not comprehend you. I suppose you have some affair of your own on hand. Make a confidant of whom you please but use not the freedom of troubling a gentleman any further. Don Roderick, do not say no to me. Do not keep in anguish the heart of an innocent child. A word from you would be sufficient. Well, said Don Roderick, since you think I have so much in my power, and since you are so much interested. Yes, said Father Christopher, anxiously regarding him. Well, advise her to come, and place herself under my protection. She will want for nothing and no one shall disturb her, as I am a gentleman. At such a proposal, the indignation of the friar, which had hitherto been restrained with difficulty, loudly burst forth. All his prudence and patience forsook him. Your protection! exclaimed he, stepping back and stretching forth both his hands towards Don Roderick, while he sternly fixed his eyes upon him. Your protection! You have filled the measure of your guilt by this wicked proposal, and I fear you no longer. Dare you speak thus to me? I dare. I fear you no longer. God has abandoned you, and you are no longer an object of fear. Your protection. This innocent child is under the protection of God. You have, by your infamous offer, increased my assurance of her safety. Lucy, I say. See with what boldness I pronounce her name before you. Lucy. How? In this house? I compassionate this house. The wrath of God is upon it. You have acted in open defiance of the great God of heaven and earth. You have set at naught his counsel. You have oppressed the innocent. You have trampled on the rights of those whom you should have been the first to protect and defend. The wrath of God is upon you. A day will come. Villain, said Don Roderick, 
who at first was confounded between rage and astonishment, but when he heard the father thundering forth this prediction, a mysterious and unaccountable dread took possession of his soul. Hastily seizing his outstretched arm, and raising his voice in order to drown the maledictions of the monk, he cried aloud, Depart from me, rash villain, coward spy. These words instantly cooled the glowing enthusiasm of Father Christopher. The ideas of insult and injury in his mind had long been habitually associated with those of suffering and silence. His usual habits resumed their way, and he became calm. He awaited what farther might be said, as, after the strength of the whirlwind had passed, an aged tree naturally recomposes its branches, and receives the hail as heaven sends it. "'Villain! Scoundrel! Talk to your equals!' said Don Roderick. "'But thank the habit you bear for saving you from the chastisement which is your due.' So saying, he pointed imperiously to an opposite door. The friar bowed his head, and departed, leaving Don Roderick to measure with hasty and agitated steps the field of battle. When he had closed the door behind him, the father perceived a man stealing softly away through another, and he recognized him as the aged domestic who had been his guide to the presence of Don Roderick. Before the birth of that nobleman, he had been in the service of his father, who was a man of a very different character. At his death, the new master expelled all the domestics, with the exception of this one, whom he retained on account of two valuable qualifications, a high conception of the dignity of the house, and a minute knowledge of the ceremonial required to support that dignity. The poor old man had never dared even to hint disapprobation of the daily proceedings at the castle before the signor, but he would sometimes venture to allow an exclamation of grief and disapproval to escape him before his fellow-servants, who were infinitely diverted by his simple honesty and his warm love of the good old times. His censures did not reach his master's ears unaccompanied by a relation of the raillery bestowed upon them, so that he became an object of general ridicule. On the days of formal entertainment, therefore, the old man was a person of great importance. Father Christopher bowed to him as he passed by him, and pursued his way, but the old man approached him with a mysterious air, and made a sign that he should follow him into a dark passage, where, speaking in an undertone, he said, Father, I have heard all, and I want to speak to you. Speak at once, then, good man. Here, oh no, woe be to us if the master suspect it, but I shall be able to discover much, and I will endeavor to come to-morrow to the convent. Is there any base plot? There is something hatching, certainly. I have long suspected it, but now I shall be on the lookout, and I will come at the truth. These are strange doings. I live in a house where... But I wish to save my soul. God bless you, said the friar, placing his hands on his head as he bent reverently towards him. God reward you. Do not forget, then, to come to-morrow. I will not, replied the domestic. But go now, for the love of heaven, and do not betray me. So saying, he looked cautiously on all sides, and led the way through the passage into a large hall which fronted the courtyard, and pointing to the door, silently bade him farewell. When once in the street, and freed from this den of depravity, the father breathed more freely. He hastened down the hill, pale in countenance, and agitated and distressed by the scene he had witnessed, and in which he had taken so leading a part. But the unlooked-for proffer of the servant came like a cordial. It seemed as if heaven had sent a visible sign of its protection, a clue to guide him in his intricate undertaking, and in the very house where it was least likely to be found. Occupied with these thoughts, he raised his eyes towards the west, and beheld the sun declining behind the mountain, and felt that he had but a few minutes in which to reach the monastery, without violating the absolute law of the Capuchins, that none of the Brotherhood should remain beyond the walls after sunset. Meanwhile, in the cottage of Lucy, there had been plans agitated, of which it is necessary to inform the reader. After the departure of the father, they had continued some time in silence. Lucy, with a heavy heart, prepared the dinner. Renzo, wavering and anxious, knew not how to depart. Agnes was apparently absorbed with her reel. But she was really maturing a thought, which she in a few moments thus declared. Listen, my children, if you will have the necessary courage and dexterity, if you will confide in your mother, I pledge myself to free you from perplexity, sooner than Father Christopher could do, although he is the best man in the world. Lucy looked at her mother with an expression of astonishment rather than confidence in a promise so magnificent. Courage, dexterity, cried Renzo. Say, say, what can I do? Is it not true, said Agnes, that if you were married, your chief difficulty would be removed, and that for the rest we would easily find a remedy? Undoubtedly, said Renzo. If we were married, the world is before us, and at a short distance from this, in Bergamo, a silk weaver is received with open arms. You know how often my cousin Bartolo has solicited me to go there and enter into business with him. How many times he has told me that I should make a fortune as he has done. And if I never listened to his request, it was because my heart was here. Once married, we would all go together, 
and live happily far from the clutches of this villain far from the temptation to do a rash deed is it not so lucy yes said lucy but how as i said resumed agnes courage and dexterity and the thing is easy easy, easy exclaimed they in wonder easy replied agnes if you are prudent hear me patiently and i will endeavour to make you comprehend my project i have heard it said by persons who knew and moreover i have seen one instance of it myself that a curate's consent is not necessary to render a marriage ceremony lawful provided you have his presence how so asked renzo you shall hear there must be two witnesses nimble and cunning you go to the curate the point is to catch him unexpectedly that he may have no time to escape you say signor curate this is my wife lucy says signor curate this is my husband you must speak so distinctly that the curate and the witnesses hear you and the marriage is as inviolable as if the pope himself had celebrated it when the words are once uttered the curate may fret and fume and scold it will be of no use you are man and wife is it possible exclaimed lucy do you think said agnes that the thirty years i was in the world before you i learned nothing the thing is as i tell you the fact was truly such as agnes represented it marriages contracted in this manner were at that time held valid such an expedient was however not recurred to but in cases of great necessity and the priests made use of every precaution to avoid this compulsive cooperation. If it be true, Lucy, said Renzo, regarding her attentively with a supplicating expression. If it be true, exclaimed Agnes, do you think I would say that which is not true? Well, well, get out of the difficulty as you can. I wash my hands from it. Ah, oh, no, do not abandon us, said Renzo. I mean not to suggest a doubt of it. I place myself in your hands i look to you as to a mother the momentary anger of agnes vanished but why mamma why did not father christopher think of this think you that it did not come into his mind replied agnes but he would not speak of it why, why? exclaimed they both at once why because if you must know it the friars do not approve of it if it is not right said lucy we must not do it what said agnes do you think i would advise you to do that which is not right if against the advice of your parents you were going to marry a rogue but on the contrary i am rejoiced at your choice and he who causes the disturbance is the only villain and the curate it is clear as the sun said renzo it is not necessary to speak of it to father christopher continued agnes once over what do you think he will say to you ah daughter it was a great error but it is done the friars must talk thus but believe me in his heart he will be well content lucy made no reply to an argument which did not appear to her very powerful but renzo quite encouraged said if it be thus the thing is done softly said agnes there is need of caution we must procure the witnesses and find means to present ourselves to the curate unexpectedly he has been two days concealed in his house we must make him remain there if he suspects your intention he will be as cunning as a cat and flee as satan from holy water lucy here gained courage to offer her doubts of the propriety of such a course until now we have lived with candour and sincerity said she let us continue to do so let us have faith in god and god will aid us father christopher said so let us listen to his advice be guided by those who know better than you do said agnes gravely what need of advice god tells us help thyself and i will help thee we will tell the father all about it when it is over lucy said renzo will you fail me now have we not done all that we could do like good christians had not the curate himself fixed the day and the hour and whose is the blame if we are now obliged to use a little management no you will not fail me i go at once to seek the witnesses and will return to tell you my success so saying he hastily departed disappointment sharpens the wit and renzo who in the straightforward path he had hitherto travelled had not been required to subtilize much now conceived a plan which would have done honour to a lawyer he went directly to the house of one anthony and found him in his kitchen employed in stirring a polenta of wheat which was on the fire 
whilst his mother, brother, and his wife, with three or four small children, were seated at the table, eagerly intent on the earthen pan, and awaiting the moment when it should be ready for their attack. But on this occasion the pleasure was wanting which the sight of dinner usually produces in the aspect of the laborer who has earned it by his industry. The size of the polenta was proportioned to the scantiness of the times, and not to the number and appetite of the assailants. And in casting a dissatisfied look on the common meal, each seemed to be considering the extent of appetite likely to survive it. Whilst Renzo was exchanging salutations with the family, Tony poured out the pudding on the pewter trencher prepared for its reception, and it appeared like a little moon within a large circumference of vapor. Nevertheless, the wife of Tony said courteously to Renzo, We will be helped at something. This was a compliment that the peasants of Lombardy, however poor, paid to those who were, from any accident, present at their meals. I thank you, replied Renzo. I only came to say a few words to Tony. And Tony, do not disturb your family. We can go and dine at the inn, and we shall then have an opportunity to converse. The proposal was as agreeable as it was unexpected. Tony readily assented to it and departed with Renzo, leaving to his family his portion of the polenta. They arrived at the inn, seated themselves at their ease in a perfect solitude, since the penury of the times had driven away the daily frequenters of the place. After having eaten and emptied a bottle of wine, Renzo, with an air of mystery, said to Tony, If you will do me a small service, I will do you a great one. Speak, speak, command me, said Tony, filling his glass. I will go through fire to serve you. You are twenty-five liveries in debt to the curate for the rent of this field that you worked last year. Ah, Renzo, Renzo, why do you mention it to me now? You've spoiled your kindness and put to flight my good wishes. If I speak to you of your debt, said Renzo, it is because I intend to give you the means of paying it. Do you really? Really. Would this content you? Content me? That it would, indeed. If it were only to be freed from those infernal shakings of the head, the curate makes me every time I meet him. And then always, Tony, remember, Tony, when shall we see each other for this business? When he preaches, he fixes his eyes on me in such a manner, I am almost afraid he will speak to me from the pulpit. I have wished the twenty-five lever to the devil a thousand times, and I was obliged to pawn my wife's gold necklace, which might be turned into so much polenta. But, but if you will do me a small favor, the twenty-five livres are ready. Agreed. But, said Renzo, you must be silent and talk to no one about it. Need you tell me that? Said Tony. You know me. The curate has some foolish reason for putting off my marriage, and I wish to hasten it. I am told that the parties going before him with two witnesses, and the one saying, this is my wife, and the other, this is my husband that the marriage is lawful. Do you understand me? You wish me to go as a witness? Yes. And you will pay the twenty-five livres? Yes. Done. I agree to it. But we must find another witness. I have found him already, said Tony. My simpleton of a brother, Gervais, will do whatever I tell him. But you will pay him with something to drink. And to eat, replied Renzo. But will he be able? I'll teach him. You know I was born with brains for both. Tomorrow. Well. Towards evening. Very well. But be silent. Said Renzo. Pah. Said Tony. But if thy wife should ask thee, as without a doubt she will. I am in debt to my wife for lies already. If it's so much, that I don't know if we shall ever balance the account. I will tell her some idle story or other to set her heart at rest. With this good resolution he departed, leaving Renzo to pursue his way back to the cottage. In the meanwhile Agnes had in vain solicited Lucy's consent to the measure, she could not resolve to act without the approbation of Father Christopher. Renzo arrived, and triumphantly related his success. Lucy shook her head, but the two enthusiasts minded her not. They were now determined to pursue their plan, and by authority and entreaties induce her finally to accede to it. "'It is well,' said Agnes. "'It is well, but you have not thought of everything.' "'What have I not thought of?' replied Renzo. "'Perpetua! You have not thought of Perpetua!' Do you believe that she would suffer Tony and his brother to enter? How, then, is it probable she would admit you and Lucy? What shall we do? said Renzo, pausing. I will tell you. I will go with you. I have a secret to tell her, which will engage her so that she will not see you. I will take her aside, and will touch such a chord you shall see. Ah, oh, bless you! exclaimed Renzo. I have always said you were our best support. But all this will do no good, said Agnes. 
if we cannot persuade Lucy, who obstinately persists that it is sinful. Renzo made use of all his eloquence, but Lucy was not to be moved. I know not what to say to your arguments, replied she. I perceive that to do this we shall degrade ourselves so far as to lie and deceive. Ah, Renzo, let us not so abase ourselves. I would be your wife. And a blush diffused itself over her lovely countenance. I would be your wife, but in the fear of God, at the altar. Let us trust in him who is able to provide. Do you not think he will find a way to help us, far better than all this deception? And why make a mystery of it to Father Christopher? The contest still continued, when a trampling of sandals announced Father Christopher. Agnes had barely time to whisper in the ear of Lucy, Be careful to tell him nothing, when the friar entered. End of chapter 6「Seven of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. Peace be with you, said the friar as he entered. There is nothing more to hope from man. So much the greater must be our confidence in God, and I've already had a pledge of his protection. None of the three entertained much hope from the visit of Father Christopher, for it would have been not only an unusual but an absolutely unheard of fact for a nobleman to desist from his criminal designs at the mere prayer of his defenceless victim. Still, the sad certainty was a painful stroke. The women bent down their heads, but in the mind of Renzo, anger prevailed over disappointment. I would know, cried he, gnashing his teeth and raising his voice as he had never done before in the presence of Father Christopher. I would know what reasons this dog has given, that my wife should not be my wife. Poor Renzo, said the father, with an accent of pity, and with a look which greatly enforced moderation. Poor Renzo, if those who commit injustice were always obliged to give a reason for it, things would not be as they are. He has said then, the dog, that he will not, because he will not? He has not even said so, poor Renzo. There would be something gained if he would make an open confession of his iniquity. But he has said something. What has this firebrand of hell said? I could not repeat his words. He flew into a passion at me for my suspicions, and at the same time confirmed me in them. He insulted me, and then called himself offended, threatened and complained. Ask no farther. He did not utter the name of Lucy, nor even pretend to know you. He affected to intend nothing. In short, I heard enough to feel that he is inexorable. But confidence in God, poor children, be patient, be submissive, and thou, Renzo, believe that I sympathize with all that passes in thy heart. But patience, it is a poor word, a bitter word to those who want faith. But, Renzo, will you not let God work? Will you not trust him? Let him work, Renzo, and, for your consolation, know that I hold in my hand a clue by which I hope to extricate you from your distress. I cannot say more now. Tomorrow I shall not be here. I shall be all day at the convent employed for you. Renzo, if thou canst, come there to me. But if prevented by any accident, Send some trusty messenger, by whom I can make known to you the success of my endeavors. Night approaches. I must return to the convent. Farewell, faith, and courage. So saying, he departed, and hastened by the most abrupt but shortest road to reach the convent in time and escape the usual reprimand, or, what was worse, the imposition of some penance, which might disenable him for the following day from continuing his efforts in favor of his protégés. Did you hear him speak of a clue which he holds to aid us? said Lucy. Or is it best to trust in him? He is a man who does not make rash promises. He ought to have spoken more clearly, said Agnes. Or at least have taken me aside and told me what it was. I'll put an end to the business. I'll put an end to it, said Renzo, pacing furiously up and down the room. Oh, Renzo! exclaimed Lucy. What do you mean? said Agnes. What do I mean? I mean to say that he may have a hundred thousand devils in his soul, but he is flesh and blood notwithstanding. No, no, for the love of heaven, said Lucy, but tears choked her voice. It is not a theme for jesting, said Agnes. For jesting? cried Renzo, stopping before her with his countenance inflamed by anger. For jesting? You will see if I am in jest. 
Oh, Renzo, said Lucy, sobbing, I have never seen you thus before. Hush, hush, said Agnes. Speak not in this manner. Do you not fear the law, which is always to be had against the poor? And besides, how many arms will be raised at a word? I fear nothing, said Renzo. The villain is well protected, dog that he is, but no matter. Patience and resolution, and the time will come. Yes, justice shall be done. I will free the country. People will bless me. Yes, yes. The horror which Lucy felt at this explicit declaration of his purpose inspired her with new resolution. With a tearful countenance but determined voice, she said to Renzo, It can no longer be of any consequence to you that I should become yours. I promised myself to a youth who had the fear of God in his heart, but a man who had once. Were you safe from the law? Were you secure from vengeance? Were you the son of a king? Well, cried Renzo in a voice of uncontrollable passion, Well, I shall not have you then, but neither shall he of that you may for pity's sake do not talk thus do not talk so fiercely said lucy imploringly you to implore me said he somewhat appeased you who will do nothing for me what proof do you give me of your affection have i not supplicated in vain have i been able to obtain yes yes replied lucy hastily i will go to the curate's house to-morrow now if you wish it only be yourself again i will go do you promise me said renzo softening immediately i promise well i am satisfied god be praised said agnes much relieved i have promised you said lucy with an accent of timid reproach but you have also promised me to refer it to father christopher ah will you now draw back said renzo no no said lucy again alarmed no no i have promised and will perform but you have compelled me to it by your own impetuosity god forbid that why will you prognosticate evil lucy god knows we wrong no person well well said lucy i will hope for the best renzo would have wished to prolong the conversation in order to allot to each their several parts for the morrow but the night drew on and he reluctantly felt himself compelled to depart the night was passed by all three in that state of agitation and trouble which always precedes an important enterprise whose issue is uncertain Renzo returned early in the morning, and Agnes and he busied themselves in concerting the operations of the evening. Lucy was a mere spectator, but although she disapproved these measures in her heart, she still promised to do the best she could. "'Will you go to the convent to speak to Father Christopher, as he desired you last night?' said Agnes to Renzo. "'Oh, no,' replied he. "'The father would soon read in my countenance that there was something on foot, and if he interrogated me, I should be obliged to tell him. You had better send someone. I will send Manico. Yes, that will do, replied Renzo, as he hurried off to make farther arrangements. Agnes went to a neighboring house to obtain Manico, a small lad of twelve years of age, who, by the way of cousins and sisters-in-law, was a sort of nephew to the dame. She asked and obtained permission of his parents to keep him all day. For a particular service. She took him home, and, after giving him breakfast, told him he must go to Pescarenico and show himself to Father Christopher, who would send him back with a message father christopher you understand that nice old man with the white beard him they call the saint i know him i know him said manico he speaks so kindly to the children and often gives them pictures yes that is he and if manico if he tells you to wait near the convent until he has an answer ready don't stray away don't go to the lake to throw stones in the water with the boys nor to see them fish nor Pooh, aunt, I'm no longer a baby. Well, behave well, and when you return with the answer, I will give you these new parpagliole. During the remainder of this long morning, several strange things occurred, calculated to infuse suspicion into the already troubled minds of Lucy and her mother. A mendicant, but not in rags like others of his kind, and with a dark and sinister countenance, narrowly observing every object around him, entered to ask alms. A piece of bread was presented to him, which he received with ill-dissembled indifference. Then, with a mixture of impudence and hesitation, he made many inquiries, to which Agnes endeavoured to return evasive replies. When about to depart, he pretended to mistake the door, and went through the one that led to the stairs. They called to him, Stay! Stay! Where are you going, good man? This way! He returned, excusing himself with an affectation of humility, to which he felt it difficult to compose his hard and stern features. After him they saw pass from time to time other strange people, one entered the house under pretense of asking the road, 
Another stopped before the gate and glanced furtively into the room, as if to avoid suspicion. Agnes went off into the door of the house during the remainder of the day, with an undefined dread of seeing someone approach who might cause them alarm. These mysterious visitations, however, ceased towards noon, but they had left an impression of impending evils on their minds, which they felt it impossible altogether to suppress. To explain to the reader the true character of these suspicious wanderers, we must recur to Don Roderick, whom we left alone in the hall of his palace at the departure of Father Christopher. The more he reflected on his interview with the friar, the more was he enraged and ashamed that he should have dared to come to him with the rebuke of Nathan to David on his lips. He paced with hurried steps through the apartment, and as he gazed at the portraits of his ancestors, warriors, senators, and abbots, which hung against its walls, he felt his indignation at the insult which had been offered him increase. A base-born friar to speak thus to one of noble birth. He formed plans of vengeance and discarded them, without his being willing to acknowledge it to himself. The prediction of the father again sounded in his ears, and caused an unaccustomed perplexity. Restless and undetermined, he rang the bell and ordered a servant to excuse him to the company, and to say to them that urgent business prevented his seeing them again. The servant returned with the intelligence that the guests had departed. "'And the Count Atelier?' asked Don Roderick. "'He has gone with the gentleman, my lord.' "'Well, six followers to accompany me. Quickly. My sword, cloak, and hat. Be quick.' The servant left the room, and returned in a few moments with a rich sword, which his master girded on. He then threw the cloak around his shoulders, and donned his hat with its waving plumes with an air of proud defiance. He then passed into the street, followed by six armed ruffians, taking the road to Leco. The peasantry and tradesmen shrunk from his approach. Their profound and timid salutations received no notice from him. Indeed, he acknowledged but by a slight inclination of the head those of the neighboring gentry, whose rank, however, was incontestably inferior to his own. Indeed, the only man whose salutations he condescended to return upon an equal footing was the Spanish governor. In order to get rid of his ennui, and banish the idea of the monk and his imprecations, he entered the house of a gentleman where a party was met together, and was received with that apparent cordiality which it is a necessary policy to manifest towards the powerful who are held in fear. On his return at night to his palace, he found Count Attilio seated at supper. Don Roderick, full of thought, took a chair, but said little. Scarcely was the table cleared and the servants departed, when the Count, beginning to rally his dull companion, said, Cousin, when will you pay me my wage, John? Sir Martin's day has not yet passed. Well, you will have to pay it, for all the saints in the calendar may pass before you— We will see about that, said Don Roderick. Cousin, you would play the politician, but you cannot deceive me. I am so certain that I have won the wage, John, that I stand ready for another. Why? Why? Because the father— the father in short this friar has converted you one of your fine imaginations truly converted cousin converted i tell you i rejoice at it it will be a fine spectacle to see you penitent with your eyes cast down and how flattering to the father he don't catch such fish every day be assured he will bring you forward as an example to others your actions will be trumpeted from the pulpit enough enough interrupted don roderick half annoyed and half disposed to laugh i will double the wager with you if you please the devil perhaps you have converted the father do not speak of him but as to the wager sir martin will decide the curiosity of the count was aroused he made many inquiries which don roderick evaded referring him to the day of decision the following morning when he awoke don roderick was himself again the various emotions that had agitated him after his interview with the father had now resolved themselves into the simple desire of revenge. Hardly risen, he sent for Grizo. Something serious, muttered the servant to whom the order was given. As this Grizo was nothing less than the leader of the bravos to whom was entrusted the most dangerous and daring enterprises, who was the most trusted by the master and the most devoted to him, from gratitude and interest, this man had been guilty of murder. He had fled from the pursuit of justice to the palace of Don Roderick, who took him under his protection, and thus sheltered him from the pursuit of the law. He, therefore, stood pledged to the performance of any deed of villainy that should be imposed on him. Griso, said Don Roderick, you must show your skill in this emergency. Before tomorrow, this Lucy must be in this palace. It shall never be said that Griso failed to execute a command from his illustrious protector. Take as many men as are necessary, and dispose of them as appears to you best only let the thing succeed but be careful that no harm be done to her signor a little fright we cannot do less fright 
may be unavoidable but touch not a hair of her head and above all treat her with the greatest respect do you hear senor i could not take a flower from the bush and carry it to your highness without touching it but i will only do what is absolutely necessary well i trust thee and how wilt thou do it i was thinking senor it is fortunate that her cottage is at the extremity of the village we have need of some place of concealment and not far from her house there is that old uninhabited building in the middle of the fields that one but your highness knows nothing of these matters which was burnt a few years ago and not having been repaired is now deserted except by the witches who keep all cowardly rascals away from it so that we may take safe possession well what then here grisel went on to propose and don roderick to approve until they had agreed upon the manner of conducting the enterprise to the desired conclusion without leaving a trace of the authors of it and also upon the manner of imposing silence not only upon poor agnes but also upon the more impatient and fiery renzo if this rash fellow fall in your way by chance added don roderick you had best give him on his shoulders something he will remember so that he will more likely to obey the order to remain quiet which he will receive to-morrow do you hear yes yes leave it to me said griso as with an air of importance he took his leave the morning was spent in reconnoitring the mendicant of whom we have spoken was griso the others were the villains whom he employed to gain a more perfect knowledge of the scene of action they returned to the palace to arrange and mature the enterprise all these mysterious movements were not effected without rousing the suspicions of the old domestic who partly by listening and partly by conjecture came to the knowledge of the concerted attempt of the evening this knowledge came a little too late for already a body of ruffians were laying in wait in the old house however the poor old man although well aware of the dangerous game he played did not fail to perform his promise he left the palace on some slight pretense and hurried to the convent griso and his band left shortly after and met at the old building the former had previously left orders at the palace that at the approach of night there should be a litter brought thither he then dispatched three of the bravos to the village inn one to remain at its entrance to observe the movements on the road and to give notice when the inhabitants should have retired to rest the other two to occupy themselves within as idlers gaming and drinking griso with the rest of the troop continued an ambush on the watch all this was going forward and the sun was about to set when renzo entered the cottage and said to lucy and her mother tony and gervas are ready i am going with them to sup at the inn at the sound of the ave maria we will come for you take courage lucy all depends on a moment oh yes said lucy courage with a voice that contradicted her words when renzo and his companions arrived at the inn they found the door blockaded by a sentinel who leaning on one side of it with his arms folded on his breast occupied half its width at the same time rolling his eagle eyes first to the right and then to the left displaying alternately their blacks and their whites a flat cap of crimson velvet placed sideways covered the half of the long lock which parted on a dark forehead was fastened behind with a comb he held in his hand a club his arms properly speaking were concealed beneath his garments when renzo evinced a desire to enter he looked at him fixedly without moving of this the young man wishing to decline all conversation took no notice but beckoning to his companions to follow his example slid between the figure and the doorpost having gained an entrance he beheld the other two bravos with a large mug between them seated at play they stared at him with a look of inquiry making signs to each other and then to their comrade at the door this was not unobserved by renzo and his mind was filled with a vague sentiment of suspicion and alarm the innkeeper came for his orders which were a private room and supper for three who are those strangers asked he of the landlord when he came in to set the table i do not know them replied he how neither of them the first rule of our trade said he spreading the cloth is not to meddle with the affairs of others and what is wonderful even our women are not curious it is enough for us that customers pay well who they are or who they are not matters nothing and now i will bring you a dish of pulpit the like of which you have never eaten when he returned to the kitchen and was employed in taking the pulpette from the fire one of the bravos approached and said in an undertone who are those men good people of this village replied the host pouring the mincemeat into a dish well but what are their names who are they insisted he in a rough voice one is called renzo replied the host esteemed a good youth and an excellent weaver of silk the other is a peasant whose name is tony 
a jovial fellow. It is a pity he has no more money, for he would spend it all here. The other is a simpleton, who eats when they feed him, by your leave. So saying, he slipped past him with the dish in his hand, and carried it to the place of its destination. How do you know? said Renzo, continuing the conversation from the point at which it had been dropped. How do you know they are honest men, when you are not acquainted with them? From their actions, my good fellow. Men are known by their actions. He who drinks wine without criticising it, he who shows the face of the king on the counter without prattling, he who does not quarrel with other customers, and, if he has a blow or two to give, goes away from the inn, so that the poor host need not suffer from it. He is an honest man. But what the devil makes you so inquisitive when you are engaged to be married and should have other things in your head, and with this mincemeat before you, which would make the dead revive? So saying, he returned to the kitchen. The supper was not very agreeable. The two guests would have lingered over the unusual luxury, but Renzo, preoccupied, and troubled and uneasy at the singular appearance of the strangers, longed for the hour of departure. He conversed in brief sentences, and in an undertone, so that he might not be overheard by them. What an odd thing it is, blundered Gervaise, that Renzo wishes to be married, and has needed... Renzo looked sternly at him. Keep silence, you beast, said Tony to him, accompanying the epithet with a cuff. Gervaise obeyed, and the remainder of the repast was consumed in silence. Renzo observed a strict sobriety in order to keep his companions under some restraint. Supper being over, he paid the reckoning and prepared to depart. They were obliged to pass the three men again and encounter a repetition of their eager gaze. When a few steps distant from the inn, Renzo, looking back, perceived that he was followed by the two whom he had left seated in the kitchen. He stopped, observing this. They stopped also and retraced their steps. If he had been near enough, he would have heard a few words of strange import. It would be a glorious thing said one of the scoundrels. Without a reckoning the cash, if we could tell at the palace how we had flattened their ribs, without the direction, too, of Signor Griso. And spoiled the whole work? added the other. But see, he stops to look at us. Oh, if it were only later. But let us turn back, not to create suspicion. People are coming on all sides. Let us wait till they go to their rests. Then was heard in the village the busy hum of the evening, which precedes the solemn stillness of the night. Then were seen women returning from their daily labor, with their infants on their backs, and leading by the hand the older children, to whom they were repeating the evening prayers, men with their spades and other instruments of culture thrown over their shoulders. At the opening of the cottage doors was discerned the bright light of the fires, kindled in order to prepare their meager suppers. In the street there were salutations given and returned, brief and mournful observations on the poverty of the harvest and the scarcity of the year and at intervals was heard the measured strokes of the bell which announced the departure of the day. When Renzo saw that the two men no longer followed him, he continued his way, giving instructions in a low voice from time to time to his two companions. It was dark night when they arrived at the cottage of Lucy. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion, all the interim is like a phantasma, or a hideous dream. Lucy endured many hours the anguish of such a dream, and Agnes, even Agnes, the author of the plot, was thoughtful and silent. But, in the moment of action, new and various emotions pass swiftly through the mind. At one instant, that which had appeared difficult becomes perfectly easy. At another, obstacles present themselves which were never before thought of. The imagination is filled with alarm, the limbs refuse their office, and the heart fails at the promise it had given with such security. At the gentle knock of Renzo, Lucy was seized with such terror that, at the moment, she resolved to suffer anything to endure a separation from him forever, rather than to execute her resolution. But when, with an assured and encouraging air, he said, All is ready. Let us be gone. She had neither heart nor time to suggest difficulties. Agnes and Renzo placed her between them, and the adventurous company set forward. Slowly and quietly they took the path that led around the village. It would have been nearer to pass directly through it, to Don Abondio's house, but their object was to avoid observation. Upon reaching the house, the lovers remained concealed on one side of it, Agnes a little in advance so as to be prepared to speak to Perpetua as soon as she should make her appearance. Tony, with Gervaise, who did nothing, but without whom nothing could be done, courageously knocked at the door. "'Who is there at this hour?' cried a voice from the window, which they recognized to be that of Perpetua. "'No one is sick that I know of. What is the matter?' "'It is I,' replied Tony, "'with my brother. We want to speak with the curate.' "'Is this an hour for Christians?' replied Perpetua, briskly. "'Come to-morrow.' 
hear me i will come or not as i choose i have received i can tell how much money and i have come to balance a small account that you know of i have here twenty-five fine new pieces but if you cannot see me well i know how and where to spend them wait wait i will speak to you in a moment but why come at this hour if you can change the hour i am willing as for me i am here and if you don't want me to stay i'll go away no no wait a moment i will give you an answer so saying she closed the window as soon as she disappeared agnes separated herself from the lovers saying to lucy in a low voice courage it is but a moment she then entered into conversation with tony at the door that perpetua on opening it might suppose she had been accidentally passing by and that tony had detained her End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. Translated by George William Fenshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. Carneades, who was he? said Don Abonio to himself, seated in his large chair with a book open before him. Carneades, this name I have either heard or read of. He must have been a man of study, a scholar of antiquity, but who the devil was he? Now, it should be known that it was Don Abonio's custom to read a little every day and that a curate, his neighbor, who had a small library, furnished him with books, one after the other, as they came to hand. That with which he was at this moment engaged was a panegyric on St. Carlos, delivered many years before in the Cathedral of Milan. The saint was there compared for his love of study to Archimedes, which comparison the poor curate well understood, inasmuch as this did not require, from the various anecdotes related of him, an erudition very extensive. But the author went on to liken him also to Carneades, and here the poor reader was at fault. At this moment, Perpetua announced the visit of Tony. At such an hour? said Don Abondio. What do you expect? They have no discretion. But if you do not shoot the bird flying... Who knows if I shall ever be able to do it? Continued he. Let him come in. But are you very sure that it is Tony? The devil! said Perpetua, as she descended and, opening the door, demanded... Where are you? Tony appeared, in company with Agnes who accosted Perpetua by name. Good evening, Agnes, said she. Whence come you at this hour? I come from... Naming a neighboring village. And do you know... She continued. That I have been delayed on your account. On my account? Exclaimed she, and turning to the two brothers, said, Go in, and I will follow you. Because... Resumed Agnes. A gossiping woman of the company said, Would you believe it? Obstinately persisted in saying that you were never engaged to Beppo Suolavecchia, nor to Anselma Lunghigna, because they would not have you. I maintain that you had refused them both. Certainly I did. Oh, what a liar! Oh, what a great liar! Who was it? Don't ask me. I don't wish to make mischief. You must tell me. You must tell me. Oh, what a lie! So it was. But you can't believe how sorry I felt not to know all the story, that I might have confuted her it is an infamous lie said perpetua as to beppo every one knows in front of don abondio's house there was a short and narrow lane between two old cottages which opened at the farther end into the fields agnes drew perpetua thither as if for the purpose of talking with her more freely when they were at a spot from which they could not see what passed before the curate's house agnes coughed loudly <coughs> this was the concerted signal which being heard by renzo he with lucy on his arm crept quietly along the wall, approached the door, opened it softly, and entered the passage, where the two brothers were waiting their approach. They all ascended the stairs on tiptoe. The brothers advanced towards the door of the chamber. The lovers remained concealed on the landing. Deo gratias, said Tony, in a clear voice. Tony, eh? Come in, replied the voice from within. Tony obeyed, opening the door just enough to admit himself and brother, one at a time. The rays of light, which shone unexpectedly through this opening on the darkness, by which Renzo and Lucy were protected, made the latter tremble as if already discovered. The brothers entered, and Tony closed the door. The lovers remained motionless without. The beating of poor Lucy's heart might be heard in the stillness. Don Abondio was, as we have said, seated in his armchair, wrapped in a morning gown, with an old cap on his head, in the fashion of a tiara, which formed a sort of cornice around his face, and shaded it from the dim light of a little lamp. Two thick curls which escaped from beneath the cap, two thick eyebrows, two thick mustachios, a dense tuft along his chin, all quite grey, and studding his sunburnt and wrinkled visage, might be compared to snowy bushes projecting from a rock by moonlight. Ah, ah, 
was his salutation, as he took off his spectacles and placed them on his book. "'Does the curate think I have come at too late an hour?' said Tony, bowing. Gervase awkwardly followed his example. "'Certainly it is late. Late on all accounts. Do you know that I am ill?' "'Oh, I am sorry.' "'Did you not hear that I was sick and could not be seen? "'But why is this boy with you?' "'For company, Signor Curate.' "'Well, let us see. "'Here are twenty-five new pieces, "'with the image of St. Ambrose on horseback,' "'said Tony, drawing a little bundle from his pocket. "'Give here,' said Donabondio, "'and taking the bundle, he opened it, counted the money, "'and found it correct. "'Now, sir, you will give me the necklace of my tila. "'Certainly,' replied Donabondio, "'and going to an old press, he drew forth the pledge and carefully returned it. Now, said Tony, you will please to put it in black and white. Eh? said Donabondio. How suspicious the world has become. Do you not trust me? How, sir, if I trust you, you do me wrong. But since my name is on your book on the side of debtor... Well, well, interrupted Donabondio, and seating himself at the table he began to write, repeating with a loud voice the words as they came from his pen. In the meanwhile, Tony, and at a sign from him, Gervase, placed themselves before the table, in such a manner as to deprive the writer of a view of the door, and, as if from heedlessness, moved their feet about on the floor as a signal to those without, and also for the purpose of drowning the noise of their footsteps. Of this Don Abondio, occupied in writing, took no notice. At the grating sounds of the feet, Renzo drew Lucy trembling into the room, and stood with her behind the brothers. Don Abondio, having finished writing, read it over attentively, folded the paper, and reaching it to Tony, said, Will you be satisfied now? Tony, on receiving it, retired on one side, Gervase on the other, and behold in the midst Renzo and Lucy. Donabondio, affrighted, astonished, and enraged, took an immediate resolution, and while Renzo was uttering the words, Sir Curate, in the presence of these witnesses, this is my wife. And the poor Lucy had begun, And this is? He had snatched from the table the cloth which covered it, throwing on the ground books, pen, ink, and paper, and in haste letting fall the light. He threw it over and held it wrapped around the face of Lucy, at the same time roaring out, Perpetua! Perpetua! Treachery! Help! The wick, dying in the socket, sent a feeble and flickering light over the figure of Lucy, who, entirely overcome, stood like a statue, making no effort to free herself. The light died away and left them in darkness. Don Abondio quitted the poor girl, and felt cautiously along the wall for a door that led to an inner chamber. Having found it, he entered and locked himself in, crying out, Perpetua! Treachery! Help! Out of the house! Out of the house! All was confusion in the apartment he had quitted. Renzo, groping in the dark to find the curate, had followed the sound of his voice and was knocking at the door of the room, crying, Open! Open! Don't make such an outcry! Lucy, calling to Renzo in a supplicating voice, Let us go! Let us go, for the love of God! Tony, creeping on all fours and feeling along the floor for his receipt, which had been dropped in the tumult, the poor Gervase, crying and jumping and endeavouring to find the door on the stairs so as to escape with whole bones. In the midst of this turmoil we cannot stop to make reflections, but Renzo, causing disturbance at night in another person's house, and holding the master of it besieged in an inner room, has all the appearance of an oppressor, when in fact he was the oppressed. Don Abondio, assaulted in his own house, while he was tranquilly attending to his affairs, appeared the victim, when in fact it was he who had inflicted the injury. Thus goes the world, or rather, Thus it went in the seventeenth century. The besieged, seeing that the enemy gave no signs of retreat, opened a window which looked out upon the churchyard, and cried, Help! Help! The moon shone brightly. Every object could be clearly discerned, as in the day. But a deep repose rested all over. There was no indication of a living soul. Contiguous to the church, and on that side of it which fronted the parsonage, was a small habitation in which slept the sexton. Aroused by this strange outcry, he jumped from his bed, opened the small window, with his eyelids glued together all the time, and cried, What is the matter? Run, Ambrose, run, help, people in the house, cried Don Abondio. I come in a moment, replied he, drawing in his head. He closed his curtain, and half stupid and half affrighted, thought of an expedient to bring more help than had been required of him, without risking his own life in the contest, whatever it might be. He hastily took his breeches from the bed, and putting them under his arm, like an opera hat, ran to the belfry, and pulled away lustily. Don, don, don. The peasant aroused, sat up in his bed. The boy, sleeping in the hayloft, listened eagerly and sprang on his feet. What is the matter? What is it? Fire! Robbers! Each woman entreated her husband not to stir, but to leave it to others. Such as were cowards obeyed, whilst the inquisitive and courageous took their arms and ran towards the noise. 
Long before this, however, the alarm had been given to other personages of our story, the Bravos in one place, and Agnes and Perpetua in another. It is necessary to relate briefly how the former had been occupied since we last took leave of them, those at the old house and those at the inn. The latter, when they ascertained that the inhabitants of the village had retired to rest, and that the road was clear, went to the cottage of Lucy, and found that a perfect stillness reigned within. They then returned to the old house to give their report to Signor Grizzo. He immediately put on a slouched hat with a pilgrim's habit and staff, saying, Let us act as becometh soldiers, cautious, quiet, and attentive to orders. Then leading the way, he with his company arrived at the cottage, by a route different from that taken by our poor cottagers. Grizzo kept the band a few steps off, went forward alone to explore, and seeing all deserted and quiet on the outside, he beckoned to two of them, ordered them to mount very carefully and quietly the wall which enclosed the courtyard, and to conceal themselves on the other side behind a thick fig tree, which he had observed in the morning. That being done, he knocked gently at the door, with the intention to call himself a pilgrim, who had wandered from his way, and request shelter until the morning. No answer. He knocked again, louder. Not a sound. He then called a third robber, made him also descend into the yard, and with orders to unfasten the bolt on the inside, so that they might have free entrance. All was performed with the utmost caution, and the most complete success. Grizo then called the rest, and made some of them conceal themselves by the side of those behind the fig tree. He then opened the door very softly, placed two sentinels on the inside of it, and advanced to the lower chamber. He knocked. He waited. And well might wait. He raised the latch. No one from within said, Who is there? Nothing could go on better. He then called the robbers from the fig tree, and with them entered the room where he had in the morning so villainously received the loaf of bread. He drew out his flint, tinder-box, and batches, and striking a light, proceeded to the inner chamber. It was empty. He returned to the stairs and listened. Solitude and silence. He left, too, to keep watch below. And with the others, carefully ascended the stairs, cursing in his heart the creaking of the steps. He reached the summit, pushed softly open the door of the front room, and listened if anyone breathed or moved. No one. He advanced, shading his face with the lamp, and perceived a bed. It was made and perfectly smooth, with the covering arranged in order on the bolster. He shrugged his shoulders, and returning to the company, made a sign to them that he was going into the other room, and that they should remain quietly behind. He did so, and had the same success. All deserted and quiet. "'What the devil's this?' said he aloud. "'Some traitorous dog has played the spy.' They then searched with less ceremony the rest of the house, putting everything out of its place, Meanwhile, those at the doorway heard a light step approaching in the street. They kept very quiet, thinking it would pass on. But behold, it stopped exactly in front of the cottage. It was Menico, who had come in haste from the convent to warn Agnes and her daughter to escape from the house, and take refuge there, because... the because is already known. He was surprised to find the door unbolted, and entering with a vague sentiment of alarm, found himself seized by two ruffians, who said in a menacing tone, Hush! Be quiet, or you die! He uttered a cry, at which one struck him a blow on the mouth. The other placed his hand on his sword to inspire him with fear. The boy trembled like a leaf and did not attempt to stir, but all at once was heard the sound of the bell, and immediately after a thundering peal burst forth. The wicked are always cowards, says a Milanese proverb. Alarmed at the sound, the bravos let go in haste the arms of Menico, and fled away hastily to the old house to join the main body of their comrades. Menico, finding himself free, also fled, by way of the fields towards the belfry naturally supposing he would find someone there. As to the other villains above stairs, the terrible sound made the same impression on them. Amazed and perplexed, they hit one against the other, in striving to find the nearest way to the door. Nevertheless, they were brave and accustomed to confront any known danger. But here was something unusual, an undetermined peril, and they became panic-struck. It now required all the superiority of Grizo to keep him together, so that there should be a retreat and not a flight. He succeeded, however, in assembling them in the middle of the courtyard. Halt! halt cried he pistols in hand knives ready all in order and then we will march cowards for shame fall behind me and keep together reduced to order they followed him in silence we will leave them in order to give an account of agnes and perpetua whom we left at the end of the little lane engaged in conversation agnes had managed to draw the latter off to some distance by dint of appearing to give great heed to her story which she urged on by an occasional, Certainly, now I comprehend, that is plain. And then? And he? And you? In the midst of an important part of her narrative, the deep silence of the night was broken by the cry of Don Abondio for, Help! Mercy, what is the matter? cried Perpetua, and prepared to run. What is the matter? What is the matter? cried Agnes, holding her by the gown. 
mercy did you not hear replied she struggling to get free what is the matter what is the matter repeated agnes holding her firmly by the arm devil of a woman exclaimed perpetua still struggling then was heard at a distance the light scream of Minico. mercy cried agnes also and they both ran at full speed the sound of the bell which now succeeded spurred them on perpetua arrived first and behold at the door tony gervaz renzo and lucy who had found the stairs and at the terrible sound of the bell were flying to some place of safety what is the matter what is the matter demanded perpetua out of breath of the brothers they answered her with a violent push and fled away and you what are you here for said she then to renzo and lucy they made no reply she then ascended the stairs in haste to seek her master the two lovers still lovers stood before agnes who alarmed and grieved said ah you are here how has it gone why did the bell ring home home said renzo before the people gather but now Menico appeared running to meet them he was out of breath and hardly able to cry out back back by the way of the convent there is the devil at the house continued he panting i saw him i did he was going to kill me the father christopher says you must come quickly i saw him i did i'm glad i found you all here i will tell you all when we are safe off renzo who was the most self-possessed of the party thought it best to follow his advice let us follow him said he to the females they silently obeyed and the little company moved on they hastily crossed the churchyard passing through a private street into the fields they were not many paces distant before the people began to collect each one asking of his neighbor what was the matter and no one being able to answer the question the first that arrived ran to the door of the church it was fastened they then looked through a little window into the belfry and demanded the cause of the alarm when ambrose heard a known voice and knew by the hum that there was an assemblage of people without he hastily slipped on that part of his dress which he had carried under his arm and opened the church door what is all this tumult what is the matter where is it where is it do you not know why in the curate's house run run they rushed in a crowd thither looked listened all was quiet the street door was fastened not a window open not a sound within who is within there hola hola Signor Curate! Signor Curate! Don Abondio, who, as soon as he was relieved by the flight of the invaders, had retired from the window and closed it, was now quarreling with Perpetua for leaving him to bear the brunt of the battle alone. When he heard himself called by name by the people outside, he repented of the rashness which had produced this undesired result. What has happened? Who are they? Where are they? What have they done to you? cried a hundred voices at a time. There is no one here now i am much obliged to you return to your houses but who has been here where have they gone what, what has, has happened? happened bad people bad people who wander about in the night but they have all fled return to your houses i thank you for your kindness so saying he retired and shut the window there was a general murmur of disappointment through the crowd some laughed some swore some shrugged up their shoulders and went home but at this moment a person came running towards them, panting and breathless. He lived at the house opposite to the cottage of Lucy, and had witnessed from the window the alarm of the bravos when Grizo endeavoured to collect them in the courtyard. When he recovered breath, he cried, What do you do here, friends? The devil is not here. He is down at the house of Agnes Mondella. Armed people are in it. It seems they wish to murder a pilgrim, but who knows what the devil it is. What? 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 and then began a tumultuous conversation let us go how many are there how many are how we how many are we who are, who are they? they the constable the constable i am here replied the constable from the midst of the crowd i am here but you must assist me you must obey quick where is the sexton to the bell to the bell quick someone run to lecco to ask for succour come this way the tumult was great and as they were about to depart for the cottage of Agnes, another messenger came flying and exclaimed, Run, friends! Robbers who are carrying off a pilgrim! They are already out of the village! On! On! This way! In obedience to this command, they moved in a mass, without waiting the orders of their leader, towards the cottage of Lucy. While the army advances, many of those at the head of the column slacken their pace, not unwilling to leave the post of honor to their more adventurous friends in the rear. The confused multitude at length reached the scene of action. The traces of recent invasion were manifest. The door opened, the bolts loosened. But the invaders, where were they? 
they entered the court advanced into the house and called loudly agnes lucy pilgrim where is the pilgrim is a dream that is no him? no carl andreas saw him also hello pilgrim agnes, agnes. Lucy. lucy no reply they, they have killed, killed them. them there was then a proposition to follow the murderers which would have been acceded to had not a voice from the crowd cried out that agnes and lucy were in safety in some house satisfied with this they soon dispersed to their homes to relate to their wives that which had happened the next day however the constable being in his field and with his foot resting on his spade meditating on the mysteries of the past night was accosted by two men much resembling in their appearance those whom don abondio had encountered a few days before they very unceremoniously forbade him to make a deposition of the events of the night before the magistrate and if questioned by any of the gossips of the villagers to maintain a perfect silence on pain of death our fugitives for a while continued their flight rapidly and silently utterly overwhelmed by the fatigue of their flight by their late anxiety by vexation and disappointment at their failure and a confused apprehension of some future danger as the sound of the bell died away on the ear they slackened their pace agnes gathering breath and courage first broke the silence by asking renzo what had been done at the curate's he related briefly his melancholy story and who said she to manico was the devil in the house what did you mean by that the boy narrated that of which he had been an eye-witness and which imparted a mingled feeling of alarm and gratitude to the minds of his auditors alarm at the obstinacy of don roderick in pursuing his purpose and gratitude that they had thus escaped his snares they caressed affectionately the boy who had been placed in so great danger on their account renzo gave him a piece of money in addition to the new coin already promised and desired him to say nothing of the message given him by father christopher now return home said agnes because thy family will be anxious about thee you have been a good boy go home and pray the lord that we may soon meet again the boy obeyed and our travellers advanced in silence lucy kept close to her mother dexterously but gently declining the arm of her lover she felt abashed even in the midst of all this confusion at having been so long and so familiarly alone with him while expecting that a few moments longer would have seen her his wife but this dream had vanished and she felt most sensitively the apparent indelicacy of their situation they at length reached the open space before the church of the convent renzo advanced towards the door and pushed it gently it opened and they beheld by the light of the moon which then fell upon his pallid face and silvery beard the form of father christopher who was there in anxious expectation of their arrival god to be thanked said he as they entered by his side stood a capuchin whose office was that of sexton to the church whom he had persuaded to leave the door half open and to watch with him he had been very unwilling to submit to this inconvenient and dangerous condescension which it required all the authority of the holy father to overcome but perceiving who the company were he could endure no longer taking the father aside he whispered to him but father father at night in the church with the woman shut the rules but father omnia munda mundis replied he turning meekly to friar fazio and forgetting that he did not understand latin but this forgetfulness was exactly the most fortunate thing in the world if the father had produced arguments friar fazio would not have failed to oppose them but these mysterious words he concluded must contain a solution of all his doubts he acquiesced saying very well you know more than i do father christopher then turned to our little company who were standing in suspense by the light of a lamp which was flickering before the altar children said he thank the lord who has preserved you from great peril perhaps at this moment and he entered into an explanation of the reasons which had induced him to send for them to the convent little suspecting that they knew more than he did and supposing that Menico had found them tranquil at their home before the arrival of the robbers no one undeceived him not even lucy although suffering the keenest anguish at practising dissimulation with such a man but it was a night of confusion and duplicity now continued he you perceive my children that this country is no longer safe for you it is your country i know you were born here you have wronged no one but such is the will of god it is a trial children support it with patience with faith without murmuring and be assured there will come a day in which you will see the wisdom of all that now befalls you i have procured you a refuge for a season and i hope you will soon be able to return safely to your home at all events god will provide and i his minister will faithfully exert myself to serve you my poor persecuted children you continued he turning to the females can remain at blank there you will be beyond danger and yet not far from home go to our convent in that place ask for the superior give him this letter 
he will be to you another friar christopher and thou my renzo thou must place thyself in safety from the impetuosity of others and your own carry this letter to father bonaventura of lodi in our convent at the eastern gate of milan he will be to you a father will advise you and find you work until you can return to live here tranquilly now go to the border of the lake near the mouth of the bione a stream a short distance from the convent you will see there a small boat fastened you must say a boat you will be asked for whom answer st francis the boatman will receive you will take you to the other side where you will find a carriage which will conduct you to blank if anyone should ask how father christopher came to have at his disposal such means of transport by land and by water he would show little knowledge of the power possessed by a capuchin who held the reputation of a saint the charge of the houses remained to be thought of the father received the keys of them agnes on consigning hers thought with a sigh that there was no need of keys the house was open the devil had been there and it was doubtful if there remained anything to be cared for before you go said the father let us pray together to the lord that he may be with you in this journey and always and above all that he may give you strength to submit cheerfully to that which he has ordained so saying he knelt down all did the same having prayed a few moments in silence he pronounced with a low but distinct voice the following words we pray thee also for the wretched man who has brought us to this state we should be unworthy of thy mercy if we did not earnestly solicit it for him he has most need of it we in our sorrow have the consolation of trusting in thee we can still offer thee our supplications with thankfulness but he he is an enemy to thee o oh, wretched man he dares to strive against thee have pity on him o oh lord touch his heart soften his rebellious will and bestow on him all the good we would desire for ourselves rising hastily he then said away my children there is no time to lose god will go with you his angel protect you away they kept silence from emotion and as they departed the father added my heart tells me we shall soon meet again without waiting for a reply he retired the travellers pursued their way to the appointed spot found the boat gave and received the watchword and entered into it the boatman made silently for the opposite shore there was not a breath of wind the lake lay polished and smooth in the moonlight agitated only by the dipping of the oars which quivered in its gleam the waves breaking on the sands of the shore were heard deadly and slowly at a distance mingled with the rippling of the waters between the pillars of the bridge the silent passengers cast a melancholy look behind at the mountains and the landscape illumined by the moon and varied by multitudes of shadows they discerned villages houses cottages the palace of don roderick raised above the huts that crowded the base of the promontory like a savage prowling in the dark over his slumbering prey lucy beheld it and shuddered then cast a glance beyond the declivity towards her own little home and beheld the top of the fig tree which towered in the courtyard moved at the sight she buried her face in her hands and wept in silence farewell ye mountains source of waters farewell to your varied summits familiar as the faces of friends ye torrents whose voices have been heard from infancy farewell how melancholy the destiny of one who bred up amid your scenes bids you farewell if voluntarily departing with the hope of future gain at this moment the dream of wealth loses its attraction his resolution falters and he would fain remain with you were it not for the hope of benefiting you by his prosperity the more he advances into the level country the more his view becomes wearied with its uniform extent the air appears heavy and lifeless he proceeds sorrowfully and thoughtfully into the tumultuous city houses crowded against houses street uniting with street appears to deprive him of the power to breathe and in front of edifices admired by strangers he stops to recall with restless desire the image of the field and the cottage which had long been the object of his wishes and which on his return to his mountains he will make his own should he acquire the wealth of which he is in pursuit but how much more sorrowful the moment of separation to him who having never sent a transient wish beyond the mountains feels that they comprise the limits of his earthly hopes and yet is driven from them by an adverse fate who is compelled to quit them to go into a foreign land with scarcely a hope of return then he breaks into mournful exclamations farewell native cottage where many a time and oft i have listened with eager ear to distinguish amidst the rumour of footsteps 
the well-known sound of those long expected and anxiously desired farewell ye scenes where i had hoped to pass tranquil and content the remnant of my days farewell thou sanctuary of god where my soul has been filled with admiring thoughts of him and my voice has united with others to sing his praise farewell he whom i worshipped within your walls is not confined to temples made with hands heaven is his dwelling place and the earth his footstool he watches over his children and if he chastise them it is in love to prepare them for higher and holier enjoyments of such a nature if not precisely the same were the reflections of lucy and her companions as the bark carried them to the right bank of the Adda. end of chapter eight chapter nine of the betrothed by alessandro manzoni translated by george william fenshaw this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the shock which the boat received as it struck against the shore aroused lucy from her reverie they quitted the bark and renzo turned to thank and reward the boatman i will take nothing nothing said he we are placed on earth to aid one another the carriage was ready the drivers seated its expected occupants took their places and the horses moved briskly on our travellers arrived then at monza which we believe to have been the name of the place to which father christopher had directed renzo a little after sunrise the driver turned to an inn where he appeared to be well acquainted and demanded for them a separate room he as well as the boatman refused the offered recompense of renzo like the boatman he had in view a reward more distant indeed but more abundant he withdrew his hand and hastened to look after his beast after an evening such as we have described and a night passed in painful thoughts both in regard to recent events and future anticipations disturbed indeed by the frequent joltings of their incommodious vehicle our travellers felt a little rest in their retired apartment at the inn highly necessary they partook of a small meal together not more in proportion to the prevailing want than to their own slender appetites and recurred with a sigh to the delightful festivities which two days before were to have accompanied their happy union renzo would willingly have remained with his companions all the day to secure their lodging and perform other little offices but they strongly alleged the injunctions of father christopher together with the gossiping to which their continuing together would give rise so that he at length acquiesced lucy could not conceal her tears renzo with difficulty restrained his and warmly pressing the hand of agnes he pronounced with a voice almost choked till we meet again the mother and daughter would have been in great perplexity had it not been for the kind driver who had orders to conduct them to the convent which was a little distant from the village upon their arrival there the guide requested the porter to call the superior he appeared and the letter of father christopher was delivered to him oh from father christopher said he recognizing the handwriting his voice and manner told evidently that he uttered the name of one whom he regarded as a particular friend during the perusal of the letter he manifested much surprise and indignation and raising his eyes fixed them on lucy and her mother with an expression of pity and interest when he had finished reading he remained for a moment thoughtful and then exclaimed there is no one but the signora if the signora would take upon herself this obligation and then addressing them my friends said he i will make the effort and i hope to find you a shelter more than secure more than honourable so that god has provided for you in the best manner will you come with me the females bowed reverently in assent the friar continued come with me then to the monastery of the signora but keep yourselves a few steps distant because there are people who delight to speak evil of others and god knows how many fine stories might be told if the superior of the convent was seen walking with a beautiful young woman with women i mean so saying he went on before lucy blushed the guide looked at agnes who could not conceal a momentary smile and they all three obeyed the command of the friar and followed him at a distance who is the signora said agnes addressing their conductor the signora replied he is not a nun that is not a nun like the others she is not the abbess nor the prioress for they say that she is one of the youngest of them but she is from adam's rib and her ancestors were great people who came from spain and they call her the signora to signify that she is a great lady every one calls her so because they say that in this monastery they have never had so noble a person and her relations down at milan are very powerful and in monza still more so because her father is the first lord in the country for which reason she can do as she pleases in the convent 
and moreover people abroad bear her a great respect, and if she undertakes a thing, she makes it succeed, and if this good father induces her to take you under her protection, you will be as safe as at the foot of the altar. When the superior arrived at the gate of the town, which was defended at that time by an old tower and part of a dismantled castle, he stopped and looked back to see if they followed him, then advanced towards the monastery, and, remaining on the threshold, awaited their approach. The guide then took his leave, not without many thanks for Magnus and her daughter for his kindness and faithfulness. The superior led them to the portress's chamber, and went alone to make the request of the signora. After a few moments he reappeared, and with a joyful countenance told them that she would grant them an interview. On their way he gave them much advice concerning their deportment in her presence. "'She is well disposed towards you,' said he, "'and has the power to protect you. Be humble and respectful.' reply with frankness to the questions she will ask you, and when not questioned, be silent. They passed through a lower chamber, and advanced towards the parlor. Lucy, who had never been in a monastery before, looked around as she entered it for the signora, but there was no one there. In a few moments, however, she observed the friar approach a small window or grating, behind which she beheld a nun standing. She appeared about twenty-five years of age. Her countenance, at first sight, produced an impression of beauty, but of beauty prematurely faded. A black veil hung in folds on either side of her face. Below the veil, a band of white linen encircled a forehead of different but not inferior whiteness. Another plaited band encompassed the face, and terminated under the chin in a neck handkerchief or cape which, extending over the shoulders, covered to the waist the folds of her black robe. But her forehead was contracted from time to time, as if by some painful emotion. Now her large black eye was fixed steadfastly on your face with an expression of haughty curiosity, then hastily bent down as if to discover some hidden thought. In certain moments an attentive observer would have deemed that they solicited affection, sympathy, and pity. At others he would have received a transient revelation of hatred, matured by a cruel disposition. When motionless and inattentive, some would have imagined them to express haughty aversion. Others would have suspected the laboring of concealed thought, the effort to overcome some secret feeling of her soul, which had more power over it than all surrounding objects. Her cheeks were delicately formed, but extremely pale and thin. Her lips, hardly suffused with a feeble tinge of the rose, seemed to soften into the pallid hue of the cheeks. Their movements, like those of her eyes, were sudden, animated, and full of expression and mystery. Her loftiness of stature was not apparent, owing to a habitual stoop, as well as to her rapid and irregular movements, little becoming a nun or even a lady. In her dress itself there was an appearance of studied neglect, which announced a singular character, and from the band around her temples was suffered to escape, through forgetfulness or contempt of the rules which prohibited it, a curl of glossy black hair. These things made no impression on the minds of Agnes and Lucy, unaccustomed as they were to the sight of a nun, and to the superior it was no novelty. He, as well as many others, had become familiarized to her habit and manners. She was, as we have said, standing near the grate, against which she leaned languidly, to observe those who were approaching. "'Reverend mother and most illustrious lady,' said the superior, bending low, "'this is the poor young woman for whom I have solicited your protection, and this is her mother.' Both mother and daughter bowed reverently. "'It is fortunate that I have it in my power,' said she, turning to the father, "'to do some little service to our good friends the Capuchin fathers. But tell me a little more particularly the situation of this young woman that I may be better prepared to act to her advantage.' Lucy blushed and held down her head. "'You must know, reverend mother,' said Agnes, but the father interrupted her. "'This young person, most illustrious lady,' continued he, "'has been recommended to me, as I have told you, by one of my brethren. She has been obliged to depart secretly from her native place in order to escape heavy perils, and she has need for some time of an asylum where she can remain unknown, and where no one will dare to molest her.' "'What perils?' demanded the lady. "'Pray, father, do not talk so enigmatically. You know we nuns like to hear stories minutely.' "'They are perils,' replied the father, "'that should not be told to the pure ears of the reverend mother.' "'Oh, certainly,' said the lady, hastily and slightly blushing. Was this the blush of modesty? He would have doubted it, who should have observed the rapid expression of disdain which accompanied it, or have compared it with that which from time to time diffused itself over the cheek of Lucy.' It is sufficient to say, resumed the friar, that a powerful lord, it is not all the rich and noble who make use of the gifts of God for the promotion of his glory, as you do, most illustrious lady. A powerful lord, after having persecuted for a long time this innocent creature with wicked allurements, finding them unavailing, has had recourse to open force, 
so that she has been obliged to fly from her home approach young woman said the signora i know that the father is truth itself but no one can be better informed than you with regard to this affair to you it belongs to tell us if this lord was an odious persecutor lucy obeyed the first command and approached the grating but the second accompanied as it was with a certain malicious air of doubt brought a blush over her countenance and a sense of painful embarrassment which she found it impossible to overcome lady mother reverend stammered she agnes now felt herself authorized to come to her assistance most illustrious lady said she i can bear testimony that my daughter hates this lord as the devil hates holy water i would call him the devil were it not for your reverend presence the case is this this poor maiden was promised to a good and industrious youth and if the curate had done his duty you are very ready to speak without being interrogated interrupted the lady with an expression of anger on her countenance which changed it almost to deformity silence i have not to be informed that parents have always an answer prepared in the name of their children agnes drew back mortified and the father guardian signified to lucy by a look as well as by a movement of the head that now was the time to rouse her courage and not leave her poor mother in the dilemma reverend lady said she what my mother has told you is the truth i willingly engaged myself to the poor youth and here she became covered with blushes pardon me this boldness but i would not have you think ill of my mother and as to this lord god forgive him i would rather die than fall into his hands and if you do this deed of charity be certain signora no one will pray for you more heartily than those whom you have thus sheltered i believe you said the lady with a softened voice but we will see you alone not that i need farther explanation or other motives to accede to the wishes of the father superior added she turning to him with studied politeness nay continued she i have been thinking and this is what occurred to me the portess of the monastery has bestowed in marriage a few days since her last daughter these females can occupy her room and supply her place in the little services which it was her office to perform the father would have expressed his thanks but the lady interrupted him there is no need for ceremony in case of need i would not hesitate to ask assistance of the capuchin fathers in short continued she with a smile in which appeared a degree of bitter irony are we not brothers and sisters so saying she called a nun her attendant by a singular distinction she had two assigned for her private service and sent her to inform the abbess she then called the portress and made with her and agnes the necessary arrangements then taking leave of the superior she dismissed agnes to her room but retained lucy the signora who in presence of a capuchin had studied her actions and her words thought no longer of putting a restraint on them before an inexperienced country girl her discourse became by degrees so strange that in order to account for it we will relate the previous history of this unhappy and misguided person she was the youngest daughter of the prince blank a great milanese nobleman who was among the wealthiest of the city the magnificent ideas he entertained of his rank made him suppose his wealth hardly sufficient to support it properly he therefore determined to preserve his riches with the greatest care how many children he had does not clearly appear it is only known that he had destined to the cloister all the youngest of both sexes in order to preserve his fortune for the eldest son the condition of the unhappy signora had been settled even before her birth it remained only to be decided whether she were to be a monk or a nun at her birth the prince her father wishing to give her a name which could recall at every moment the idea of a cloister and which had been borne by a saint of a noble family called her gertrude dolls clothed like nuns were the first toys that were put into her hands then pictures of nuns and these gifts were accompanied with many injunctions to be careful of them for they were precious things when the prince or princess or the young prince who was the only one of the children brought up at home wished to praise the beauty of the infant they found no way of expressing their ideas except in exclamations of this sort what a mother abbess but no one ever said directly to her thou must be a nun such an intention however was understood and included every conversation regarding her future destiny if sometimes the little gertrude betrayed perversity and impetuosity of temper they would say to her thou art but a child and these manners are not becoming wait till thou art the mother abbess and then thou shalt command with a rod thou shalt do whatever pleases thee at other times reprehending her for the freedom and familiarity of her manners the prince would say such should not be the deportment of one like you if you wish at some future day to 
have the respect of all around you learn now to have more gravity remember that you will be the first in the monastery because noble blood bears sway everywhere by such conversations as these the implicit idea was produced in the mind of the child that she was to be a nun the manners of the prince were habitually austere and repulsive and with respect to the destination of the child his resolution appeared fixed as fate at six years of age she was placed for her education in the monastery where we find her her father being the most powerful noble in monza enjoyed their great authority and his daughter consequently would receive those distinctions with those allurements which might lead her to select it for her perpetual abode the abbess and nuns rejoicing at the acquisition of such powerful friendship received with great gratitude the honor conferred in preference on them and entered with avidity into the views of the prince gertrude experienced all sorts of favors and indulgences and child as she was the respectful attention of the nuns towards her was exercised with the same deference as if she had been the abbess herself not that they were all pledged to draw the poor child into the snare many acted with simplicity and through tenderness merely following the example of those around them if the suspicions of others were excited they kept silence so as not to cause useless disturbance some indeed more discriminating and compassionate pitied the poor child as being the object of artifices to the like of which they themselves had been the victims things would have proceeded agreeably to the wishes of all concerned had gertrude been the only child in the monastery but this was not the case and there were some among her school companions who were destined for the matrimonial state the little gertrude filled with the idea of her superiority spoke proudly of her future destiny expecting hereby to excite their envy at her peculiar honors with scorn and wonder she perceived that their estimation of them was very different to the majestic but circumscribed and cold images of the power of an abbess they opposed the varied and bright pictures of husband guests cities tournaments courts dress and equipage new and strange emotions arose in the mind of gertrude her vanity had been cultivated in order to make the cloister desirable to her and now easily assimilating itself with the ideas thus presented she entered into them with all the ardor of her soul she replied that no one could oblige her to take the veil without her own consent that she could also marry inhabit a palace and enjoy the world that she could if she wished it that she would wish it and did wish it the necessity of her own consent hitherto little considered became henceforth the ruling thought of her mind she called it to her aid at all times when she desired to luxuriate in the pleasing images of future felicity but her fancied enjoyment was impaired by the reflection which at such moments intruded itself that her father had irrevocably decided her destiny and she shuddered at the recollection of his austere manners which impressed upon all around him the sentiments of a fatal necessity as being necessarily conjoined with whatever he should command then would she compare her condition to that of her more fortunate companions and envy soon grew into hatred this would manifest itself by a display of present superiority and sometimes of ill-nature sarcasm and spite at other times her more amiable and gentle qualities would obtain transitory ascendancy thus she passed the period allotted for her education in dreams of future bliss mingled with the dread of future misery that which she anticipated most distinctly was external pomp and splendor and her fancy would often luxuriate in imaginary scenes of grandeur constructed out of such materials as her memory could faintly and confusedly furnish forth and the descriptions of her companions supply there were moments when these brilliant imaginings were disturbed by the idea of religion but the religion which had been inculcated to the poor girl did not prescribe pride but on the contrary sanctified it and proposed it as a means of obtaining terrestrial felicity thus despoiled of its essence it was no longer religion but a phantom which assuming at times a power over her mind the unhappy girl was tormented with superstitious dread and filled with a confused idea of duties imagined her repugnance to the cloister to be a crime which could only be expiated by her voluntary dedication there was a law that no young person could be accepted for the monastic life without being examined by an ecclesiastic called the vicar of the nuns so that it should be made manifest that it was the result of her free election and this examination could not take place until a year after she had presented her petition for admission in writing to the vicar the nuns therefore who were aware of the projects of her father undertook to draw from her such a petition encountering her in one of those moments when she was assailed by her superstitious fears they suggested to her the propriety of such a course and assured her nevertheless that it was a mere formality which was true and would be without efficacy unless sanctioned by some after act of her own the petition however had scarcely been sent to its destination when gertrude repented of having written it she then repented of this repentance passing months in incessant vicissitude of feeling there was another law that at this examination a young person should not be received without having remained at least a month at her paternal home 
A year had nearly passed since the petition had been sent, and Gertrude had been warned that she would soon be removed from the monastery and conducted to her father's house to take the final steps towards the consummation of that which they had held certain. Not so the poor girl. Her mind was busied with plans of escape. In her perplexity, she unbosomed herself to one of her companions, who counseled her to inform her father by letter of the change in her views. The letter was written and sent. Gertrude remained in great anxiety, expecting reply which never came. A few days after, the abbess took her aside, and, with a mixed expression of contempt and compassion, hinted to her the anger of the prince, and the error she had committed. But that, if she conducted herself well for the future, all would be forgotten. The poor girl heard, and dared not ask farther explanation. The day, so ardently desired and so greatly feared, came at last. The anticipation of the trials that awaited her was forgotten in her tumultuous joy at the sight of the open country, the city, and the houses. She might well feel thus, after having been for eight years enclosed within the walls of the monastery. She had previously arranged with her new confidant. Oh, they will try to force me, thought she, but I will persist, humbly and respectfully. The point is not to say yes, and I will not say it. Or perhaps they will endeavor to shake my purpose by kindness. But I will weep, I will implore, I will excite their compassion, I will beseech them not to sacrifice me. But none of her anticipations were verified. Her parents and family, with the usual artful policy in such cases, maintained a perfect silence with regard to the subject of her meditations. They regarded her with looks of contemptuous pity, and appeared to avoid all conversation with her, as if she had rendered herself unworthy of it. A mysterious anathema appeared to hang over her, and to keep at a distance every member of the household. If, wearied with this prescription, she endeavored to enter into conversation, they made her understand indirectly that by obedience alone could she regain the affections of the family. But this was precisely the condition to which she could not assent. She therefore continued in her state of excommunication, which unhappily appeared to be, at least partially, the consequence of her own conduct. Such a state of things formed a sad contrast to the radiant visions which had occupied her imagination. Her confinement was as strict at home as it had been in the monastery, and she, who had fancied she should enjoy, at least for this brief period, the pleasures of the world, found herself an exile from all society. At every announcement of a visitor, she was compelled to retire with the elderly persons of the family, and always dined apart whenever a guest was present. Even the servants of the family appeared to concur with the designs of their master, and to treat her with carelessness, ill-concealed by an awkward attempt at formality. There was one among them, however, who seemed to feel towards her respect and compassion. This was a handsome page, who equaled in her imagination the ideal images of loveliness she had so often fondly cherished. There was soon apparent a change in her manner, a love of reverie and abstraction, and she no longer appeared to covet the favor of her family. Some engrossing thought had taken possession of her mind. To be brief, she was detected one day in folding a letter, which it had been better she had not written, and which she was obliged to relinquish to her female attendant, who carried it to the prince, her father. He came immediately to her apartment with the letter in his hand, and in few but terrible words told her that for the present she should be confined to her chamber, with the society only of the woman who had made the discovery, and intimated for the future still darker punishments. The page was dismissed with an imperative command of silence, and solemn threatenings of punishment should he presume to violate it. Gertrude was then left alone, with her shame, her remorse, and her terror, and the sole company of this woman whom she hated as the witness of her fault and the cause of her disgrace. The hatred was cordially returned, inasmuch as the attendant found herself reduced to the annoying duty of a jailer, and was made the guardian of a perilous secret for life. The first confused tumult of her feelings having in some measure subsided, she recalled to mind the dark intimations of her father with regard to some future punishment. What could this be? It most probably was a return to the monastery at Monza, not as the signorina, but as a guilty wretch, who, loaded with shame, was to be enclosed within its walls for ever. Now, indeed, her fancy no longer dwelt on the bright visions with which it had been so often busied. They were too much opposed to the sad reality of her present condition. Such an act would repair all her errors, and change, could she doubt it, in an instant her condition. The only castle in which Gertrude could imagine a tranquil and honorable asylum, and which was not in the air, was the monastery, in which she was now resolved to place herself forever. Opposed to this resolution rose up the contemplations of many years past. The times were changed, and to the depth in which Gertrude had fallen, the condition of a nun, revered, obeyed, and feared, formed a bright contrast. She was perpetually tormented also by her jailer, who, to revenge herself for the confinement imposed on her, failed not to taunt her for her misdemeanor, and to repeat the menaces of her father. Or whenever she seemed disposed to relent, and to show something like pity, 
her tone of protection was still more intolerable. The predominant desire of Gertrude was to escape from her clutches, and to raise herself to a condition above her anger or her pity. At the end of four or five long days, with her patience exhausted by the bitter railings of her keeper, she sat herself down in a corner of the chamber, and covering her face with her hands, wept in bitterness of soul. She experienced an absolute craving for other faces and other sounds than those of her tormentor, and a sudden joy imparted itself to her mind, from the reflection that it depended only on herself to be restored to the good will and attentions of the family. Mingled with this joy came repentance for her fault, and a desire to expiate it. She arose, went to a small table, and taking a pen, wrote to her father, expressing her penitence and her hope, imploring his pardon, and promising to do all that might be required of her. End of chapter 9《Chapter X of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni》Translated by George William Fenshaw《This LibriVox recording is in the public domain》Chapter X There are moments in which the mind, particularly of the young, is so disposed that a little importunity suffices to obtain from it anything that has the appearance of virtuous sacrifice, as a flower scarcely budded abandons itself on its fragile stem, ready to yield its sweets to the first breeze which plays around it. These moments, which ought to be regarded by others with timid respect, are exactly those of which interested cunning makes use, to ensnare the unguarded will. On the perusal of this letter, the prince saw the way open to the furtherance of his views. He sent for Gertrude. She obeyed the command, and, in his presence, threw herself at his feet, and had scarcely power to exclaim, Pardon! He made a sign to her to rise, and in a grave voice answered that it was not enough merely to confess her fault and ask forgiveness, but that it was necessary to merit it. Gertrude asked submissively, "'What would you have me do?' To this the prince did not reply directly, but spoke at length of the fault of Gertrude. The poor girl shuddered, as at the touch of a hand on a severe wound. He continued that even if he had entertained the project of settling her in the world, she had herself placed an insuperable obstacle to it, since he could never, as a gentleman of honor, permit her to marry, after having given such a specimen of herself. The miserable listener was completely humbled. The prince then, by degrees, softened his voice and manner to say that for all faults there was a remedy, and that the remedy for hers was clearly indicated, that she might perceive in this fatal accident a warning that the world was too full of dangers for her. "'Oh, yes!' exclaimed Gertrude, overwhelmed with shame and remorse. "'Ah, you perceive it yourself,' resumed the prince. "'Well, we will speak no more of the past. All is forgotten.' You have taken the only honourable way that remains for you, and because you have taken it voluntarily, it rests with me to make it turn to your advantage, and to make the merit of the sacrifice all your own." So saying, he rang the bell, and said to the servant who appeared, "'The princess and the prince immediately.' He continued to Gertrude, "'I wish to make them the sharers of my joy. I wish that they should begin at once to treat you as you deserve. You have hitherto found me a severe judge. You shall now prove that I am a loving father. At these words, Gertrude remained stupefied. She thought of the... Yes. She had so precipitately suffered to escape from her lips, and would have recalled it, but she did not dare. The satisfaction of the prince appeared so entire, his condescension so conditional, that she could not presume to utter a word to disturb it. The princess and prince came into the room. On seeing Gertrude there, they appeared full of doubt and surprise. But the prince, with a joyful countenance, said to them, Behold here the lost sheep. Let these be the last words that shall recall painful recollections. Behold the consolation of the family. Gertrude has no longer need of advice. She has voluntarily chosen her own good. She has resolved... She has signified to me that she has resolved. She raised to him a look of supplication, but he continued more plainly. That she has resolved to take the veil. Well, well done. done! Well, well done. done! Exclaimed they both, overwhelming her with embraces, which Gertrude received with tears, which they chose to interpret as tears of joy. Then the prince enlarged on the splendid destiny of his daughter, on the distinction she would enjoy in the monastery and in the country, as the representative of the family. Her mother and her brother renewed their congratulations and praises. Gertrude stood as if possessed by a dream. 
it was then necessary to fix the day for the journey to Monza for the purpose of making the request of the abbess. "'How rejoiced she will be,' said the prince. "'I am sure all the nuns will appreciate the honour Gertrude does them. But why not go there to-day? Gertrude would willingly take the air.' "'Let us go, then,' said the princess. "'I will order the carriage,' said the young prince. "'But,' said Gertrude submissively, "'Softly, softly,' said the prince. "'Let her decide. Perhaps she does not feel disposed to go to-day, and would rather wait until to-morrow. I say, do you wish to go to-day or to-morrow?' "'To-morrow,' said Gertrude in a feeble voice, glad of a short reprieve. "'To-morrow,' said the prince solemnly. "'She has decided to go to-morrow.' Meanwhile, I will see the vicar of the nuns, to have him to appoint a day for the examination. He did so, and the vicar named the day after the next. In the interval, Gertrude was not left a moment to herself. She would have desired some repose for her mind after so many contending emotions, to have reflected on the steps she had already taken, and what remained to be done. But the machine once in motion at her direction, it was no longer in her power to arrest its progress. Occupations succeeded each other without interruption. The princess herself assisted at her toilette, which was completed by her own maid. This effected, dinner was announced, and poor Gertrude was made to pass through the crowd of servants, who nodded their congratulations to each other. She found at the table a few relations of the family, who had been invited in haste to participate in the general joy. The young bride, thus they called young persons about to enter the monastic life, the young bride had enough to do to reply to the compliments which were paid to her. She felt that each reply was a confirmation of her destiny. But how act differently? After dinner came the hour of riding, and Gertrude was placed in a carriage with her mother and two uncles, who had been among the guests. They entered the street marina, which then crossed the space now occupied by the public gardens, and was the public promenade, where the nobility refreshed themselves after the fatigues of the day. The uncles conversed much with Gertrude, and one of them in particular, who appeared to know everybody, every carriage, and every livery, had something to tell of Signor such a one, and Signora such a one. But checking himself, he said to his niece, "'Ah, you little rogue! You turn your back upon all these follies. You are the righteous person, leaving us worldlings far behind. You are going to lead a happy life and take yourself to paradise in a coach.' They returned home in the dusk of the evening, and the servants, appearing with torches, announced to them that numerous visitors had arrived. The report had spread, and a multitude of relations and friends had come to offer their congratulations. The young bride was the idol, the amusement, the victim of the evening. Finally, Gertrude was left alone with the family. "'At last,' said the prince, "'I've had the consolation of seeing my daughter in society becoming her rank and station. She has conducted herself admirably, and has evinced that there will be no preventive to her obtaining the highest honours and supporting the dignity of the family.' They supped hastily, so as to be ready early in the morning. At the request of Gertrude, her attendant, of whose insolence she bitterly complained to her father, was removed, and another placed in her stead. This was an old woman, who had been nurse to the young prince, in whom was centred all her hopes and her pride. She was overjoyed at the decision of Gertrude, who, as a climax to her trials, was obliged to listen to her congratulations and praises. She talked of her numerous aunts and relatives, who were so happy as nuns, of the many visits she would doubtless receive. She further spoke of the young prince, and the lady who was to be his wife, in the visit which they would doubtless pay to Gertrude at the monastery, until, wearied out with the conflicts of the day, the poor girl fell asleep. She was aroused in the morning by the harsh voice of the old woman. "'Up, up, Signora, young bride. It is day. The princess is up, and waiting for you. The young prince is impatient. He is as brisk as a hare, the young devil.' He was so from an infant, but when he is ready you must not make him wait. He is the best temper in the world, but that always makes him impatient and noisy. Poor fellow, we must pity him. It is the effect of temperament. In such moments he has respect to no one but the head of the household. However, one day he will be the head. May that day be far off. Quick, quick, signorina. You should have been out of your nest before this. The idea of the young prince, risen and impatient, recalled the scattered thoughts of Gertrude, 
and hastily she suffered herself to be dressed and descended to the saloon, where her parents and brother were assembled. A cup of chocolate was brought her, and the carriage was announced. Before their departure, the prince took his daughter aside and said to her, Courage, Gertrude. Yesterday you did well. Today you must excel yourself. The point is now to make a suitable appearance in the country and in the monastery, where you are destined to hold the first station. They expect you, and all eyes will be on you. Dignity and ease. The abbess will ask you what is your request. It is a mere form, but you must reply that you wish to be admitted to take the veil in this monastery, where you have been educated and treated so kindly. Which is the truth. Speak these words with a free, unembarrassed air, so as not to give occasion for scandal. These good mothers know nothing of the unhappy occurrence. That must remain buried with the family. However, an anxious countenance might excite suspicion. Show whose is the blood in your veins. Be polite and modest, but remember also that in this country, out of the family, there is none your superior. During their ride, the troubles and the trials of the world and the blessed life of the cloister were the principal subjects of conversation. As they approached the monastery, the crowd collected from all parts. As the carriage stopped before the walls, the heart of Gertrude beat more rapidly. They alighted amidst the concourse. All eyes were fastened on her, and compelled her to study the movements of her countenance, and, above all, those of her father, upon whom she could not help fixing her regards, notwithstanding the fear he inspired. They crossed the first court, entered the second, and here appeared the interior cloister, wide opened and occupied by nuns. In the front was the abbess, surrounded by the most aged of the sisterhood, behind these the others, raised promiscuously on tiptoe, and farther back lay sisters, standing on benches and overlooking the scene, whilst here and there were seen, peeping between the cows, some youthful faces, which Gertrude recognized as those of her school companions. As she stood fronting the abbess, the latter demanded, with grave solemnity, what she desired to have in this place, where nothing could be denied her. I am here, began Gertrude, but, about to utter the words which were to decide her destiny irrevocably, she felt her heart fail, and hesitating, she fixed her eyes on the crowd before her. She beheld there the well-known face of one of her companions, who regarded her with looks of compassion and malice, as if to say, They have caught the brave one. This sight required all her courage, and she was about to give a reply very different from that which was expected from her, when, glancing at her father, she caught from his eye such an anxious and threatening expression that, overcome by terror, she proceeded. I am here to ask admittance into this monastery, where I have been instructed so kindly. The abbess immediately expressed her regret that the regulations were such as to prohibit an immediate answer, which must be given by the common suffrage of the sisterhood, but the Gertrude knew well the sentiments they entertained towards her, and might judge what the answer would be. In the meantime, nothing prevented them from manifesting their joy at her request. There was then heard a confused murmur of congratulations and rejoicing. Whilst the nuns were surrounding their new companion, and offering their congratulations to all the party, the abbess expressed her wish to address a few words to the prince at the parlor grating. Signor, said she, in obedience to our rules, to fulfill a necessary form, I must inform you that whenever a young person desires to assume, the superior, which I am, though unworthily, is obliged to make known to the parents that if they have forced the will of their daughter, they will incur the pains of excommunication. You will excuse— Oh, yes, yes, Reverend Mother. Your exactitude is very praiseworthy and very just, but you cannot doubt. Oh, imagine, Prince, if— but I merely speak by order. Besides— True, true, reverend mother. After these few words, and a renewal of compliments and thanks, they departed. Gertrude was silent during their ride, overcome and occupied by conflicting thoughts, ashamed of her own want of resolution, vexed with others as well as herself. She was still meditating some way of escape. But every time she looked at her father, she felt her destiny to be irrevocable. After the various engagements of the day were over— the dinner, the visits, the drive, the conversazione, the supper, the prince brought another subject under discussion, which was the choice of a godmother. So they called the lady who was selected as chaperone to the young candidate in the interval between the request for admission and the putting on of the habit. The duty of this person was to visit, with her charge, 
the churches, public palaces, the conversazioni, in short, everything of note in the city and its environs, so as to afford a peep at the world they were about to quit forever. We must think of a godmother, said the prince, because tomorrow the vicar of the nuns will be here for the examination, and soon after that Gertrude will be finally accepted. Now the choice shall come from Gertrude herself, although contrary to usage. But she deserves to be made an exception, and we may confidently trust to her judgment in the selection. And then, turning to her, as if bestowing a singular favour, he continued, Any one of the ladies who are at the conversazione this evening possesses the necessary qualifications for a godmother. Any one of them will consider it an honour. Make your selection. Gertrude instantly felt that the choice would be a renewal of consent, but the proposal was made with such an air of condescension that a refusal would have appeared to spring from contempt or ingratitude. Thus she took another step, and named a lady who had been forward in attentions to her during the whole evening. "'A perfectly wise choice,' said the prince, who had expected no less. The affair had all been previously arranged. This lady had been so much with Gertrude at the conversazione, and had displayed such kindness of manner, that it would have been an effort for her to think of another. The attentions, however, of this lady were not without their object. She had also for a long time contemplated making the young prince her son, she, therefore, naturally interested herself in all that concerned the family, and felt the deepest interest in her dear Gertrude. On the morrow, the imagination of Gertrude was occupied with the expected examination, and with a vague hope of some opportunity to retract. At an early hour she was sent for by the prince, who addressed her in these words. "'Courage, my daughter. You have as yet conducted yourself admirably. Today you must crown the work. All that has been done has been done with your consent. If, in the meanwhile, you had any doubts, any misgivings, you should have expressed them. But at the point to which things have now arrived, it will no longer do to play the child. The worthy man who is to come this morning will put a hundred questions to you concerning your vocation, such as whether you go voluntarily, and the why and the wherefore. If you falter in your replies, he will continue to urge you. This will produce pain to yourself, but might become the source of a more serious evil. After all the public demonstrations that we have made, the slightest hesitation on your part might place my honour in danger, by conveying the idea that I had taken a mere youthful whim for a confirmed resolution, and that I had thus acted precipitately. In this case... I should feel myself under the necessity, in order to preserve my character inviolate, to reveal the true motive. But, seeing the countenance of Gertrude all on flame, and contracting itself like the leaves of a flower in the heat which precedes a tempest, he stopped a moment, and then resumed. Well, well, all depends on yourself. I know you will not show yourself a child, but recollect, you must reply with freedom so as not to create suspicion in the mind of this worthy man. He then suggested the answers to be made to the probable questions that would be put, and concluded with various remarks upon the happiness that awaited Gertrude at the convent. At this moment the servant announced the arrival of the vicar, and the prince was obliged to leave his daughter alone to receive him. The good man had come with a preconceived opinion that Gertrude went voluntarily to the cloister, because the prince had told him so. It was one of his maxims, however, to preserve himself unprejudiced, and to depend only on the assertions of the candidates themselves. Signorina, said he, I come to play the part of the tempter. I come to suggest doubts where you have affirmed certainties. I come to place before your eyes difficulties, and ascertain if you have well considered them. You will allow me to trouble you with some interrogatories? Say on, replied Gertrude. The good priest then began to interrogate her in the form prescribed. Do you feel in your heart a free, spontaneous resolution to become a nun? Have menaces or allurements or authority been made use of? Speak without reserve to one whose duty it is to ascertain the true state of your feelings and to prevent violence being done to them. The true reply to such a question presented itself suddenly to the mind of Gertrude, with terrible reality. But to come to an explanation, to say she was threatened, to relate the unfortunate story— from this her spirit shrank, and she brought herself to the resolution of saying, I become a nun freely from inclination. 
How long have you had this intention? Asked the good priest. I have always had it, said Gertrude, finding it easier after the first step to proceed in falsehood. But what is the principal motive which has induced you? The interrogator was not aware of the cord he touched, and Gertrude, making a great effort to preserve the tranquillity of her countenance amid the tumult of her soul, replied, The motive is to serve God and to fly the perils of the world. Has there never been any disgust? Any, excuse me, caprice? Often trifling causes make impressions which we deem will be perpetual, but the causes cease— No, no, replied Gertrude hastily. The cause is that which I have said. The vicar, in order to execute his duty fully, persisted in his inquiries, but Gertrude was determined to deceive him. She could not for a moment think of rendering the good man acquainted with her weakness. She knew, indeed, that he could prevent her being a nun, but that this would be the extent of his authority and his protection. When he should be gone, she would still be left alone, to endure fresh trials from her father and the family. Finding, therefore, a uniform answer to all his questions, he became somewhat wearied of putting them, and, concluding that all was as it should be, with many prayers for her welfare, he took his leave. As he crossed the hall, he met the prince, and congratulated him on the good dispositions of his daughter. This put an end to a very painful state of suspense and anxiety on the part of the prince, who, forgetting his usual gravity, ran to his daughter and loaded her with praises, caresses, and promises, and with a tenderness of affection in great measure sincere. Such is the inconsistency of the human heart. Then ensued a round of spectacles and diversions, during which we cannot attempt to describe minutely, or in order, the emotions to which the heart of Gertrude was subjected. The perpetual change of objects, the freedom enjoyed by this change, rendered more odious to her the idea of her prison. Still more pungent were the impressions she received in the festivals and the assemblies of the city. The pomp of the palaces, the splendor of their furniture, the buzzing and festal clamor of the conversazione, communicated to her such an intoxication, such an eager desire for happiness, that she thought she could encounter all the consequences of a recantation, or even suffer death, rather than return to the cold shades of the cloister. But all such resolutions instantly fled, as her eyes rested on the austere countenance of the prince. Meanwhile the vicar of the nuns had made the necessary deposition, and liberty was given to hold a chapter for the acceptation of Gertrude. The chapter was held and she was received. Wearied out with her long conflicts, she requested immediate admittance, which was readily granted. After an novitiate of twelve days, full of resolves and counter-resolves, the moment arrived when she finally pronounced the fatal Yes, which was to exclude her from the world forever. But even in the depths of the monastery she found no repose. She had not the wisdom to make a virtue of necessity, but was continually and uselessly recurring to the past. She could not call religion to her aid, for religion had no share in the sacrifice she had made, and heavily and bitterly she bore the yoke of bondage. She hated the nuns, because she remembered their artifices, and regarded them in some measure as the authors of her misfortune. She tyrannized over them with impunity, because they dared not rebel against her authority, and incur the resentment of the powerful lord, her father. Those nuns, who were really pious and harmless, she hated for their piety itself, as it seemed to cast a tacit reproach on her weakness, and she suffered no occasion to escape without railing at them as bigots and hypocrites. It might, however, have mitigated her asperity towards them, had she known that the black balls to oppose her entrance had been cast into the urn by their sympathetic generosity. She found, however, one consolation in the unlimited power she possessed, in being courted and flattered, and in hearing herself called the Signora. But what a consolation! Her soul felt its insufficiency, but had not the courage nor the virtue to seek happiness from the only source where it could be found. Thus she lived many years, tyrannizing over and feared by all around her, till an occasion presented itself for a further development of her habitual but secret feelings. Among other privileges which had been accorded to her in the monastery, was that of having her apartments on a side of the building little frequented by the other nuns. Opposite to this quarter of the convent was a house inhabited by a young man, a villain by profession, one of those who, at this period, by their mutual combinations, were enabled to set at naught the public laws. His name was Egidio. From his small window, which overlooked the courtyard, he had often seen Gertrude wandering there from listlessness and melancholy. Allured rather than intimidated by the danger and iniquity of the act, he dared one day to speak to her. The wretched girl replied. Then was experienced a new but not unmixed satisfaction. Into the painful void of her soul was infused a powerful stimulus, a fresh principle of vitality, 
but this enjoyment resembled the restoring beverage which the ingenious cruelty of the ancients presented to the criminal in order to strengthen him to sustain his martyrdom a change came also over her whole deportment she was regular tranquil endearing and affable in such a degree that her sisters congratulated themselves upon the circumstance little imagining the true motive and that the alteration was none other than hypocrisy added to her other defects this outward improvement however did not last long she soon returned to her customary caprices and moreover was heard to utter bitter imprecations against the cloistral prison in unusual and unbecoming language the sisters bore these vicissitudes as well as they could and attributed them to the light and capricious nature of the signora for some time it did not appear that the suspicions of any one of them were excited but one day the signora had been speaking with one of the sisters her attendant in reviling her beyond measure for some trifling matter the sister suffered for a while and gnawed the bit in silence but finally becoming impatient declared that she was mistress of a secret and could advise the signora in her turn from this time forward her peace was lost not many days after however this very sister was missing from her accustomed offices they sought her in her cell and did not find her they called and she answered not they searched diligently in every place but without success and who knows what conjectures might have arisen if there had not been found a great opening in the wall of the orchard through which she had probably made her escape they sent messengers in various directions to pursue and restore her but they never heard of her more perhaps they would not have been so unfortunate in their search if they had dug near the garden wall finally the nuns concluded that she must have gone to a great distance and because one of them happened to say she had taken refuge in holland oh yes, oh, yes. said they she, she has, has without, without doubt, doubt taken, taken refuge, refuge in holland, in holland. The signora did not believe this, but she had certain reasons for encouraging the opinion, and this she did not fail to do. Thus the minds of the nuns became satisfied, but who can tell the torments of the signora's soul? Who can tell how many times a day the image of this sister came unbidden into her mind, and fastened itself there with terrible tenacity? Who can tell how many times she desired to behold the real and the living person for the company of this empty, impassable, terrible shade? Who can tell with what delight she would have heard the very words of the threat repeated in her mental ear, rather than this continual and fantastic murmur of those very words, sounding with a pertinacity of which no living voice could have been capable? It was about a year after this event that we find Lucy at the monastery, and under the protection of the signora. The reader may remember that after Agnes and the portress had left the room, the signora and Lucy had entered into conversation alone. The former continued her questions concerning Don Roderick, with a fearlessness which filled the mind of lucy with astonishment little supposing that the curiosity of the nuns ever exercised itself upon such subjects the opinions which were blended with these enquiries were not less strange she laughed at the dread which lucy expressed herself to have of don roderick asking her if he was not handsome and surmising that lucy would have liked him very well if it had not been for her preference of renzo when again with her mother the poor girl expressed her astonishment at such observations from such a source but Agnes, as more experienced, solved the mystery. "'Do not be surprised,' said she. "'When you have known the world as I have, you will cease to wonder at anything. The nobility, some more, some less, some one way, some another, have all a little oddity. We must let them talk, especially when we have need of them. We must appear to listen to them seriously, as if they were talking very wisely, did you not hear how she interrupted me, as if I had uttered some absurdity? I did not wonder at it. They are all so. Notwithstanding that, heaven be thanked, she seems to have taken a liking to you, and is willing to protect us. And if we would retain her favor, we must let her say that which it shall please her to say. A desire to oblige the superior, the complacency experienced in protecting, the thought of the good opinions which would be the result of a protection thus piously extended, a certain inclination towards Lucy, and also a degree of self-satisfaction in doing good to an innocent creature, in succoring and consoling the oppressed, had really disposed the signora to take to heart the fate of our poor fugitives. The mother and daughter congratulated themselves on their safe and honorable asylum. They would have wished to remain unknown to all, but this, in a convent, was impossible, and one there was, besides, too far interested in obtaining an account of one of the two simulated as his passion had been by the opposition he had encountered we will leave them for the present in their safe retreat and return to the palace of don roderick 
at the hour in which he was anxiously expecting the result of his wicked and villainous enterprise. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven. As a pack of bloodhounds, after having in vain tracked the hare, return desponding towards their master with their ears down and tails hanging, so in this night of confusion, returned the bravos to the palace of Don Roderick, who was pacing in the dark the floor of an upper uninhabited chamber, full of impatience and uncertainty as to the issue of the expedition and not without anxiety for the possible consequences. His ear was attentive to every sound, and his eye to every movement on the esplanade. This was the most daring piece of villainy he had ever undertaken, but he felt that the precautions he had used would preserve him from suspicion. And who will dare to come here, and ask if she is not in this palace? Should this young fellow do so, he will be well received. I promise him. Let the friar come, yeah let him come if the old woman pursue him so far she shall be sent to bergamo as for the law i do fear if not the podesta is neither a boy nor a fool pasha there is nothing to fear how will atelio be surprised to-morrow morning he will find i am not a mere boaster but if any difficulty should arise he will assist the honor of all my relatives will be pledged. But these anxious thoughts subsided as he reverted to Lucy. She will be frightened to find herself alone, surrounded only by those rough visages, by Bacchus. The most human face here is my own, and she will be obliged to have recourse to me, to entreaty. In the midst of these calculations, he heard a trampling of feet, approached the window, and looking out, exclaimed, It is they. But the litter, the devil, where is the litter? Three, five, eight, they are all here. But where is the litter? The devil Griso shall render me an account of this. He then advanced to the head of the stairs to meet Griso. Well, cried he, Signor Bully, Signor Captain, Signor, leave it to me. It is hard, said Griso. It is hard to meet with reproach when one has hazarded one's life to perform his duty. How has it happened? Let us hear, let us hear, said he as he advanced towards the room, followed by Griso, who related as clearly as he could the occurrences of the night. Thou hast done well, said Don Roderick. Thou hast done all thou couldst but to think that this roof harbors a spy. If I discover him, I will settle matters for him, and I will tell thee, Griso. I suspect the information was given the day of the dinner. I have had the same suspicion, said Griso. And if my master discovers the scoundrel, he has only to trust him to me. He has made me pass a troublesome night, and I wish to pay him for it. But there must be, I think, some other cause which we cannot at present fathom. Tomorrow, Signor, tomorrow we will see clear water. Have you been recognized by any one? Griso thought not, and after having given him many orders for the morrow and wishing to make amends for the impetuosity with which he had first greeted him, Don Roderick said, Go to rest, poor Griso. You must indeed require it, laboring all day and after night and then to be received in this manner go to rest now for we may yet be obliged to put your friendship to a severer test good night the next morning don roderick sought the count Attilio, who receiving him with a laugh said san martin i will pay the wager said don roderick i thought indeed to have surprised you this morning and therefore have kept from you some circumstances I will now tell you all. Uh, the friar's hand is in this business, said his cousin, after having heard him through. This friar, with his playing at Bo Peep, and giving advice. I know him for a busybody and a rascal. And you did not confide in me, and tell me what brought him here the other day to trifle with you. 
If I had been in your place, he should not have gone out as he came in. Of that be assured. What? Would you wish me to incur the resentment of all the Capuchins in Italy? In such a moment, said the Count, I should have forgotten there was any other Capuchin in the world than this daring rascal. But the means are not wanting within the pale of prudence to take satisfaction even of a Capuchin. It is well for him that he has escaped the punishment best suited to him. But I take him henceforth under my protection, and will teach him how to speak to his superiors. Do not make matters worse. Trust me for once. I will serve you as a relation and a friend. What do you mean to do? I don't know yet, but I will certainly pay the friar. Let me see. The Count, my uncle, who is one of the secret council, will do the service. Dear uncle, how pleased I am when I can make him work for me, a politician of his stamp. The day after tomorrow I will be at Milan, and in some way or other the fire shall have his due. Meanwhile breakfast was brought in, which, however, did not interrupt the important discussion. Count Attilio interested himself in the cause from his friendship for his cousin, and the honour of the name according to his notions of friendship and honour, yet he could hardly help laughing every now and then at the ridiculous issue of the adventure. But Don Roderick, who had calculated upon making a master-stroke, was vexed at his signal failure, and agitated by various passions. "'Fine stories will be circulated,' said he, "'of last night's affair. But no matter. As to justice, I defy it. It does not exist. And if it did, I should equally defy it. A propose I have sent word this morning to the constable to make no deposition respecting the affair, and he will be sure to follow my advice, but tattling always annoys me. It is enough that you have it in your power to laugh at me. It is well you have given the constable his message, said the Count. This great empty-headed obstinate proser of a podesta is, however, a man who knows his duty and we must be careful not to place him in difficulty. If a fellow of a constable makes a deposition, the podesta, however well-intentioned, is obliged to— But you, interrupted Don Roderick with a little warmth, you spoil my affairs by contradicting him and laughing at him on every occasion. Why the devil can't you suffer a magistrate to be an obstinate beast, while in other things that suit our convenience, he is an honest man. Do you know, Kazim? said the Count, regarding him with an expression of affected surprise. Do you know that I begin to think you capable of fear? You take the Podesta and myself to be in earnest. Well, well, have not you yourself said that we should be careful? Certainly, and when the question is serious, I will show you I am not a boy. Shall I tell you what I will do for you? I will go in person to make the Podesta a visit. Do you not think he will be pleased with the honour? And I will let him talk by the half-hour of the Camp Duke and the Spanish keeper of the castle. And then I will throw in some remarks about the Signor Count of the Secret Council, my uncle. You know what effect this will have. Finally, he has more need of our protection than you have of his condescension. He knows this well enough, and I shall leave him better disposed than I find him. That you may depend upon. So saying, he took his departure, leaving Don Roderick alone to wait the return of Grizo, who had been, in obedience to his orders, reconnoitering the ground, and ascertaining the state of the public mind with regard to the events of the preceding night. He came at last, at the hour of dinner, to give in his relation. The tumult of this night had been so loud, and the disappearance of three persons from the village so mysterious, that strict and indefatigable search would naturally be made for them. And on the other hand, those who were possessed of partial information on the subject were too numerous to preserve an entire silence. Perpetua was assailed everywhere, to tell what had caused her master such a fright, and she, perceiving how she had been deceived by Agnes, and feeling exasperated at her perfidy, had need of a little self-restraint. Not that she complained of the deception practiced on herself, of that she did not breathe a syllable, but the injury done to her poor master could not pass in silence, and that such an injury should have been attempted by such worthy people. Don Abondio could command and entreat her to be silent, and she could reply that there was no necessity for inculcating a thing so obvious and proper, 
but certain it is that the secret remained in the heart of the poor woman, as new wine in an old cask, which ferments and bubbles, and if it does not send the bung into the air, works out in foam between the staves, and drops here and there, so that one can drink it and tell what sort of wine it is. Gervas, who could scarcely believe that for once he knew a little more than others, and who felt himself a man, since he had been an accomplice in a criminal affair, was dying to communicate it. And Tony, however alarmed at the thoughts of further inquiries and investigation, was bursting in spite of all his prudence, till he had told the whole secret to his wife, who was not dumb. The one who spoke least was Menico, because his parents, alarmed at his coming into collision with Don Roderick, had kept him in the house for several days. They themselves, however, without wishing to appear to know more than others, insinuated that the fugitives had taken refuge at Pescarenico. This report, then, became current among the villagers, but no one could account for the attack of the bravos. All agreed in suspecting Don Roderick, but the rest was total obscurity. The presence of the three bravos at the inn was discussed, and the landlord was interrogated, but his memory was on this point as defective as ever. His inn, he concluded as usual, was just like a seaport. Who was this pilgrim, seen by Stefano and Carlandrea? and whom the robbers wished to murder, and had carried off. For what purpose had he been at the cottage? Some said it was a good spirit, come to the assistance of the inmates. Others that it was the spirit of a wicked pilgrim, who came at night to join such companions and perform such deeds as he had been accustomed to while living. Others, again, went so far as to conjecture that it was one of these very robbers, clothed like a pilgrim, so that Grizo, with all his experience, would have been at a loss to discover who it was, if he had expected to acquire this information from others. But, as the reader knows, that which was perplexity to them was perfect clearness to Grizo. He was enabled, therefore, from these various sources, to obtain a sufficiently distinct account for the ear of Don Roderick. He related the attempt upon Don Abondio, which accounted for the desertion of the cottage, without the necessity of imagining a spy in the palace. He told of their flight, which might be accounted for by the fear of the discovery of their trick upon Don Abondio, or by the intelligence that their cottage had been broken into, and that they had probably gone together to Pescarenico. Fled together? cried Don Roderick, hoarse with rage. Together? And this rascal friar? This friar shall answer it. Grizzo, this night I must know where they are. I shall have no peace. Ascertain if they are Pescarenico. Quick, fly. Four crowns immediately. And my protection forever. This rascal, this friar. Grizzo was once more in the field, and on the evening of this very day reported to his worthy master the desired intelligence, and by the following means. The good man by whom the little party had been conducted to Monza, returning with his carriage to Pescarenico at the hour of vespers, chanced to meet before he reached his home a particular friend, to whom he related in great confidence the good work he had accomplished, so that Grizzo could, two hours after, inform Don Roderick that Lucy and her mother had taken refuge in a convent of Monza, and that Renzo had proceeded on his way to Milan. Don Roderick felt his hopes revive at this separation, and having during great part of the night revolved in his mind the measures for effecting his wicked purpose he aroused grizo early in the morning and gave him the orders he had premeditated senor said grizo hesitating well have i not spoken clearly well if you would send some other how oh. most illustrious senor i am ready to sacrifice my life for my master and it is my duty to do so but you you would not desire me to place it in peril well your illustrious lordship knows well these few murders that are laid to my account and here i am under the protection of your lordship and in milan the livery of your lordship is known but in monza i am known and your lordship knows i do not say it boastingly he who should deliver me up to justice would be well rewarded a hundred good crowns and permission to liberate two banditti what the devil said don roderick you are like a vile cure who has scarce courage to rush at the legs of such as pass by the door and not daring to leave the house keeps himself within the protection of his master i think i have given proof senor said griso well well resumed griso boldly thus put on his medal your lordship must forget my hesitation heart of a lion legs of a hare i am ready to go but you shall not go alone take with you two of the best cut face and aim well and go boldly and show yourself to be still griso the devil people will be well content to let such faces as yours pass without molestation and as to the bailiffs of monza 
they must have become weary of life to place it in such danger for the chance of a hundred crowns but i do not believe that i am so far unknown there that the stamp of my service should pass for nothing griso having received ample and minute instructions took his departure accompanied by the two bravos cursing in his heart the whims of his master it now became the design of don roderick to contrive some way by which renzo separated as he was from lucy should be prevented from attempting to return he thought that the most certain means would be to have him sent out of the state but this required the sanction of the law he could for example give a colouring to the attempt at the curate's house and represent it as a seditious act and through dr adzeka garbulli give the podesta to understand that it was his duty to apprehend renzo but while he thought of the doctor as the man most suitable for this service renzo himself put an end to much further deliberation on the subject by withdrawing himself like the boy who drives his little indian pigs to the fold whose obstinacy impels them diverse ways and thus obliges him first to apply to one and then to another till he can succeed in penning them all so we are obliged to play the same game with the personages of our story having secured lucy we ran to don roderick him we now quit to give an account of renzo after the mournful parting which we have related he set out discouraged and disheartened on his way to milan to bid farewell to his home in his country and what was more to lucy to find himself among strangers not knowing where to rest his head and all on account of this villain when these thoughts presented themselves to the mind of renzo he was for the moment absorbed by rage and the desire of revenge but when he recollected the prayer that he had uttered with the good friar in the convent of pescarenico his better feelings prevailed and he was enabled to acquire some degree of resignation to the chastisements of which he stood so much in need the road lay between two high banks it was muddy stony and furrowed by deep wheel tracks which after a rain became rivulets overflowing the road and rendering it nearly impassable in such places small raised footpaths indicated that others had found a way by the fields renzo ascended one of these paths to the high ground whence he beheld as if rising from a desert and not in the midst of a city the noble structure of the cathedral and he forgot all his misfortunes in contemplating even at a distance this eighth wonder of the world of which he had heard so much from his infancy but looking back he saw on the horizon the notched ridge of mountains and distinctly perceiving among them his own risagone he gazed at it mournfully a while and then with a beating heart went on his way steeples towers cupolas and roofs soon appeared he descended into the road and when he perceived that he was very near the city he accosted a traveller with the civility which was natural to him will you be so good sir what do you want my good young man will you be so good as to direct me by the shortest way to the convent of the capuchins where father bonaventura resides he replied very affably my good lad there is more than one convent you must tell me more clearly what and whom you seek renzo then took from his bosom the letter of father christopher and presented it to the gentleman who after having read it returned it saying the eastern gate you are fortunate young man the convent you seek is but a short distance from this take this path to the left it is a byway and in a little while you will find yourself by the side of a long and low building that is the lazzaretto keep along the ditch that encircles it and you will soon be at the eastern gate enter and a few steps further on you will see before you an open square with fine elm trees the convent is there you cannot mistake it god be with you and accompanying his last words with a kind wave of his hand he proceeded on his way renzo was astonished at the good manners of the citizens to countrymen not knowing that it was an extraordinary day a day in which cloaks humbled themselves to doublets he followed the path which had been pointed out to him and arrived at the eastern entrance which consisted of two pilasters with a roofing above to secure the gates and on one side was a small house for the toll-gatherer the openings of the rampart descended irregularly and their surface was filled with rubbish the street of the suburb which led from this gate was not unlike the one which now opens from the toza gate a small ditch ran in the midst of it until within a few steps of the gate and divided it into two small crooked streets covered with dust or mud according to the season at the place where was and is still the collection of houses called the borghetto the ditch empties itself into a common sewer and thence into another ditch which runs along the walls at this point was a column with a cross on it dedicated to san dionigi to the right and left were gardens enclosed by hedges and at intervals small houses inhabited for the most part by washerwomen renzo passed through the gate without being stopped by the toll-gatherer which appeared to him very remarkable as he had heard those few of his townsmen who could boast of having been at milan relate wonderful stories of the strict search and close inquiries to which those were subjected who entered its gates the street was deserted and if he had not heard the humming of a crowd at a distance 
he might have thought he was entering a city which had been abandoned by its inhabitants. As he advanced, he saw on the pavement something scattered here and there, which was as white as snow, but snow at this season it could not be. He touched it, and found that it was flour. "'There must be a great plenty in Milan,' said he. "'If they thus throw away the gifts of God, they give out that famine is everywhere. This they do to keep poor people abroad quiet.' But in a few moments he arrived in front of the column, and saw on the steps of the pedestal certain things scattered, which were not assuredly stones, and which, if they had been on a baker's counter, he would not have hesitated to call loaves of bread. But Renzo dared not so easily trust his eyes, because truly this was not a place for bread. "'Let us see what this is,' said he, and approaching the column, he took one in his hand. It was, indeed, a very white loaf of bread, such as Renzo was accustomed to eat only on festival days. "'It is really bread,' said he in wonder do they scatter it thus here and in a year like this and do they suffer it to lie here and not to take the trouble to gather it this must be a fine place to live in after ten miles of travel in the fresh air of the morning the sight of the bread awaked his appetite uh, shall i take it said he again oh they have left it to the dogs surely a christian may take advantage of it and if the owner should come I can pay him at any rate. So saying, he put in one pocket that which he had in his hand, took a second and put it in the other, and a third which he began to eat, and resumed his way, full of wonder at the strangeness of the incident. As he moved on, he saw people approaching from the interior of the city, and his attention was drawn to those who appeared first, a man, a woman, and a boy, each with a load which seemed beyond their strength, and exhibiting each a grotesque appearance. Their clothes, or rather their rags, powdered with meal, their faces the same, and excessively heated. They walked, not only as if overcome by the weight, but as if their limbs had been beaten and bruised. The man supported with difficulty a great bag of flour, which, having holes here and there, scattered its contents at every unequal movement. But the figure of the woman was still more remarkable. She had her petticoat turned up, filled with as much flour as it could hold, and a little more, so that from time to time it flew over the pavement. She was indeed a grotesque picture, with her arms stretched out to encompass her burden, and staggering under its weight. Her bare legs were seen beneath it. The boy held with both hands a basket full of bread on his head, but he was detained behind his parents to pick up the loaves which were constantly falling from it. "'If you let another fall, you ugly little dog,' said the mother in a rage. "'I don't let them fall. They fall of themselves. How can I help it?' replied he. "'Eh, uh, it's well for thee that my hands are full,' resumed the woman. "'Come, come,' said the man. "'Now that we have a little plenty,' Let us enjoy it in peace. Meanwhile, there had arrived a company of strangers, and one of them addressed the woman. Where are we to go for bread? On, on, replied she, and added, muttering, These rascal countrymen will sweep all the shops and warehouses and leave none for us. There is a share for everyone, chatterer, said her husband. Plenty, plenty. From all that Renzo saw and heard, he gathered that there was an insurrection in the city, and that each one provided for himself in proportion to his will and strength. Although we would desire to make our poor mountaineer appear to the most advantage, historical truth obliges us to say that his first sentiment was that of complacency. He had so little to rejoice at in the ordinary course of affairs that he congratulated himself on a change of whatever nature it might be. And for the rest, he who was not a man superior to the age in which he lived, held the common opinion that the scarcity of bread had been caused by the speculators and bakers, and that any method would be justifiable of wresting from them the aliment which they cruelly denied to the people. However, he determined to keep away from the tumult, and congratulated himself on the good fortune of having for his friend a capuchin, who would afford him shelter and good advice. Occupied with such reflections, and noticing from time to time as more people came up loaded with plunder, he proceeded to the convent. The church and convent of the Capuchins was situated in the center of a small square, shaded by elm trees. Renzo placed in his bosom his remaining half-loaf, and with his letter in his hand approached the gate and rung the bell. At a small grated window appeared the face of a friar, porter to the convent, to ask, Who was that? One from the country who brings a letter to Father Bonaventura, from Father Christopher. Give here, said the friar, thrusting his hand through the grate. No, no said Renzo. I must give it into his own hands. He is not in the convent. Suffer me to enter and wait for him, replied Renzo. You had best wait in the church, said the friar. 
Perhaps that may be of service to you. Into the convent you do not enter at present. So saying, he hastily closed the window, leaving Renzo to receive the repulse with the best grace he could. He was about to follow the advice of the porter when he was seized with the desire to give a glance at the tumult. He crossed the square and advanced towards the middle of the city, where the disturbance was greatest. Whilst he is proceeding thither, we will relate as briefly as possible the causes of this commotion. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twelve. This was the second year of the scarcity. In the preceding one, the provisions, remaining from past years, had supplied in some measure the deficiency, and we find the population neither altogether satisfied nor yet starved but certainly unprovided for in the year 1628, the period of our story. Now this harvest, so anxiously desired, was still more deficient than that of the past year, partly from the character of the season itself, in that not only in the Milanese, but also in the surrounding country, and partly from the instrumentality of men. The havoc of the war, of which we have before made mention, had so devastated the state that a greater number of farms than ordinary remained uncultivated and deserted by the peasants, who, instead of providing by their labor bread for their families, were obliged to beg it from door to door. We say a greater number of farms than ordinary, because the insupportable taxes, levied with a cupidity and folly unequaled, the habitual conduct, even in time of peace, of the standing troops, conduct which the mournful documents of the age compare to that of an invading army, and other causes which we cannot enumerate, had for some time slowly operated to produce these sad effects in all the Milanese, the particular circumstances of which we now speak were, therefore, like the unexpected exasperation of a chronic disease. Hardly had this harvest been gathered, when the supplies for the army and the waste which always accompanies them caused an excessive scarcity, and with it its painful but profitable concomitant, a high price upon provisions. But this, attaining a certain point, always creates in the mind of the multitude a suspicion that scarcity is not in reality the cause of it. They forget that they had both feared and predicted it. They imagine all at once that there must be grain sufficient, and that the evil lies in an unwillingness to sell it for consumption. Preposterous as these suppositions were, they were governed by them, so that the speculators in grain, real or imaginary, the farmers, the bakers, became the object of their universal dislike. They could tell certainly where there were magazines overflowing with grain, and could even enumerate the number of sacks. They spoke with assurance of the immense quantity of corn which had been dispatched to other places, where probably the people were deluded with a similar story, and made to believe that the grain raised among them had been sent to Milan. They implored from the magistrate those precautions which always appear equitable and simple to the populace. The magistrates complied and fixed the price on each commodity, threatening punishment to such as should refuse to sell. Notwithstanding this, the evil continued to increase. This the people attributed to the feebleness of the remedies, and loudly called for some of a more decided character. Unhappily, they found a man that was willing to grant them all they should ask. In the absence of the governor, Don Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordova, who was encamped beyond Casale, in Monferrat, the high chancellor Antonio Ferrer, also a Spaniard, supplied his place in Milan. He considered the low price of bread to be in itself desirable and vainly imagined that an order from him would be sufficient to accomplish it. He fixed the limit, therefore, at the price the bread would have had when the corn was thirty-three livres the bushel, whereas it was now as high as eighty. Over the execution of these laws the people themselves watched, and were determined to receive the benefit of them quickly. They assembled in crowds before the bakers' houses to demand bread at the fixed price. There was no remedy. The bakers were employed night and day in supplying their wants, inasmuch as the people, having a confused idea that the privilege would be transient, ceased not to besiege their houses, in order to enjoy to the utmost their temporary good fortune. The magistrates threatened punishment. The multitude murmured at every delay of the bakers in furnishing them. These remonstrated incessantly against the iniquitous and insupportable weight of the burden imposed on them, but Antonio Ferrer replied that they had possessed great advantages in times past, and now owed the public some reparation. Finally, the Council of Ten, a municipal magistracy composed of nobles, which lasted until the ninety-seventh year of the century just elapsed, informed the governor of the state in which things were, hoping that he would find some remedy. Don Gonzalo, immersed in the business of war, named a council upon whom he conferred authority to fix a reasonable price upon bread, 
so that both parties should be satisfied. The deputies assembled, and after much deliberation felt themselves compelled to augment the price of it. The bakers breathed, but the people became furious. The evening preceding the day on which Renzo arrived at Milan, the streets swarmed with people, who, governed by one common feeling, strangers or friends, had intuitively united themselves in companies throughout the city. Every observation tended to increase their rage and their resentment. Various opinions were given and many exclamations uttered. Here, one declaimed aloud to a circle of bystanders, who applauded vehemently. There, another more cautious, but not less dangerous, was whispering in the ear of a neighbor or two that something must and would be done. In short, there was an incessant and discordant din from the medley of men, women, and children, which composed the various assemblages. There was now only required an impetus to set the machine in motion, and reduce words to deeds, and an opportunity soon presented itself. At the break of day, little boys were seen issuing from the baker's shops with baskets on their head, loaded with bread, which they were about to carry to their usual customers. The appearance of one of these unlucky boys in an assembly of people was like a squib thrown into a gunpowder mill. Here, Here is bread! bread cried a hundred voices at once. Yes, for our tyrants who swim in abundance and wish to make us die in hunger, said one who drew near the boy and seizing the basket cried out, Let us see. The boy colored, grew pale, trembled, and would have entreated them to let him pass on, but the words died on his lips. He then endeavored to free himself from the basket. Down, Down with, with the, the basket. basket! was heard on all sides. It was seized by many hands and placed on the earth. They raised the napkin which covered it, and a tepid fragrance diffused itself around. We are Christians also, said one, and have a right to eat bread as well as other people. So saying, he took a loaf and bit it. The rest followed his example, and it is unnecessary to add that in a few moments the contents of the basket had disappeared. Those who had not been able to secure any for themselves were irritated at the sight of their neighbor's gains, and, animated by the facility of the enterprise, went in search of other boys with baskets. As many, therefore, as they met were stopped and plundered. Still the number who remained unsatisfied was beyond comparison the greatest, and even the gainers were only stimulated by their success to ampler enterprises, so that simultaneously there was a shout from the crowd of, To, to the, the bakehouse! To the bakehouse! Bake bake In the street called the Corsia dei Servi there was, and is still, a bakery of the same name, a name that signifies in Tuscan the shop of the crutches, and a Milanese is composed of such barbarous words that it is impossible to discover their sound from any rule of the language. To this place the throng approached. The shopkeepers were listening to the sad relation of the boys, who had but just escaped with their lives, when they heard a distant murmur and beheld the crowd advancing. Shut! Shut! shut. shut. Quick, quick, quick! Quick! Some ran to ask aid from the sheriff. Others in haste closed the shop, and barricaded and secured the doors from within. The throng thickened in front, and cries of, Bread! Bread! bread. bread. Open! 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 were heard from every quarter. The sheriff arrived with a troop of halberdiers. Make way, make way, make way, make way friends, friends. Home, 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 make, make way, way for the sheriff. sheriff, cried they. The people gave way a little so that they could draw themselves up in front of the door of the shop. But friends, cried the sheriff from this place, what do you do here? Home, home, have you no fear of God? What will our lord the king say? We do not wish you harm, but go home. There is no good to be gained here for soul or body. Home! Home! The crowd, regardless of his expostulations, pressed forward, themselves being urged on by increasing multitudes behind. Make them draw back that I may recover breath, continued he to the halberdiers. But harm no one. We will endeavour to get into the shop. Make them keep back and knock at the door. Back! Back! back cried the halberdiers, presenting the butt-ends of their arms. The throng retreated a little, the sheriff knocked, crying to those within to open. They obeyed, and he and his guard contrived to entrench themselves within the house, then appearing at a window above. Friends, cried he, go home, a general pardon to whoever shall return immediately to their houses. Bread, bread, bread. Open, 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 vociferated the crowd in reply. You shall have justice, friends, but return to your houses. You shall have bread, but this is not the way to obtain it. Eh? What are you doing below there? At the door of the house? Ha! Ha! Take care, it is a criminal act. Eh? Away with those tools. Take down those hands. 
Ha! Ha! You Melanies, who are famous throughout the world for your benevolence, who have always been accounted good sit- Ah! Rascals! This rapid change of style was occasioned by a stone thrown by one of these good citizens at the sheriff's head. Rascals! Rascals! Continued he, closing the window in a rage. The confusion below increased. Stones were thrown at the doors and windows, and they had nearly opened a way into the shop. Meanwhile, the master and the boys of the shop, who were at the windows of the story above, with a supply of stones, obtained probably from the courtyard, threatened to throw them upon the crowd if they did not disperse. Perceiving their threats to be of no avail, they commenced putting them in execution. Ah, ah villains! Ah, ah rogues! rogues. Is, Is this the bread, the bread you give to the, to the poor? poor? Was screamed from below. Many were wounded, two were killed, the fury of the multitude increased. The doors were broken open, and the torrent rushed through all the passages. At this, those within took refuge under the shop floor. The sheriff and the halberdiers hid themselves beneath the tiles. Others escaped by the skylights and wandered upon the roofs like cats. The sight of their prey made the conquerors forget their designs of sanguinary vengeance. Some rushed to the chests and plundered them of bread. Others hastened to force the locks of the counter and took from thence handfuls of money, which they pocketed and then returned to take more bread, if there should remain any. Others again entered the interior magazines and, throwing out part of the flour, reduced the bags to a portable size. Some attacked a kneading trough and made a booty of the dough. A few had made a prize of a bolting cloth, which they raised in the air as in triumph, and, in addition to all, men, women, and children were covered with a cloud of white powder. While this shop was so ransacked, none of the others in the city remained quiet or free from danger, but at none had the people assembled in such numbers as to be very daring. In some, the owners had provided auxiliaries and were on the defensive. In others, the owners less strong in numbers and more affrighted endeavored to compromise matters. They distributed bread to those who crowded around their shops and thus got rid of them. And these did not depart so much because they were content with the acquisition as from fear of the halberdiers and the officers of justice, who were now scattered throughout the city in companies sufficient to keep these little bands of mutineers in subjection. In the meantime, the tumult and the crowd increased in front of the unfortunate bakery, as the strength of the populace had here the advantage. Things were in this situation, when Renzo, coming from the eastern gate, approached without knowing it the scene of tumult. Hurried along by the crowd, he endeavored to extract from the confused shouting of the throng some more positive information of the real state of affairs. "'Now the infamous imposition of these rascals is discovered,' said one. "'They said there was neither bread, flour, nor corn. Now we know things just as they are, and they can no longer deceive us.' "'I tell you that all this answers no purpose,' said another. "'It will do no good unless justice be done to us.' Bread will be cheap enough, tis true, but they will put poison in it to make the poor die like flies. They have already said we are too numerous. I know they have. I heard it from one of my acquaintances, who was a friend of a relation of a scullion of one of the lords. Make way! Make way, gentlemen, I beseech you! Make way for a poor father of a family who is carrying bread to five children! This was said by one who came staggering under the weight of a bag of flour. Aye, said another in an undertone to one of his companions. I am going away. I am a man of the world, and I know how these things go. These clowns who now make so much noise will prove themselves cowards to-morrow. I have already perceived some among the crowd who are taking note of those who are present, and when all is over, they will make up the account, and the guilty will pay the penalty. He who protects the bakers, cried a sonorous voice which attracted the attention of Renzo, is the superintendent of provisions. There are roaches, said a neighbor. Yes, but he is the chief, replied the one who had first spoken. The superintendent of provisions, elected every year by the governor from a list of seven nobles formed from the Council of Ten, was the president of the Court of Provision, which, composed of twelve nobles, had with other duties that of superintending the corn for the citizens. Persons in such a station would naturally, in times of starvation and ignorance, be considered as the authors of all the evil. "'Cheats!' exclaimed another. "'Can they do worse? They have had the audacity to say that the High Chancellor is a childish old man, and they wish to take the government into their own hands. We ought to make a great coop and let them in, to feed upon dry peas and cockleweed, as they would fain have us do.' While listening to such observations as the above, Renzo continued to make his way through the crowd, and at last arrived in front of the bakery. 
on viewing its dilapidated and ruinous state after the assault just sustained. This cannot be a good deed, thought he. If they treat all the bakehouses in this manner, where will they make bread? From time to time, some were seen issuing from the house, loaded with pieces of chess or troughs or a bench, basket, or some other relic of the poor building, and crying, Make, make way, way! Make, make way, way, way! Passed through the crowd. These were all carried in the same direction, and, it appeared, to a place agreed upon. Renzo's curiosity being excited, he followed one who carried a bundle of pieces of board and chips on his shoulder, and found that he took the direction of the cathedral. On passing it, the mountaineer could not avoid stopping a moment to gaze with admiring eyes on the magnificent structure. He then quickened his steps to rejoin him whom he had taken as a guide, and, keeping behind him, they drew near the middle of the square. The crowd was here more dense, but they opened a way for the carrier, and Renzo, skillfully introducing himself in the void left by him, arrived with him in the very midst of the multitude. Here there was an open space, in the center of which was a bonfire, a heap of embers, the remains of the tools mentioned above. Surrounding it was heard a clapping of hands and a stamping of feet, the tumult of a thousand cries of triumph and imprecation. He of the boards threw them on the embers, and some, with pieces of half-burnt shovel, stirred them until the flame ascended, upon which their shouts were renewed louder than before. The flames sank again, and the company, for want of more combustibles, began to be weary when a report spread that at the Corduzio, a square or crossway not far from there, they were besieging a bakery. Then was heard on all sides, Let, Let us, us go! go! Let, us, Let go! us go! And the crowd moved on. Renzo was drawn along with the current, but in the meanwhile held counsel with himself whether he had not best withdraw from the fray and return to the convent in search of Father Bonaventura, but curiosity again prevailed, and he suffered himself to be carried forward, with the determination, however, of remaining a mere spectator of the scene. The multitude passed through the short and narrow street of Pescaria, and thence by the crooked arch to the Square de Mercanti. Here there were very few who, in passing before the niche that divides towards the centre of the terrace of the edifice, then called the College of Doctors, did not give a slight glance at the great statue contained in it of Philip the Second, who even from the marble imposed respect, and who, with his arm extended, appeared to be menacing the populace for their rebellion. This niche is now empty and from a singular circumstance. About one hundred and sixty years after the events we are now relating, the head of the statue was changed, the scepter taken from its hand, and a dagger substituted in its place, and beneath it was written, Marcus Brutus. Thus inserted, it remained perhaps a couple of years, until one day some persons who had no sympathies with Marcus Brutus, but rather an aversion to him, threw a rope around the statue, pulled it down, and, reducing it to a shapeless mass, dragged it, with many insulting gestures, beyond the walls of the city. Who would have foretold this to Andrea Bifi when he sculptured it? From the Square dei Mercanti, the clamorous troop at length arrived at the Corduzio. Each one immediately looked towards the shop, but instead of the crowd of friends which they expected to find engaged on its demolition, there were but a few at a distance from the shop, which was shut and defended from the windows by armed people. They fell back and there was a murmur through the crowd of unwillingness to risk the hazard of proceeding, when a voice was heard to cry aloud, Nearby is the house of the superintendent of provision. Let us do justice and plunder it. There was a universal acceptance of the proposal, and To the, to the superintendent! To the superintendent! was the only sound that could be heard. The crowd moved with unanimous fury towards the street where the house, named in such an evil moment, was situated. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. The unfortunate superintendent was at this moment painfully digesting his miserable dinner whilst awaiting anxiously the termination of this hurricane. He was, however, far from suspecting that its greatest fury was to be spent on himself. Some benevolent persons hastened forward to inform him of his urgent peril. The servants, drawn to the door by the uproar, beheld in a fright the dense mass advancing. While they listened to the friendly notice, the vanguard appeared. One hastily informed his master, and while he for a moment deliberated upon flight, another came to say that there was no longer time for it. In hurry and confusion they closed and barricaded the windows and doors. The howling without increased. Each corner of the house resounded with it, and in the midst of the vast and mingled noise was heard— fearfully and distinctly, the blows of stones upon the door. The tyrant! The tyrant! The causer of famine! We must have him, living or dead! 
The poor man wandered from room to room in a state of insupportable alarm, commending himself to God and beseeching his servants to be firm, and to find for him some way of escape. He ascended to the highest floor, and, from an opening between the garret and the roof, he looked anxiously out upon the street, and beheld it filled with the enraged populace. More appalled than ever, he withdrew to seek the most secure and secret hiding-place. Here, concealed, he listened intently to ascertain if at any time the importunate transport of passion should weaken, if the tumult should in any degree subside. But his heart died within him to hear the uproar continue with aggravated and savage ferocity. Renzo at this time found himself in the thickest of the confusion, not now carried there by the press, but by his own inclination. At the first proposal of bloodshedding, he felt his own curdle in his veins. As to the plundering, he was not quite certain whether it was right or wrong, but the idea of murder caused him unmixed horror. And although he was greatly persuaded that the vicar was the primary cause of the famine, the grand criminal, still, having at the first movement of the crowd, heard by chance some expressions which indicated a willingness to make any effort to save him, he had suddenly determined to aid such a work, and had therefore pressed near the door, which was assailed in a thousand ways. Some were pounding the lock to break it in pieces, others assisted with stakes and chisels and hammers, others again tore away the plastering, and beat in pieces the wall in order to effect a breach. The rest, who were unable to get near the house, encouraged by their shouts those who were at the work of destruction. Though fortunately, through the eagerness with which they pressed forward, they impeded its progress. The magistrates, who were the first to have notice of the fray, dispatched a messenger to ask military aid of the commander of the castle, which was then called, from the gate, Jovia. And he forthwith detached a troop, which arrived when the house was encompassed with the throng, and undergoing its tremendous assault, was therefore obliged to halt at a distance from it, and at the extremity of the crowd. The officer who commanded it did not know what course to pursue. At the order to disperse and make way, the people replied by a deep and continued murmur, but no one moved. To fire on the crowd appeared not only savage but perilous, inasmuch as the most harmless might be injured, and the most ferocious only irritated, and prepared for further mischief, and moreover his instructions did not authorize it. To break the crowd and go forward with his band to the house would have been the best, if success could have been certain. But who could tell if the soldiers could proceed united in an order? The irresolution of the commanders seemed to proceed from fear. The populace were unmoved by the appearance of the soldiers, and continued their attacks on the house. At a little distance there stood an ill-looking, half-starved old man, who, contracting an angry countenance to a smile of diabolical complacency, brandished above his hoary head a hammer, with which he said he meant to nail the vicar to the posts of his door, alive as he was. "'Oh, shame, shame!' exclaimed Renzo. "'Shame! Would you take the hangman's business out of his hand? To assassinate a Christian? How can you expect God will give us bread if we commit such iniquity? He will send us his thunders, and not bread.' "'Ah, dog! Ah, traitor to the country!' cried one who had heard these words, turning to Renzo with the countenance of a demon. "'It is a servant of the vicus, disguised like a countryman. It is a spy!' A hundred voices were heard exclaiming, "'Who is it? Where is he?' "'A servant of the vicar's, a spy, the vicar himself, escaping in the disguise of a peasant.' "'Where is he? Where is he?' Renzo would have shrunk into nothingness. Some of the more benevolent contrived to help him to disappear through the crowd. But that which preserved him most effectually was a cry of, "'Make way! Here comes our help! Make way!' which attracted the attention of the throng." This was a long scaling ladder supported by a few persons who were endeavouring to penetrate the living mass, and by which they meant to gain entrance to the house. But happily this was not easy of execution. The length of the machine precluded the possibility of its being carried easily through such a multitude. It came, however, just in time for Renzo, who profited by the confusion and escaped to a distance with the intention of making his way, as soon as he could, to the convent, in search of Father Bonaventura. Suddenly a new movement began at one extremity, and diffused itself through the crowd. Fair, 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 resounded from every side. Some were surprised, some rejoiced, some were exasperated, some applauded, some affirmed, some denied, some blessed, some cursed. Is he here? It is not true. It is not true. Yes, yes, long live Ferrer, he who makes bread cheap. No, no. He's here, here in the carriage. Why does he come? We don't want him. Ferrer! Long live Ferrer, the friend of the poor. He comes to take the vicar prisoner. No, no, we would revenge ourselves. We would fight our own battles. Back, 
Back. Yes, yes, Thera. Let him come to prison with the vicar. At the extremity of the crowd, on the side opposite to that where the soldiers were, Antonio Ferrer, the high chancellor, was approaching in his carriage, who, probably condemning himself as the cause of this commotion, had come to avert at least its most terrific and irreparable effects, to spend worthily a popularity unworthily acquired. In popular tumults, there are always some who, from heated passion or fanaticism or wicked design, do what they can to push things to the worst, proposing and promoting the most barbarous counsels, and assisting to stir the fire whenever it appears to slacken. But on the other hand, there are always those who, perhaps with equal ardor and equal perseverance, employ their efforts for the production of contrary effects, some led by friendship or partiality for the persons in danger, others without other impulse than that of horror of bloodshed and atrocity. The mass, then, is ever composed of a mixed assemblage, who, by indefinite gradations, hold to one or the other extreme, prompt to rage or compassion, to adoration or execration, according as the occasion presents itself for the development of either of these sentiments. Life and death are the words involuntarily uttered and with equal facility. And he who succeeds in persuading them that such a one does not deserve to be quartered has but little more to do to convince them that he ought to be carried in triumph. While these various interests were contending for superiority in the mob before the house of the vicar, the appearance of Antonio Ferrer gave instantly a great advantage to the humane, who were manifestly yielding to the greater strength of the ferocious and bloodthirsty. The man himself was acceptable to the multitude, from his having previously favored their cause, and from his heroic resistance to any arguments against it. Those already favorably inclined towards him were now much more affected by the courageous confidence of an old man, who, without guards or retinue, came thus to confront an angry and stormy multitude. The announcement that his purpose was to take the vicar prisoner produced at once a wonderful effect, and the fury against that unhappy person, which would have been aggravated by any attempt at defiance or refusal of concession, now with the promise of satisfaction, and to speak in the Milanese fashion, with this bone in the mouth, became in a degree appeased, and gave place to other opposite sentiments, which began to prevail over their minds. The partisans of peace, having recovered breath, aided Ferrer in various ways, those who were near him, while endeavoring by their own to perpetrate the general applause, sought at the same time to keep off the crowd, so as to open a passage for the carriage. Others applauded and repeated his words, or such as appeared appropriate to his undertaking and his peril, imposed silence on the obstinately furious, or contrived to turn against them the anger of the fickle assembly. Who is it that will not say, Long live Ferrer? You don't wish bread to be cheap, then, eh? They are rogues who are not willing to receive justice at the hands of a Christian, and there are some among them who cry louder than the rest to allow the vicar to escape. To prison with the superintendent. Long live Ferrer! Make way for Ferrer! The numbers of those who spoke in this manner increasing continually, the numbers of the opposite party diminished in proportion, so that the former, from admonishing, had recourse to blows, in order to silence those who were still disposed to pursue the work of destruction. The menaces and threatenings of the weaker party were of no longer avail. The cause of blood had ceased to predominate, and in its place were heard only the cries of Prison! Prison justice! Fair! The rebellious spirits were finally silenced. The remainder took possession of the door in order to defend it from fresh attacks, and also to prepare a passage for Ferrer, and some among them called to those within, openings were not wanting, that succor had arrived, and that the vicar must get ready. To go quickly! To prison! Hem! Do you hear? Is this the Ferrer who helps in making the proclamations? Asked Arenzo of one of his new neighbors, remembering the vidit Ferrer that the doctor had shown him appended to the famous proclamation, and which he had reiterated in his ears with so great a degree of pertinacity. The same, the High Chancellor, replied he. He is a worthy man, is he not? He is more than worthy. It is he who has lowered the price of bread against the wishes of others in power, and now he comes to carry the vicar to prison because he has not acted justly. It is unnecessary to say that Renzo's feelings were immediately enlisted on the side of Ferrer. He was desirous to approach near him, but the undertaking was no easy one. However, with the decision and the strength of a mountaineer, he continued to elbow himself through the crowd and finally reached the side of the carriage. The carriage had already penetrated into the midst of the crowd, but was here suddenly stopped by one of those obstructions, the unavoidable consequence of a journey like this. The aged Ferrer presented, now at one window of his carriage, now at the other, a countenance full of humility, of sweetness, and benevolence, 
a countenance which he had always kept in reserve for the day in which he should appear before Don Philip the Fourth, but he was constrained to make use of it on this occasion. He spoke, but the noise and buzzing of so many voices and the shouts of applause which they bestowed on him allowed but little of his discourse to be heard. He had recourse also to gestures, now placing his fingers on his lips, to take from thence a kiss which his enclosed hands distributed to the right and left, as if to render thanks for the favor with which the public regarded him. Then he extended them, waving them slowly beyond the window, as if to entreat a little space, and now again lowering them politely, as if to request a little silence. When he had succeeded in obtaining in some measure his last request, those who were nearest to him heard and repeated his words. Bread! Abundance! I come to do justice. A little space, if you please. Then, as if stifled and suffocated with the press, and the continual buzzing of so many voices, he threw himself back in the carriage, and with difficulty drawing a long breath, said to himself, Por mi vida, que gente. Long live Ferrer! There is no occasion for fear. You are a brave man. Bread! Bread! Yes, bread! Bread! replied Ferrer. In abundance, I promise you, I do. Placing his hand on his heart. Clear a passage for me, added he, then, in the loudest voice he could command. I come to carry him to prison, to inflict on him a just punishment. And he added in a very low tone. Si es culpable. Then, leaning forward to the coachman, he said hastily, Adelante, Pedro, si puedes. The coachman smiled also on the people with an affected politeness, as if he were with some great personage, and with ineffable grace he waved the whip slowly from right to left, as if requesting his inconvenient neighbors to retire a little on either side. Be so kind, gentlemen, said he. A little space, ever so little, just enough to let us pass. Meanwhile, the most active and officious employed themselves in preparing the passage so politely requested. Some made the crowd retire from before the horses with good words, placing their hands on their breast and pushing them gently. There, there, a little space, gentlemen. Others pursued the same plan at the sides of the carriage, so that it might pass on without damage to those who surrounded it, which would have subjected the popularity of Antonio Ferrer to great hazard. Renzo, after having been occupied for a few moments in admiring the respectable old man, a little disturbed by vexation, overwhelmed with fatigue, but animated by solicitude, embellished, so to speak, by the hope of resting a fellow creature from the pains of death, Renzo, I say, threw away all idea of retreat. He resolved to assist Ferrer in every way that lay in his power, and not to abandon him until he had accomplished his designs. He united with the others to free the way, and he was certainly not one of the least active or industrious. A passage was opened. Come on! Come on! said a number of them to the coachman, retiring in front of the crowd to maintain the passage clear. Adelante, presto, con juicio, said his master also to him, and the carriage moved forward in the midst of the salutes which he lavished promiscuously on the public. Ferrer, with a smile of intelligence, bestowed particular thanks upon those whom he beheld busily employed for him. More than one of these smiles was directed to Renzo, who, in truth, deserved them richly, serving the High Chancellor on this day with more devoted zeal than the most intrepid of his secretaries. The young mountaineer was delighted with his condescension, and proud of the honor of having, as he thought, formed a friendship with Antonio Ferrer. The carriage, once in motion, continued in its way with more or less slowness, and not without being frequently brought to a full stop. The space to be traversed was short, but, with respect to the time it occupied, it would have appeared interminable, even to one not governed by the holy motive of Ferrer. The people thronged around the carriage to right and left, as dolphins around a vessel hurried forward by a tempest. The noise was more piercing and discordant than that of a tempest itself. Ferrer continued to speak to the populace the whole length of the way. Yes, gentlemen, bread in abundance. I will conduct him to prison. He shall be punished. She es culpable. Yes, Yes, I will order it so. Bread shall be cheap. A uh, si es, so it shall, I mean. The king, our master, does not wish his faithful subjects to suffer from hunger. Oh, oh, guardaos, take care that we do not hurt you, gentlemen. Pedro, adelante, con juicio. Abundance, abundance, a little space for the love of heaven. Bread, bread. To prison! To prison! 
What do you want? demanded he of a man who had thrust himself partly within the window to howl at him some advice or petition or applause, no matter what. But he, without having heard the question, had been drawn back by another, who saw him in danger of being crushed by the wheel. Amidst all this clamor, Ferrer at last gained the house, thanks to his kind auxiliaries. Those who had stationed themselves there had equally labored to procure the desired result, and had succeeded in dividing the crowd in two and keeping them back, so that between the door and the carriage there should be an empty space, however small. Renzo, who, in acting as a scout and a guide, had arrived with the carriage, was able to find a place, whence he could, by making a rampart of his powerful shoulders, see directly all that passed. Ferrer breathed again on seeing the place free, and the door still shut, or, to speak more correctly, not yet open. However, the hinges were nearly torn from their fastenings, and the panels shivered in many pieces, so that an opening was made, through which it could be seen that what held it together was the bolt, which, however, was almost twisted from its socket. Through this breach, someone cried to those within to open the door. Another ran to let down the steps of the carriage, and the old man descended from it, leaning on the arm of this benevolent person. The crowd pressed forward to behold him. Curiosity and general attention caused a moment's silence. Ferrer stopped an instant on the steps, turned towards them, and putting his hands to his heart, said, Bread and justice. Clothed in his toga, with head erect and step assured, he continued to descend, amid the loud applause that rent the skies. In the meanwhile, the people of the house had opened the door so as to permit the entrance of so desired a guest, taking care, however, to contract the opening to the space his body would occupy. Quick, quick, said he, open so that i may enter and you brave men keep back the people do not let them come behind me for the love of heaven open away for us presently hey hey gentlemen one moment said he to the people of the house softly with this door let me pass oh my ribs take care of my ribs shut now no my gown my gown it would have remained caught within the door if ferrer had not hastily withdrawn it the doors, closed in the best manner they could be, were nevertheless supported with bars from within. On the outside, those who had constituted themselves the bodyguard of Ferrer worked with their shoulders, their arms, and their voice to keep the place empty, praying from the bottom of their hearts that they would be expeditious. Quick, quick, said Ferrer as he reached the portico, to the servants who surrounded him, crying, May your excellency be rewarded. What goodness! Great God, what goodness! Quick, quick, repeated Ferrer. Where is this poor man? The superintendent descended the stairs, half led, half carried by his domestics, and pale as death. When he saw who had come to his assistance, he sighed deeply, his pulse returned, and a slight color tinged his cheek. He hastened to meet Ferrer, saying, I am in the hands of God and your excellency. But how go hence? We are surrounded on all sides by people who desire my death. Venga conmigo, Stid, and take courage. My carriage is at the door. Quick, quick. He took him by the hand, and continuing to encourage him, led him towards the door, saying in his heart, however, Aquí está el bocilis. Dios nos valga. The door opened. Ferrer appeared first. The superintendent followed, shrinking with fear and clinging to the protecting toga as an infant to the gown of its mother. Those who had maintained the space free raised their hands and waved their hats, making in this manner a sort of cloud to conceal the superintendent from the view of the people, and to enable him to enter the carriage and place himself out of sight. Ferrer followed, and the carriage was closed. The people drew their own conclusions as to what had taken place, and there arose, in consequence, a mingled sound of applauses and imprecations. The return of the carriage might seem to be even more difficult and dangerous, but the willingness of the public to suffer the superintendent to be carried to prison was sufficiently manifest, and the friends of Ferrer had been busy in keeping the way open, whilst he was at the house, so that he could return with a little more speed than he went. As it advanced, the crowd, ranged on either side, closed and united their ranks behind it. Ferrer, as soon as he was seated, whispered the superintendent to keep himself concealed in the bottom of the carriage, and not to let himself be seen for the love of heaven. There was, however, no need of this advice. It was the policy of the High Chancellor, on the contrary, to attract as much of the attention of the populace as possible, and during all this passage, as in the former, he harangued his changeable auditory with a great quantity of sound, and very little sense, interrupting himself continually, to breathe into the ear of his invisible companion a few hurried words of Spanish. Yes, gentlemen, bread and justice. To the castle, 
to prison under my care thanks thanks a thousand thanks no no he shall not escape por ablandarlos it is too just we will examine we will see i wish you well a severe punishment esto lo digo por su bien a just and moderate price and punishment to those who oppose it keep off a little i pray you yes yes i am the friend of the people he shall be punished it is true he is a villain a rascal perdone usted he shall be punished he shall be punished si es culpable yes yes we will make the bakers do that which is just long live the king long live the good milanese his faithful subjects animo estamos ya casi afuera they had in fact passed through the thickest of the throng and were rapidly advancing to a place of safety and now ferrer gave his lungs a little repose and looking forward beheld the succors from pisa those spanish soldiers who had at last rendered themselves of service by persuading some of the people to retire to their homes and by keeping the passage free for the final escape upon the arrival of the carriage they made room and presented arms to the high chancellor who bowed to the right and left and to the officer who approached the nearest to salute him he said accompanying his words with a wave of his hand besos de las manos which the officer interpreted to signify you have given me much assistance he might have appropriately added chedant arma togai but the imagination of ferrer was not at this moment at liberty to occupy itself with quotations and moreover they would have been addressed to the wind as the officer did not understand latin pedro felt his accustomed courage revive at the sight of these files of muskets so respectfully raised and recovering entirely from his amazement he urged on his horses without deigning to take further notice of the few who were now harmless from their numbers levantese levantese estamos ya fuera said ferrer to the superintendent who reassured by the cessation of the tumult the rapid motion of the carriage and these words of encouragement drew himself from his corner and overwhelmed his liberator with thanks the latter after having condoled with him on account of his peril and rejoiced at his deliverance exclaimed ah que dirá de esto su excelencia who is already weary of this cursed casale because it will not surrender que dirá el conde duque who trembles if a leaf makes more noise than usual que dirá el rey nuestro señor who must necessarily be informed of so great a tumult and is it at an end dios lo sabe ah as for me i will have nothing more to do with it said the superintendent i wash my hands of it i resign my office into the hands of your excellency and i will go and live in a cavern on a mountain as a hermit far very far from this savage people usted will do that which is best por el servicio de su majestad replied the high chancellor gravely his majesty does not desire my death replied the superintendent yes yes in a cavern in a cavern far from these cruel people it is not known what became of this project as after conducting the poor man in safety to his castle our author makes no farther mention of him end of chapter 13 chapter 14 of the betrothed by alessandro manzoni translated by george william fenshaw this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 14 the crowd began to disperse some went home to take care of their families some wandered off from the desire to breathe more freely after such a squeeze and others sought their acquaintances to chat with them over the deeds of the day the other end of the street was also thinning so that the detachment of spanish soldiers could without resistance advance near the superintendent's house in front of it there still remained so to speak the dregs of the commotion a company of the seditious who discontented with so lame and impotent a conclusion of that which promised so much muttered curses at the disappointment and united themselves in knots to consult with each other on the possibility of yet attempting something and to afford themselves proof that this was in their power they attacked and pounded the poor door which had been propped up anew from within at the arrival of the troop however their valour diminished and without further consultation they dispersed leaving the place free to the soldiers who took possession in order to serve as a guard to the house and road 
but the streets and small squares of the vicinity were full of little gatherings. Where three or four individuals stopped, twenty were soon added to them. There was a confused and constant babbling. One narrated with emphasis the peculiar incidents of which he had been the witness. Another related his own feats. Another rejoiced that the affair had ended so happily, loaded Ferrer with praises, and predicted serious consequences to the superintendent, to which another still replied that there was no danger of it, because wolves do not eat wolves. Others, in anger, muttered that they had been duped, and that they were fools to allow themselves to be deceived in this manner. Meanwhile the sun had set, and twilight threw the same indistinct hue over every object. Many, fatigued with the day, and wearied with conversing in the dark, returned to their houses. Our hero, after having assisted the carriage as far as was necessary, rejoiced when he beheld it in safety, and as soon as it was in his power left the crowd, so that he might once more breathe freely. Hardly had he taken a few steps in the open air, when he experienced a reaction after such excitement, and began to feel the need of food and repose. He therefore looked upward on either side in search of a sign which might hold out to him the prospect of satisfying his wants, as it was too late to think of going to the convent. Thus, walking with his eyes directed upward, he stumbled on one of these groups, and his attention was attracted by hearing them speak of designs and projects for the morrow. It appeared to him that he, who had been such a laborer in the field, had a right to give his opinion. Persuaded from all he had witnessed during the day that, in order to secure the success of an enterprise, it was only necessary to gain the cooperation of the populace, "'Gentlemen,' cried he in a tone of exordium, "'allow me to offer my humble opinion. My humble opinion is this. It is not only in the matter of bread that iniquity is practiced. And since we have discovered to-day that we have only to make ourselves heard to obtain justice, we must go on until we obtain redress for all their other knavish tricks, until we compel them to act like Christians. Is it not true, gentlemen, that there is a band of tyrants who reverse the Tenth Commandment, who commit injuries on the peaceful and the poor, and in the end make it out that they act justly. And even when they have committed a greater villainy than usual, they carry their heads higher than ever. There are some such even in Milan. Too many, said a voice. I say it, I do, resumed Renzo. It has even reached our ears. And then the thing speaks for itself. By way of illustration, let us suppose one of those to whom I allude to have one foot in Milan and the other elsewhere. If he is a devil there, will he be an angel here? Tell me, gentlemen, have you ever seen one of these people with a countenance like Ferrer's? But what renders their practices more wicked, I assure you, that there are printed proclamations against them in which their evil deeds are clearly pointed out and a punishment assigned to each and it is written whoever he be ignoble and plebeian etc etc but go now to the doctors scribes and pharisees and demand justice according to the proclamation they listen to you as the pope does to rogues it is enough to make an honest man turn rascal <laughs> It is evident that the king and those who govern would willingly punish the villains. But they can do nothing, because there is a league among them. We must break it up, then. We must go tomorrow to Ferrer, who is a good, worthy man. It is plain how delighted he was today to find himself among the poor, how he tried to hear what was said to him, and how kindly he answered them. We must go then to Ferrer and inform him how things are situated, and I, for my part, can tell him something that will astonish him. I, who have seen with my own eyes a proclamation, with ever so many coats of arms at the head of it, and which had been made by three of our rulers. Their names were printed at the bottom, and one of these names was Ferrer. This I saw with my own eyes. Now this proclamation was exactly suited to my case, so that I demanded justice from the doctor, since it was the desire of these three lords, among whom was Ferrer, in the eyes of this very doctor, who had himself shown me this fine proclamation. I appeared to be a madman. 
I am sure that when this dear old man shall hear these doings, especially in the country, he will not let the world go on in this manner, but will quickly find some remedy. And then they themselves, if they issue proclamations, they should wish to see them obeyed, for it is an insult, an epitaph with their name, if counted for nothing. And if the nobility will not lower their pretensions, and cease their evil doings, we must compel them as we have done today. I do not say that he should go in his carriage to take all the rascals to jail. It would need Noah's Ark for that. He must give orders to those whose business it is, not only at Milan, but elsewhere, to put the proclamations in force, to enter an action against such as have been guilty of those iniquities, and where the edict says prison, then prison, where it says the galleys, the galleys, and to say to the various podesta that they must conduct themselves uprightly, or they shall be dismissed and others put in their place. And then, as I say, we will be there also to lend a helping hand, and to command the doctors to listen to the poor, and talk reasonably. Am I not right, gentlemen? Renzo had spoken so vehemently that he had attracted the attention of the assembly, and, dropping by degrees all other discourse, they had all become his listeners. A confused clamor of applause, eh? Bravo! Certainly. Assuredly. He is right. It is but too true. Followed his harangue. Critics, however, were not wanting. It is a pretty thing indeed, said one, to listen to a mountaineer. They are all lawyers. Now, muttered another, every barefooted fellow will give his opinion, and with this rage for meddling we shall at last not have bread at a low price, and that is all that disturbs us. Compliments, however, were all that reached the ears of Renzo. They seized his hands and exclaimed, We will see you again tomorrow. Where? On the square of the cathedral. Yes, very well. And something shall be done. Something shall be done. Which of these good gentlemen will show me an inn where I may obtain refreshment and repose for the night? Said Renzo. I am the one for your service, worthy youth said one, who had listened to the sermon very attentively, but had not yet opened his mouth. I know an inn that will suit you exactly. I will recommend you to the keeper, who is my friend, and moreover a very honest man. Nearby? Not very far off. The assembly dissolved, and Renzo, after many shakes of the hand from persons unknown, followed his guide, adding many thanks for his courtesy. It is nothing, it is nothing, said he. One hand washes the other, and both the face. We ought to oblige our neighbor. As they walked along, he put many questions to Renzo by way of discourse. It is not from curiosity, nor to meddle with your affairs, but you appear to be fatigued. From what country do you come? All the way from Lecco. All the way from Lecco. All the way from Lecco? Are you from Lecco? From Lecco, that is to say, from the province. Poor youth, from what I have understood of your discourse, it appears you have been hardly treated. Ah, uh, my dear worthy man, I have been obliged to use much skill in speaking, not to make the public acquainted with my affairs, but it is enough that they will one day be known. And then? But I see here a sign. And by my faith, I don't wish to go farther. No, no, come to the place I told you of. It is but a short distance off. You will not be well accommodated here. Oh, yes, uh, I am not a gentleman accustomed to delicacies. Anything to satisfy my hunger, and a little straw will answer my purpose. That which I have most at heart is to find them both very soon under providence and he entered a large gate, from which hung a sign of the full moon. "'Well, I will conduct you here, since you desire it,' said the unknown, and Renzo followed him. "'There is no necessity for troubling you longer,' replied Renzo. "'But,' he added, "'do me the favor to go in and take a glass with me.' "'I accept your obliging offer,' said he, and preceding Renzo as being more accustomed to the house, 
he entered a little courtyard, approached a glass door, and opening it, advanced into the kitchen with his companion. It was lighted by two lamps suspended from the beam of the ceiling. Many people, all busy, were seated on the benches which surrounded a narrow table, occupying almost all one side of the apartment. At intervals, napkins were spread and dishes of meat, cards played and dice thrown, and bottles and wine glasses amid them all. Berlinghe, Reali, and Parpaiole were also scattered in profusion over the table, which, could they have spoken, would probably have said, we were this morning in a baker's counter, or in the pocket of some spectator of the tumult, who, occupied with public affairs, neglected the care of private affairs. The confusion was great. A boy ran to and fro, busily engaged in attending to the dinner and gaming tables. The host was seated on a low bench under the mantel-tree of the chimney, apparently occupied in tracing figures in the ashes with the tongs, but in reality deeply attentive to all that passed around him. He raised his head at the sound of the latch, and turned towards the newcomers. When he saw the guide, "'Curse the fellow,' said he to himself. "'He must always be under my feet, when I wish him at the devil.' Casting a rapid glance towards Renzo, he continued, "'I know you not. But if you come with such a hunter, you are either a dog or a hare. When you shall have spoken a few words, I shall know which of the two you are.' Nothing of this mute soliloquy could be traced, however, in the countenance of the host, who was motionless as a statue. His eyes were small and without expression, his face fat and shining, and his short and thick beard of a reddish hue. "'What are your orders, gentlemen?' said he. First, a good flagon of wine,' said Renzo. "'And then something to eat.' So saying, he threw himself on a bench at one end of the table, and uttered a loud and sonorous, "'Ah!' as if to say, it is a good thing to sit down after having been so long on one's feet. But recollecting the table at which he had been seated the evening before with Agnes and Lucy, he sighed deeply. The host brought the wine. His companion had seated himself opposite to him. Renzo filled a glass for him, saying, To wet your lips. And another for himself, which he swallowed at a draught. And what can you give me to eat? Said he, addressing the host. A good piece of stewed meat, replied he. Well, sir, a good piece of stewed meat. You shall be served immediately, said the host, and calling to the boy. Serve this gentleman, but, resumed he, turning again to Renzo. I have no bread today. As for bread, said Renzo in a loud voice and laughing. Providence has provided that. And he drew forth the third and last loaf picked up under the cross of San Dionigi, and holding it up, cried, Here is the bread of providence. At this exclamation, many of the company turned round, and seeing his trophy in the air, one of them cried, Bread forever at a low price. At a low price? said Renzo. Gratis et amore. Better still, better still. But, added he, I do not wish these gentlemen to think evil of me. I have not stolen it. I have found it on the ground, and if I could find the owner, I am ready to pay him. Bravo! 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 bravo cried they, laughing louder still, not imagining that he was in earnest. They think that I jest, but it is really so, said Renzo to his guide, and turning the bread in his hand. See how they have formed it. You would call it a cake, but they were so packed one on the other. If there were any with the crust a little tender, one might know they were fresh. Then devouring three or four mouthfuls of the bread, he washed them down with another glass of wine, adding, The bread will not go down alone. My throat was never so dry. A glorious uproar we made. Prepare a good bed for this young man, said the guide. He is going to pass the night here. Do you wish to sleep here? said the host to Renzo, approaching the table. Certainly I shall be content with any bed, provided the sheets are white, for although poor, I am accustomed to cleanliness. Oh, as to that, said the host. So saying, he went to his counter, which was in a corner of the kitchen, and returned, bringing in his hand paper, pen, and ink. What does this mean? Swallowing a piece of the stew which had been placed before him, and smiling with an air of surprise. Is that the white sheet? The host, without replying, placed the pen on the table, and himself in an attitude to write, 
and with the pen in his hand leaning towards Renzo, he said, Do me the favor to tell me your name and country. What? said Renzo. What has this to do with the bed? I do my duty, said the host, looking at the guide. We are obliged to give an exact account of all who lodge at our house. Name and surname, and from what country they are, why they are here, if they have arms, and how long they expect to remain in the city. These are the very words of the proclamation. Before answering, Renzo emptied another glass. It was the third, but I fear for the future we shall not find it possible to count them. Aha! exclaimed he. You have the proclamation. Well, I pride myself on being a doctor of laws, and I know what importance is attached to proclamations. I speak in earnest, said the host, looking again at the mute companion of Renzo. In returning to his desk, he drew from it a large sheet of paper which he unfolded before Renzo as an exact copy of the proclamation. Ah, there it is, cried he, quickly emptying the contents of the glass, which he held in his hand. Ah, there it is, the fine sheet. I rejoice to see it. I know these arms. I know what this pagan head means, with a noose around its neck. The proclamations of that time were headed by the arms of the governor, and in those of Don Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordova was seen a Moorish king chained by the throat. This face means, command who can, and obey who will. When the Señor Don shall have been sent to the galleys well well i know what i would say i have seen another leaf just like this when he shall have so taken measures that an honest young man can without molestation marry her to whom he is betrothed and by whom he is beloved then i will tell my name to this face and will give him a kiss in the bargain I may have very good reasons for not telling my name. It's a fine thing, truly. And if a robber who might have under his command a band of villains, because if he were alone... He hesitated a moment, finishing the phrase with a gesture, and then proceeded. If a robber wished to know who I was, in order to do me some evil turn, I ask you if that face would move from the paper to help me. Am I obliged to tell my business? Truly this is something new. Suppose, for instance, that I have come to Milan to confess. I would wish to do it to a Capuchin father, and not to the landlord of an inn. The host kept silence, looking at the guide, who appeared not to notice anything that passed. Renzo, it grieves us to say, swallowed another glass and continued. I will give you reasons enough to satisfy you, my dear host. If those proclamations which speak favorably of good Christians are worth nothing, those which speak unfavorably are worth less than nothing. Take away, then, all these encumbrances, and bring in exchange another flagon, because this one is broken. So saying, he struck it lightly with his hand, adding, Don't you hear how it is cracked? The discourse of Renzo had again attracted the general attention of the company, and when he concluded, there was a general murmur of applause. "'What must I do?' said the host, looking at the strange companion, who was, however, no stranger to him. "'Yes, yes, yes,' yes. cried many of the company. "'This countryman is right. They are vexatious impositions.' "'New laws today, new laws today!' The stranger took advantage of the noise to say to the host, in a tone of reproach for his too abrupt demand, "'Leave him to his own way a little.' Do not raise a disturbance. I have done my duty, said the host aloud. And secured myself, continued he, lowering his voice. And that is all I care for. He removed the pen, ink, and paper, and gave the empty flagon to the boy. Bring me the same kind of wine, said Renzo. For it suits my taste exactly, and we will send it to sleep with the other, without asking its name, surname, nor what is its business, nor whether it is going to remain long in this city. Of the same kind, said the host to the boy, giving him the flagon and returning to his seat by the chimney. He is no other than a hare, thought he, raking in the ashes. And in what hands art thou fallen, poor silly youth? If you will drown, drown, but the host of the full moon will not go halves with thy folly. 
Renzo returned thanks to his guide, and to all those who had taken his side. Worthy friends, said he, I know that honest people support each other. Then striking the table and placing himself in the attitude of an orator. Is it not an unheard of thing, cried he, that those who govern must always introduce paper, pen, and ink, always the pen in hand. Such a passion for the pen. Eh, young and worthy stranger, would you know the reason? Said one of the gamesters, laughing. Let us hear it, replied Renzo. The reason is, as these lords eat geese, they have so many quills they know not what to do with them. Oho, said Renzo. You are a poet. You have poets here, then. I have also a vein for poetry, and I sometimes make verses but it is when things go on well. To comprehend this witticism of poor Renzo, it is necessary to be informed that in the eyes of the vulgar of Milan, and more particularly in its environs, the name of poet did not signify, as among cultivated people, a sublime genius, an inhabitant of Pindus, a pupil of the Muses, but a whimsicality and eccentricity in discourse and conduct, which had more of singularity than sense, and an absurd resting of words from their legitimate signification. But I will tell the true reason, added Renzo. It is because they themselves hold the pen, and therefore they do not record their own words. But let a poor man speak. They are very attentive, and in a moment, there it is, in black and white for some future occasion. They are cunning also, and when they want to perplex a poor youth who does not know how to read, but who has a little i know well beating his forehead with his hand and pointing to it with his finger to make himself understood and when they perceive that he begins to comprehend the difficulty they throw into the conversation some latin to make him lose the thread of their argument to put him at his wit's end to confuse his brains this custom must be broken up today everything has been done after the people's fashion without paper pen and ink to-morrow if they know how to conduct themselves we shall do still better without hurting a hair on any one's head all in the way of justice in the meanwhile some of the company had engaged again in play and some in eating some went away others came in their place the unknown guide continued to remain and without appearing to have any business to detain him lingered to talk a little more with renzo and resumed the conversation about bread. If I had control, I would order things better, said he. What would you do? said Renzo, endeavoring to exhibit every appearance of attention. What would I do? Everyone should have bread, the poor as well as the rich. Ah, that is right. See how I would do. I would fix a reasonable rate within the ability of everyone. Then bread should be distributed according to the number of mouths, because there are gluttons who would seize all they can get for themselves and leave the poor still in want. We must then divide it. And how shall we do this? Why, in this way. Give a ticket to every family in proportion to the mouths to authorize them to get bread from the bakers. For example, they give me a ticket expressed in this manner. Ambrose Fusella by trade a sword cutler, with a wife and four children, all old enough to eat bread, mind that. He must be furnished with so much bread at such a price. But the thing must be done in order, always with regard to the number of mouths. For instance, they should give you a ticket for your name? Lorenzo Ramagino, said the young man, who, enchanted with the project, did not reflect that it all depended on pen, ink, and paper, and that the first point towards its success was to collect the names of the persons to be served. Very well, said the unknown. But have you a wife and children? I ought to have. Children, no, not yet, but a wife, if people had acted as their duty required. Ah, you are single. Then have patience. They will only give you a smaller portion. That is but just. But if soon, as I hope, by the help of God, uh, enough, suppose I have a wife. Then the ticket must be changed and the portion increased, as I have said, according to the mouths. 
replied the unknown, rising. That would be very good, cried Renzo, thumping the table with his fist. And why don't they make such a law? How can I tell you? Meanwhile, I wish you good night, as my wife and children must have been expecting me this long while. Another drop, another drop, filling his glass and endeavoring to force him to sit down again. Another drop. But his friend contrived to disengage himself, and leaving Renzo, pouring forth a torrent of entreaties and reproaches, he departed. Renzo continued to talk until he was in the street, and then fell back on his seat. He looked at the glass which he had filled to the brim, and, seeing the boy pass before the table, he beckoned to him, as if he had something particular to communicate. He pointed to the glass, and with a tone of solemnity, said, See there, I prepared it for that worthy man. You see, it is full, as it should be for a friend. But he would not have it. Sometimes people have singular ideas. However, I have shown my good will. But now, since the thing is done, it must not be lost. So saying, he emptied it at one draught. I understand, said the boy, moving off. You understand too, do you? It is true. When the reasons are sufficient. Here we have need of all our love of truth to induce us to pursue faithfully our hero's history. At the same time, this same impartiality leads us to inform the reader that this was his first error of a similar character, and precisely because he was so unaccustomed to merrymaking did this prove so fatal. The few glasses of wine which he swallowed so rapidly, contrary to his custom, partly to cool his throat and partly from an exaltation of spirits, which deprived him of the power of reflection, went immediately to his head. Upon a habitual drinker it would have produced no visible effect. Our author observes this, that temperate and moderate habits have this advantage, that the more a man practices them, the more he finds a departure from them to be disagreeable and inconvenient, so that his fault itself serves as a lesson to him for the future. However this may be, when these first fumes had mounted to the brain of Renzo, wine and words continued to flow without rule or reason. He felt a great desire to speak, and for a while his words were arranged with some degree of order. But by little and little he found it difficult to form a connected sentence. The thoughts which presented themselves to his mind were cloudy and indistinct, and his expressions, in consequence, unconnected and obscure, to relieve his perplexity by one of those false instincts which, under similar circumstances, lead men to the accomplishment of their own ruin, he had recourse to the flagon. We will relate only a few of the words which he continued to ejaculate during the remainder of this miserable evening. Ah, host, host! resumed he, following him with his eye around the table, or gazing at him where he was not, and taking no notice of the noise of the company. Host that thou art! I cannot swallow it, this request of name, surname, and business. To a peaceable youth like me, you have not behaved well. What satisfaction, what advantage, what pleasure to put a poor youth on paper? Am I not right? Speak, gentlemen. Hosts should stand by good fellows. Listen, listen, host. I wish to make a comparison for you. For the reason. <laughs> they laugh, do they? I am a little gay, I know, but the reasons, I say, are just. Tell me, if you please, who is it that brings custom to your house? Poor young men, is it not? Do these lords, they of the proclamations, ever come here to wet their lips? They are all water drinkers, said the one who sat near Renzo. They wish to keep possession of their understanding so as to tell lies skillfully, added another. Ah! cried Renzo. That is the poet who spoke. Then hear my reasons. Answer me, host. Ferrer, who is the best of all of them, has he ever been here to drink the health of any one, and to spend so much as a farthing? And this dog of an assassin, this don, uh, I must be silent, because I am too much in the humor of babbling. Ferrer, the father cre I know are two honest men. But there are few honest men. The old are worse than the young, and the young are much worse than the old. I am glad there is no bloodshed. These are things we must leave to the hangman. Bread. Oh, yes, for that I have had many a thrust. But I have also given some. Make way, abundance, vivat. And Ferrer, too, some words in Latin. 
si es barraros tropa lorum ah cursed fault vivat justice bread ah those are good words we had need of them when we heard that curse tone 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 and then again tone 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 the question was not of flight but hold the signor curate to uh, i i know what i am thinking of at these words he hung down his head and remained for a time as if absorbed by some new imagination then sighing deeply he raised it again and looked up with such a mournful and silly expression as excited the amusement of all around in short he became the laughing-stock of the whole company not that they were all perfectly sober but to say truth they were so in comparison with poor renzo they provoked and angered him with silly questions and with mock civilities sometimes he pretended to be offended then without noticing them at all spoke of other things then replied then interrogated and always wide of the mark by good fortune in his folly he seemed from instinct to avoid pronouncing the names of persons so that the one most deeply graven in his memory was not uttered we should have been sorry ourselves if this name for which we feel so much love and respect had passed from mouth to mouth and been made a theme of jesting by these vulgar and degraded wretches end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the betrothed by alessandro manzoni translated by george william fenshaw this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter fifteen the host seeing that the game was about to be carried too far approached renzo and entreating the others to be quiet endeavoured to make him understand that he had best go to bed but our mountaineer could think of nothing but name surname and proclamations yet the words bed and sleep repeated frequently in his ear made at last some impression and producing a sort of lucid interval made him feel that he really had need of both the little sense that remained to him enabled him to perceive that the greater part of the company had departed and with his hands resting on the table before him he endeavoured to stand on his feet his efforts would have been however unavailing without the assistance of the host who led him from between the table and the bench and taking a lantern in one hand managed partly to lead and partly to drag him to the stairs and thence up the narrow staircase to the room designed for him at the sight of the bed he endeavoured to look kindly upon the host but his eyes at one time sparkled at another disappeared like two fireflies he endeavoured to stand erect and stretched out his hand to pat the shoulder of his host in testimony of his gratitude but in this he failed however he did succeed in saying worthy host i see now that you are an honest man but i don't like your rage for name and surname happily i am also the host who did not expect to hear him utter one connected idea and who knew from experience how prone men in his situation were to sudden changes of feeling wishing to profit by this lucid interval made another attempt my dear fellow said he in a tone of persuasion i have not intended to vex you nor to pry into your affairs what would you have had me do there is a law and if we innkeepers do not obey it we shall be the first to be punished therefore it is better to conform and after all as regards yourself what is it a hard thing indeed just to say two words it is not for them but to do me a favour now here between ourselves tell me your name and then you shall go to bed in peace ah rascal knave cried renzo do you dare to bring up this cursed name and surname and business again hush you fool and go to bed said the host but renzo continued to bellow i understand it you belong to that league wait wait till i settle matters for you and turning to the door he bellowed down the stairs friends the host is of the i spoke in jest cried the host pushing him towards the bed in jest did you not perceive i spoke in jest ah in jest now you talk reasonably since you said it in jest they are just the thing to make a jest of and he fell on the bed undress yourself quickly said the host and adding his assistance to his advice the thought occurred to him to ascertain if there were any money in renzo's pockets as on the morrow it would fall into hands from which an innkeeper would have but little chance of recovering it he therefore hazarded another attempt saying to renzo 
You are an honest youth, are you not? Yes, an honest youth, replied Renzo, still endeavouring to rid himself of his clothes. Well, settle this little account with me now, because tomorrow I am obliged to leave home on business. That's right, said Renzo. I am honest, but the money, uh, we must find the money. Here it is, said the host, and calling upon all his patience and skill, he succeeded in obtaining the reckoning. Lend me your hand to finish undressing, host, said Renzo. I begin to comprehend. Uh, do you see that I am very sleepy? The host rendered him the desired service, and covering him with the quilt, bade him, Good night. The words were scarcely uttered before poor Renzo snored. The host stopped to contemplate him a moment by the light of his lantern. Mad blockhead, said he to the poor sleeper. Thou hast accomplished thy own ruin. Dancers who want to travel over the world without knowing where the sun rises, to entangle themselves with affairs they know nothing of, to their own injury and that of their neighbour. So saying, he left the apartment, having locked the door outside, and calling to his wife, told her to take his place in the kitchen. Because, said he, I must go out for a while, thanks to a stranger who is here, unhappily for me. He then briefly related the annoying circumstance, adding, And now, keep an eye on all, and above all be prudent. There is below a company of dissolute fellows, who, between drink and their natural disposition, are very, very free of speech. Enough, if any of them should dare. Oh, I am not a child. I know what I ought to do. It could never be said. Well, well, be careful to make them pay. If they talk of the superintendent of provision, the governor, Ferrer, and the Council of Ten, and the gentry, and Spain and France, and other follies, pretend not to hear them, because if you contradict them, it may go ill with you now, and if you argue with them, it may go ill with you hereafter. And take care, when you hear any dangerous remarks, turn away your head and call out, Coming, sir! I will endeavour to return as soon as possible. So saying, he descended with her into the kitchen, put on his hat and cloak, and taking a cudgel in his hand, departed. As he walked along the road, he resumed the thread of his apostrophe to poor Renzo. Headstrong mountaineer! For that Renzo was such had been manifest from his pronunciation, countenance, and manners, although he vainly tried to conceal it. On a day like this, when by dint of skill and prudence I had kept my hands clean, you must come at the end of it to spoil all I have done. Are there not inns enough in Milan that you must come to mine? At least, if you had been alone... I would have winked at it for to-night, and made you understand matters to-morrow. But no, my gentleman must come in company, and, to do the thing better, in company with an informer. At this moment he perceived a patrol of soldiers approaching. Drawing on one side to let them pass, and eyeing them askance, he continued, There go the fool punishes, and thou, great booby, because thou sawest a few people making a little noise, thou must think the world was turned upside down. And on this fine foundation thou hast ruined thyself, and would have ruined me. I have done all I could to save thee. Now thou must get thyself out of trouble. As if I wanted to know thy name from curiosity. What was it to me whether it were Thaddeus or Bartholomew? I have truly great satisfaction in taking a pen in my hand. I know well enough that there are proclamations which are disregarded, just as if we had need of a mountaineer to tell us that. And dost thou not know, thou fool? What would be done to a poor innkeeper, who should be of thy opinion, since upon them the proclamation bear hardest, and should not inform himself of the name of any one who did him the favour to lodge at his house? Under penalty of whoever the above said hosts, tavern keepers, and others, of three hundred crowns. Behold, three hundred crowns hatched, and now to spend them well. Two thirds to be applied to the royal chamber, and the other third to the accuser or informer. And in case of inability, five years in the galleys, and greater pecuniary and corporal punishments at the discretion of his excellency. Very much obliged for such favours indeed. He ended his soliloquy, finding himself at his destined point, the palace of the Capitano di Giustizia. There, as in all the offices of the secretaries, there was a great deal of business going on. On all sides, persons were employed in issuing orders to ensure the peace the following day, to take from rebellion every pretext, to cool the audacity of those who were desirous of fresh disorders, and to concentrate power in the hands of those accustomed to exercise it. The number of the soldiers who protected the house of the superintendent was increased. 
The ends of the streets were defended by large pieces of timber thrown across them. The bakers were ordered to bake bread without intermission. Expresses were sent to all the surrounding villages, with orders to send corn into the city, and at every baker's some of the nobility were stationed, to watch over the distribution and to restrain the discontented by fair words and the authority of their presence. But to give, as they said, a blow to the hoop, and another to the cask, and increase the efficacy of their caresses by a little awe, they took measures to seize some of the seditious, and this was the principal duty of the Capitano di Giustizia. His bloodhounds had been in the field since the commencement of the tumult, and this self-styled Ambrose Fusella was a police officer in disguise, who, having listened to the famous sermon of Renzo, concluded him to be fair game. Finding that he had but newly arrived from his village, he would have conducted him immediately to prison, as the safest inn in the city. But in this, as we have seen, he did not succeed. He could, however, carry to the police certain information of his name, surname, and country, besides many other conjectures, so that when the host arrived to tell what he knew of Renzo, their knowledge was already more precise than his. He entered the accustomed hall, and gave in his deposition that a stranger had come to lodge at his house, who would not tell his name. "'You have done your duty in giving us the information,' said a notary, laying down his pen. "'But we know it already.' That is very singular, thought the host. You must have a great deal of cunning. And we know also, continued the notary, this famous name. The devil, the name also. How do they know that? Thought the host again. But, resumed the notary with a serious air, you do not tell all. What is there more to tell? Ah, ah. We know well that this man carried to your house a quantity of of stolen bread, bread acquired by theft and sedition. A man comes with bread in his pocket. Am I to know where he got it? If it wasn't my deathbed, I can say I only saw him have one loaf. Thus it is. You are always excusing and defending yourselves. If we were to take your word for it, you are all honest people. How can you prove that this bread was honestly acquired? Why need I prove it? It is nothing to me. I am an innkeeper. You cannot, however, deny that this, your customer, had the audacity to complain of the proclamations and make indecent jokes on the arms of His Excellency. Pardon me, Signor. How could he be my customer when I never saw him before? It was the devil, saving your presence, who sent him to my house. If I had known him, there would have been no need of asking his name, as your honour knows. However, in your inn, and in your presence, seditious and inflammatory conversation has been held. Your customers have been riotous, clamorous, and complaining. How would your honour expect me to pay attention to the absurdities uttered by a parcel of brawlers? I attend only to my own affairs, for I am a poor man. And then your honour knows that those who are lavish of their tongue are often lavish of their fists, especially when there are many together. Yes, yes. They may have their way now. Tomorrow, tomorrow, we will see if the heat is dislodged from their brains. What do you think? I don't know. That the mob will become masters in Milan? Certainly. You shall see. You shall see. I understand. I know the king will always be the king, but he who has taken anything will keep it. Naturally, a poor father of a family has no desire to give back. Your honours have the power that belongs to you. Have you still some people at your house? A number. And this, your customer, what is he about? Is he still labouring to excite the people to sedition? This stranger, your honour means, he has gone to sleep. Then you have a number? Well, be careful not to let them go away. Am I to play the constable? Thought the host, but said nothing. Return to your house. And be prudent, resumed the notary. I have always been prudent. Your honour can say that I have never made any disturbance. Well, well. But do not think that justice has lost its power. I? Good heavens! I think nothing! I am an innkeeper. The same old tune. Have you nothing more to say? What else would your honour have me say? Truth is one. Well, you have done enough for today. But tomorrow we will see. You must give more full information and answer all questions that shall be put to you. 
What information have I to give? I know nothing. I have hardly brains enough to attend to my own affairs. Take care not to let him go away. I hope your honour will remember that I have done my duty. Your honour's humble servant. On the following morning, Renzo was still in a sound and deep sleep, when he was suddenly roused by a shaking of the arms, and by a voice at the foot of the bed, crying, Lorenzo Tramolina. He sat up, and, rubbing his eyes, perceived a man clothed in black standing at the foot of his bed, and two others, one on each side of the bolster. Between surprise, sleep, and the fumes of the wine, he remained a moment stupefied, believing himself to be still dreaming. Ah, you have heard at last. Lorenzo Tramolino, said the man in black, the notary of the preceding evening. Up, up, get up, and come with us. Lorenzo Tramolino, said Renzo Tramolino. What does this mean? What do you want with me? Who has told you my name? Few words, and get up quickly, said one of the men at his side, seizing him by the arm. Oh, what violence is this? cried Renzo, drawing away his arm. Host! Oh, host! Shall we carry him off in his shirt? said one of the officers, turning to the notary. Did you hear what he said? said he to Renzo. We will do so, if you do not rise quickly and come with us. Why? demanded Renzo. You will hear that from the Capitano di Giusizza. I am an honest man. I have done nothing. I am astonished. So much the better for you. So much the better for you. In two words, you will be dismissed, and then go about your affairs. Let me go now, then. There is no reason why I should go before the Capitano. Come, let us finish this business, said an officer. We shall be obliged to carry him off, said the other. Lorenzo Tremolino, said the notary. How does your honor know my name? Do your duty said he to the men, who attempted to draw Renzo from the bed. Oh, don't touch me. I can dress myself. Dress yourself then, and get up, said the notary. I will, said Renzo, and he gathered his clothes, scattered here and there on the bed, like the fragments of a shipwreck on the coast. Whilst engaged in the act of dressing, he continued. But I will not go to the Capitano de Ducizia. I have nothing to do with him. Since you put this affront on me, I wish to be conducted to Ferrer. I am acquainted with him. I know he is an honest man, and he is under obligations to me. Yes, yes, my good fellow. You shall be conducted to Ferrer, replied the notary. In other circumstances, he would have laughed heartily at the absurdity of such a proposition, but he felt that this was not a moment for merriment. On his way to the inn, he had perceived so many people abroad, such as stirring, some collecting in small quantities, others gathering in crowds, that he was not able to determine whether they were the remnants of the old insurrection not entirely suppressed, or the beginnings of a new one. And now, without appearing to do so, he listened, and thought the buzzing increased. He felt haste to be of importance, but he did not dare to take Renzo against his will, lest, finding himself in the street, he might take advantage of public sympathy and endeavor to escape from his hands. He made a sign to his officers to be patient, and not exasperate the youth, whilst he himself sought to appease him with fair words. Renzo, meanwhile, began to have a confused recollection of the events of the preceding day, and to comprehend that the proclamation's name and surname were the cause of all this trouble. But how the devil did the man know his name? And what the devil had happened during the night, that they should come to lay hands on one who, the day before, had such a voice in the assembly, which could not be yet dispersed, because he also heard a growing murmur in the street. He perceived also the agitation which the notary vainly endeavored to conceal, therefore to feel his pulse and clear up his own conjectures, as well as to gain time, he said, I comprehend the cause of all this. It is on account of the name and surname. Last night, tis true, I was a little merry. These hosts have such treacherous wine— and you know often when wine passes through the channel of speech it will have its say too but if that is all the difficulty i am ready to give you every satisfaction besides you know my name already who the devil told it to you bravo my good fellow bravo replied the notary in a tone of encouragement you see you are in the right and you must 
believe that I am also. I am only following my trade. You are more tractable than others. It is the easiest way to get out of the difficulty quickly with such an accommodating spirit. You will soon be set at liberty, but my hands are tied, and I cannot release you now, although I would wish to do so. Be of good courage and come on boldly when they see who you are, and I will tell them, leave it to me. Quick, quick, my good fellow. Ah, you cannot. I understand, said Renzo. Shall we pass by the square of the cathedral? Where you choose, we will go the shortest road, that you may be the sooner at liberty, said he, inwardly cursing his stars at being unable to follow up this mysterious demand of Renzo's, which might have been made the subject of a hundred interrogatories. Miserable that I am, thought he. Here is a fellow fallen into my hands, who likes no better fun than to prate. Were there but a little time, he would confess all in the way of friendly discourse, without the aid of rope, ay, and without perceiving it too, but that he should fall into my hands at such an unlucky moment. Well, it can't be helped, thought he, while turning his head and listening to the noise without. There is no remedy. This will be a hotter day than yesterday. That which gave rise to this last thought was an extraordinary uproar in the street, which tempted him to open the window and reconnoitre. There was a concourse of citizens, who, at the order given them by the patrol to separate, had resisted for a while, and then moved off on all sides in evident discontent. It was a fatal sign to the eyes of the notary that the soldiers treated them with much politeness. He closed the window, and remained for a moment undecided whether he should conduct the enterprise to an end, or, leaving Renzo in the care of the bailiffs, go himself to the Capitano di Giustizia and relate the whole difficulty. But, thought he, you will tell me I am a poltroon, a coward, and that it was my business to execute orders. We are at the ball, we must dance, it seems. Cursed crowd, what a damned business. He, however, addressed Renzo in a tone of kind entreaty. Come, my worthy fellow, do let us be off and make haste. Renzo, however, was not without his thoughts. He was almost dressed, with the exception of his doublet, into the pockets of which he was fumbling. Oh, said he, regarding the notary significantly. Oh, I had a letter and some money here once, sir. When these formalities are over, all shall be faithfully restored to you. Come, come, let us be off. No, 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 said Renzo, shaking his head. That won't do. I must have what belongs to me, sir. I will render an account of my actions, but I must have what belongs to me. I will show you that I have confidence in you. Here they are. And now make haste, said the notary, drawing from his bosom the sequestered goods, and consigning them with something like a sigh to Renzo, who muttered between his teeth as he put them in his pocket. You have so much to do with thieves, that you have learned the trade. If I get you one safe out of the house, you shall pay this with interest, thought the notary. As Renzo was putting on his hat, the notary made a sign to the officers that one of them should go before, and the other follow the prisoner. And as they passed through the kitchen, and whilst Renzo was saying, And this blessed host, where has he fled? They seized, one his right hand, the other the left, and skillfully slipped over his wrists hand fetters, as they were called, which, according to the custom of the times, consisted of a cord a little longer than the usual size of the fist, which had at the two ends two small pieces of wood. The cord encircled the wrist of the patient. The captor held the pegs in his hand, so that he could, by twisting them, tighten the cord at will, and this enabled him not only to secure the prisoner, but also to torment him, if restless, and, to ensure this more effectually, the cord was full of knots. Renzo struggled and exclaimed, What treachery is this to an honest man? But the notary, who had fair words prepared for every occasion, said, Be patient. They only do their duty. What would you have? It is a mere ceremony. We cannot treat people as we would wish. If we do not obey orders, we shall be worse off than you. Be patient. As he spoke, the two operators twisted the pegs. Renzo plunged like a skittish horse upon the bit, and cried, Patience indeed. But, worthy young man, said the notary, It is the only way to come off well in these affairs. It is troublesome, I confess, but it will soon be over. And since I see you well disposed, I feel an inclination to serve you. 
and will give you another piece of advice for your good, which is to pass on quietly. Look neither to the right nor left, so as to attract notice. If you do this, no one will pay any attention to you, and you will preserve your honor. In one hour, you will be at liberty. There are so many other things to be done that your business will soon be dispatched, and then I will tell them you shall have your liberty, and no one will know you have been in the hands of the law, and you, pursued he, addressing his followers in a tone of severity, do him no harm, because I can take him under my protection. You must do your duty, I know, but remember that this is a worthy and honest youth, who in a little while will be at liberty, and who has regard for his honor. Let nothing appear but that you are three peaceable men, walking together. You understand me. In smoothing his brow and twisting his face into a gracious smile, he said to Renzo, A little prudence. Do as I tell you. Do not look about. Trust to the one who has your interest at heart. And now let us be gone. And the convoy moved forward. But of all these fine speeches, Renzo believed not a word. He understood very well the fears that prevailed over the mind of the notary, and his exhortations only served to confirm him in his purpose to escape, and to this end to act directly contrary to the advice given him. No one must conclude from this that the notary was an inexperienced knave. On the contrary, he was master of his trade, but at the present moment his spirits were agitated. At another time he would have ridiculed any one for pursuing the measures he had now himself employed, but his agitation had deprived him of his accustomed cunning and self-possession. We would recommend, therefore, to all knaves by trade, to maintain on all occasions their sang-froid, or, what is better, to never place themselves in difficult circumstances. Renzo then hardly found himself in the street when he began to look around and listen eagerly. There was not, however, an extraordinary concourse of people, and although on the countenance of more than one passer-by you could read an expression of discontent and sedition, yet each one pursued his way in quietness. Prudence, prudence, murmured the notary behind him. Your honor, young man, your honor. But when Renzo heard three men who were approaching talk of a bakery, of flour concealed, of justice, he began to make signs to them and cough in such a manner as indicated anything but a cold. They looked attentively at the convoy and stopped. Others who had passed by turned back and kept themselves a short distance off. Take care. Be prudent, my good fellow. Do not spoil all. Your honor, your reputation, said the notary in a low voice, but unheeded by Renzo. The men again twisted the pegs. Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, ah! Uh. cried the prisoner. At this cry the crowd thickened around. They gathered from all parts of the street. The convoy was stopped. He is a wicked fellow, said the notary in a whisper to those nearest him. He is a thief taken in the fact. Draw back and let justice have its way. But Renzo perceived that the occasion was favorable. He saw the officers pale and almost dead with fright. If I do not help myself now, thought he, so much the worse for me. And, raising his voice, he cried, my friends, they are carrying me off because I cried bread and justice yesterday. I have done nothing. I am an honest man. Help me. Do not abandon me, my friends. He was answered by a light murmur, which soon changed to a unanimous cry in his favor. The officers ordered, requested, and entreated those nearest them to go off and leave their passage free, but the crowd continued to press around. The officers, at the sight of the danger, left their prisoner, and endeavored to lose themselves in the throng for the purpose of escaping without being observed, and the notary desired heartily to do the same, but found it more difficult on account of his black cloak. Pale as death, he endeavored, by twisting his body, to work his way through the crowd. He studied to appear a stranger who, passing accidentally, had found himself in the crowd like a bit of straw on the ice, and finding himself face to face with a man who looked at him more intently and sternly than the rest, he composed his countenance to a smile, and asked, "'What is the confusion?' "'Oh, you ugly raven,' replied he. "'A, a raven, raven! A, a raven. raven!' resounded from all sides. To the cries they added threats, so that finally, partly with his own legs, partly with the elbows of others, he succeeded in obtaining a release from the squabble. End of chapter 15《ハプター16 of the betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Fly, fly, honest man. Here is a convent. There is a church. This way, this way. Was shouted to Renzo from every side. The advice was not necessary. From the moment that he conceived the hope of extricating himself from the talons of the police, he had determined, if he succeeded, to depart immediately, not only from the city, but the dukedom. Because, thought he, however they may have procured it, they have my name on their books, and with name and surname they will take me again if they choose to do so. As to an asylum, he was determined not to have recourse to it, but in the last extremity because thought he if i can be a bird in the woods i will not be a bird of the cage he then determined to seek his cousin bartolo in the territory of bergamo who had often urged him to establish himself there but to find the road was the difficulty in a part of the city entirely unknown to him he did not know which gate led to bergamo nor if he had known it would he have been able to find it he thought a moment of asking directions from his liberators, but he had for some time had strange suspicions with regard to the obliging sword-cutler, father of four children, so that he did not dare openly declare his design, lest, amidst the crowd, there might be another of the same stamp. He determined, therefore, to hasten from this spot, and ask the way when he should arrive at a place where there would be nothing to fear from the curiosity or the character of others. He said to his liberators, "'Thanks, a thousand thanks, friends.' may heaven reward you and quitting the crowd through a passage made for him he ran down lanes and narrow streets without knowing whither when he thought himself sufficiently removed from the scene of peril he slackened his steps and began to look around for some countenance which might inspire him with confidence enough to make his enquiries but the enquiry would of itself be suspicious time pressed the police recovering from their fright would without a doubt pursue their fugitive the noise of his escape might have reached even there, and in so great a multitude Renzo might pass many judgments in physiognomy before he should find one which seemed favorable. After suffering many to pass whose appearance was unpropitious, he at last summoned courage to address a man who seemed in such haste that Renzo deemed he would not hesitate to answer his questions in order to get rid of him. "'Will you be so good, sir, as to tell me through which gate to go to Bergamo?' "'To Bergamo, through the eastern gate.' take the street to the left you will come to the square of the cathedral then that is enough sir i know the way after that god reward you and he went on hastily by the way pointed out to him and arrived at the square of the cathedral he crossed it passed by the remains of the extinguished bonfire at which he had assisted the day before the bakehouse of the crutches half demolished and still guarded by soldiers and finally reaching the convent of the capuchins and looking at the door of the church he said to himself sighing the friar gave me good advice yesterday when he told me it would be best for me to wait patiently in the church he stopped a moment and seeing that many persons guarded the gate through which he had to pass he felt a repugnance to confront them and hesitated whether it would not be his wisest plan to seek this asylum and deliver his letter but he soon resumed courage saying a bird of the woods as long as i can be who knows me certainly the police cannot be waiting for me at all the gates he looked around therefore and perceiving that no one appeared to notice him and whistling as he went as if from carelessness he approached the gate a company of custom-house officers with the reinforcement of spanish soldiers were stationed precisely at its entrance to keep out persons from abroad who might be attracted by the noise of the tumult to rush into the city their attention was therefore directed beyond the gate and renzo taking advantage of this contrived with a quiet and demure look to pass through as if he were some peaceful traveller, but his heart beat violently. He pursued a path on the right, to avoid the high road, and for some distance he did not dare to look behind him. On, on. He passed hamlets and villages, without asking the name of them, hoping that, whilst he was removing from Milan, he was approaching Bergamo. He looked behind him from time to time while pressing onwards, and rubbing first one wrist, then the other, which bore the red marks from the painful pressure of the manacles. His thoughts were a confused medley of repentance, anxiety, and resentment, and he wearily retraced the circumstances of the preceding night to ascertain what had plunged him into these difficulties, and above all, how they came to know his name. His suspicions rested on the cutler, whose curiosity he well remembered, 
and he had also a confused recollection that after his departure he had continued to talk, but with whom his memory did not serve to inform him. The poor fellow was lost in these speculations. The past was a chaos. He then endeavoured to form some plan for the future, but all other considerations were soon swallowed up in the necessity which he was under of ascertaining the road, and to do this he was obliged to address himself to some one. He was reluctant to name Bergamo, lest it might excite suspicion. Why it should, he knew not. But his mind was prey to vague apprehensions of evil. However, he could not do otherwise. And, as at Milan, he accosted the first passenger whose appearance promised favorably. "'You are out of the road,' replied the traveller, and directed him to a path by which he might regain the high road. Renzo thanked him, and followed the direction, with the intention, however, of keeping the high road in sight without exposing himself to hazard by travelling on it. The project was more easily conceived than executed. In pursuing a zigzag course, from right to left and left to right, in endeavouring still to keep the general direction of the way, he had probably traversed twelve miles, when he was only six miles from Milan. And as to Bergamo, it was a chance if he was not farther from it than when he began his journey. He reflected that this would never do, and he must seek some other expedient. That which occurred to him was to inform himself of the name of some village near the frontier which he would reach by crossroads, and asking the way to that, he enabled to avoid the mention of this dreaded Bergamo, which seemed to him so likely to cause distrust and suspicion. Whilst he was reflecting on the best method of pursuing this plan without awakening conjectures, he saw a green branch hanging from the door of a lonely cottage, some distance beyond a village, and as he had for some time felt the need of refreshment, he thought he could now kill two birds with one stone, and therefore entered the humble dwelling. There was no one within but an old woman, with her distaff by her side, and spindle in her hand. He asked for a mouthful to eat. She offered him some stracchino and some wine. He accepted the food, but refused the wine, of which he felt an intuitive horror since the events of the preceding night. The old woman then began to assail her guest with enquiries of his trade, his journey, and of the news from Milan, of the disturbances of which she had heard some rumours. To her question, "'Where are you going?' he replied, "'I am obliged to go to many places, but if I find a moment of time I should like to stop a while at the village on the road to Bergamo, near the frontier, but in the territory of Milan. What do they call it?' Uh, there must be a village there thought he gorgonzola you mean replied the old woman gorgonzola repeated renzo as if to fix it in his memory is it far from here i don't know for certain perhaps ten or twelve miles if one of my children were here they could tell you and do you think i could reach there by keeping on these pleasant paths without taking the high road where there is so much dust such a quantity of dust it is so long since we have had any rain i think you can you can ask at the first village to the right naming it thank you said renzo carrying off the remains of his bread which was much coarser than what he had lately eaten from the foot of the cross of st dionysius and paying the bill departed he took the road to the right and with the name of Gorgonzola in his mouth, from village to village, he succeeded in reaching it an hour before sunset. He had on his way intended to halt here for some more substantial refreshment. He felt also the need of sleep, but rather than indulge himself in this, he would have dropped dead on the road. His design was to inform himself at the inn of the distance from the Ada, to contrive to obtain some direction to cross paths which led to it, and, after having eaten, to go on his way. Born at the second source of this river, he had often heard that at a certain point, and for some distance, its waters marked the confines of the Milanese and Venetian states. He had no precise idea of the spot where this boundary commenced, but at this time, the principal matter was to reach the river. Provided he could not accomplish it by daylight, he decided to travel as long as the darkness and his strength would permit, and then to wait the approach of day in a field, among brambles or anywhere, where it should please God, an inn accepted. After advancing a few steps in Gorgonzola, he saw a sign, and entering the house, asked the host for a mouthful to eat, and a half-pint of wine, his horror of which had been subdued by his excessive fatigue. "'I pray you to be in haste,' added he, "'for I must continue my journey immediately.' And he said this not only because it was the truth, but from fear that the host, imagining he was going to lodge there, might ask him his name, surname, and whence he came, and what was his business. 
the host replied that he should have what he requested, and Renzo seated himself at the end of a bench near the door. There were in the room some idle people of the neighborhood who, after having discussed the great news from Milan of the preceding day, wondered how affairs were going on. As the circumstances of the rebellion had left their curiosity unsatisfied as to its termination, a sedition neither suppressed nor successful, suspended rather than terminated, an unfinished work, the end of an act rather than of a drama. One of them detached himself from the company, and, approaching the newcomer, asked him, "'If he came from Milan?' "'I?' said Renzo, endeavoring to collect his thoughts for a reply. "'You, if the inquiry be lawful.' Renzo, contracting his mouth, made a sort of inarticulate sound. "'Milan, from what they say, is not a place where one would go now, unless necessity required it.' "'The tumult continues, then?' asked he, with eagerness. "'One must have been on the spot to know if it were so,' said Renzo. "'But do you not come from Milan?' "'I came from Lascate,' replied the youth, who, in the meanwhile, had prepared his answer. He had indeed come from that place, as he had passed through it. He had learned its name from a traveller who had mentioned it, as the first village on his road to Gorgonzola. "'Oh,' said his interrogator, "'I wish you'd come from Milan. But patience, and did you hear nothing from Milan at Lisgate?' It is very possible that others knew something, replied our mountaineer. But I have heard nothing. The inquisitive person rejoined his companions. How far is it from this to Ada? said Renzo to the host, in a low careless tone, as he set before him something to eat. To the Ada, to cross the river. That is, yes, uh, to Ada. Would you cross the bridge of Cassano, or the ferry of Canonica? Uh, where are they? I simply ask from curiosity. Ah, oh, I name them because they are the places chosen by honest people, who are willing to give an account of themselves. That is right, and how far are they? It must be about six miles. Six miles? I, I did not know that, said he. But, resuming an air of indifference, if one wishes to shorten the distance, are there not other places where one might cross? Certainly, replied the host, looking at him with an expression of malignant curiosity, which restrained Renzo from any further inquiry. He drew the dish towards him, and looking at the decanter the host had put on the table, said, Is this wine pure? As gold. Ask all the inhabitants of the village, and hereabouts, but you can judge yourself. So saying, he joined the other customers. Curse the hosts, said Renzo in his heart. The more I know of them, the worse I find them. He began to eat, listening at the same time to the conversation, to learn what was thought in this place of the events in which he had acted so principal a part, and also to discover if there were not some honest man among the company, of whom a poor youth might ask his way without fear of being compelled in return to tell his business. But, said one, tomorrow at the latest, we shall know something from Milan. I am sorry I did not go to Milan this morning, said another. If you will go tomorrow, I will go with you, said two or three. That which I wish to know, replied the first speaker, is if these gentlemen of Milan will think of poor people abroad, or if they will only think of obtaining advantages for themselves. You know how they are. The citizens are proud. They think only of themselves. The villagers are treated as if they were not Christians. We have mouths also, to eat and to give our reasons, said another in a voice as timid as the remark was daring. And since the thing has begun... But he did not think to finish his sentence. It is not only in Milan that they conceal grain, said another with a mysterious air, when suddenly they heard approaching the trampling of a horse. They ran to the door, and recognizing the person who arrived, they went out to receive him. It was a merchant of Milan, who, going frequently to Bergamo on business, was accustomed to pass the night at this inn. And as he had almost always found there the same company, he had formed an acquaintance with all of them. They crowded around him. One held the bridle, another the stirrup. You're welcome. And I am glad to find you all here. Have you made a good journey? Very good. And you all, how do you do? Well, well, what news from Milan? 
ah there is great news truly said the merchant dismounting and leaving his horse in the care of a boy but continued he entering the house with the company perhaps you know by this time better than i do truly we know nothing is it possible well you will hear fine news or rather bad news eh hey, host is my bed unoccupied it is well a glass of wine and my usual dish quick quick because i must go to bed early in order to rise early as i must be at bergamo to dinner and you pursued he seating himself at the table opposite to renzo who continued silent and attentive you know nothing of the mischief of yesterday we heard about yesterday i knew that you must have heard it being here always on guard to watch travellers but to-day what has been done to-day ah to-day then you know nothing of to-day nothing at all no one has passed then let me wet my lips and i will tell you what has happened to-day he filled the glass swallowed its contents and continued to-day my dear friends little was wanting to make the tumult worse than yesterday and i can hardly believe that i am here to tell you for i had nearly given up all thoughts of coming that i might stay to guard my shop what was the matter then said one of his auditors what was the matter i will tell you in beginning to eat he at the same time pursued his relation the company standing on his right and left listened with open mouths and ears renzo without appearing to hear him was in fact the most attentive of all and he ate his last mouthful very very slowly this morning then those vagabonds who made such a hurly-burly yesterday met at the points agreed on and began to run from street to street sending forth cries in order to collect a crowd you know it is with such people as when one sweeps a house the more you sweep the more dirt you have when they thought there were people enough they approached the house of the superintendent of provision as if the atrocities they committed yesterday were not enough to be gentlemen of his character oh the rascals and the abuse they bestowed on him all invention and falsehood he is a worthy punctual man i can say it for i know and i furnish him clothes for his liveries they hurried then towards his house such a mob such faces they passed before my shop such faces the jews of the via crucis are nothing to them and the blasphemies they uttered enough to make one stop one's ears had it not been for fear of observation their intent was the plunder but but said they all but they found the street barricaded and a company of musketeers on guard when they saw this ceremony what would you have done turn back certainly and that is precisely what they did but see if the devil did not carry them there when they came on the corduzio they saw the baker that they had wanted to plunder the day before and what do you think they were doing at this baker's they were distributing bread to purchasers the first gentlemen of the land were there watching over its distribution the mob instigated by the devil rushed upon them furiously and in the twinkling of an eye gentlemen bakers purchasers bread counters benches loaves bags flour all topsy-turvy and the musketeers the musketeers had the vicar's house to guard one can't sing and carry the cross too it was done in the twinkling of an eye i say plunder plunder everything was carried off and then they proposed the amusement of yesterday to burn what remained in the square and make a bonfire and immediately they began the rascals to drag everything out of the house when one among them guess what fine proposal he made what what to gather everything in the shop in a heap and set fire to it and the shop at the same time no sooner said than done did they set fire to it wait a bit an honest man in the neighborhood had an inspiration from heaven he ran into the house ascended the stairs took a crucifix and hung it in front of a window took from the head of the bed two wax candles which had been blessed lit them and placed them right and left of the crucifix the crowd looked up 
there is a little fear of god yet in milan it must be confessed the crowd retired a few would have been sacrilegious enough to set fire to paradise itself but seeing the rest not of their opinion they were obliged to be quiet guess what happened then all the lords of the cathedral in procession with the cross elevated and in pontifical robes and my lord the archpriest began to preach on one side and my lord the penitenziere on the other and then others here and there but honest people what would you do is this the example you set to your children return to your homes you shall have bread at a fair price you can see yourselves the rate is affixed at every corner was it true can you doubt it do you think the lords of the cathedral would come in their robes and declare falsehoods and what did the people do by little and little they dispersed they ran to the corners of the streets the rate was there for those who knew how to read eight ounces of bread for a penny what good fortune the vine is fine if its fruitfulness continues do you know how much flour has been consumed since yesterday as much as would supply the dukedom two months and have they made no good law for us country people what they have done at milan is for the city alone i know not what to tell you for you it must be as god shall direct the tumult has entirely ceased for the present i have not told you all yet here is the best what is there anything more yesterday evening or this morning they have arrested some of the leaders and they have been told that four will be hung hardly was this known when every one betook himself home by the shortest road so as not to be the fifth milan when i left it resembled a convent of monks but will they really hang them undoubtedly and very soon replied the merchant and what will the people do the people will go to see them said the merchant they desired so much to see a man hung that the rascals were about to satisfy their curiosity on the superintendent of provision they will see instead four rogues accompanied by capuchins and friars of the buona morte well they will have richly deserved it it is a providence you see it was a necessary thing they had begun to enter the shops and take what they wanted without putting their hand to their purse if they had been suffered to go on their own way after bread it would have been wine and then something else and i assure you as an honest man keeping a shop it was not a very agreeable idea assuredly not said one of his auditors assuredly, assuredly not, not repeated the others in chorus and continued the merchant it had been in preparation a long while there was a league you know a league a league cabals instigated by the navarres by that cardinal of france you know who has a half barbarous name and who every day offers some new affront to the crown of spain but he aims chiefly at milan because he knows the knave that the strength of the king lies there indeed would you have a proof of it those who made the most noise were strangers people who were never seen before in milan i have forgotten after all to tell you something i heard one of these had been caught in an inn when this cord was touched poor renzo felt a cold shiver and could with difficulty conceal his agitation no one however perceived it and the orator proceeded they do not yet know whence he came by whom he was sent nor what kind of man he was but he was certainly one of the leaders yesterday in the height of the tumult he played the devil then not content with that he began to exhort and propose a fine thing truly to murder all the lords rascal how would poor people live if the lords were killed he was taken however and they found on him an enormous packet of letters after which they were taking him to prison but what do you think his companions who were keeping watch round the inn came in great force and delivered him the rogue and what has become of him it is not known he has escaped or is concealed in milan 
These people find lodging and concealment anywhere, although they have neither house nor home of their own. The devil helps them, but they are sometimes taken in the snare when they least expect it. When the pear is ripe it must fall. It is well known that these letters are in the hands of government, that they contain an account of the whole plot, that many people are implicated, that they have turned the city upside down and would have done much worse. Some say the bakers are rogues, and so say I, but they ought to be hanged at least in a legal manner. There certainly is corn concealed, and the government ought to have spies and find it out, and hang up all that keep it back in company with the bakers, and if they don't, all the city ought to remonstrate again and again, but never allow the villainous practice of entering shops and warehouses for plunder. The little that Renzo had eaten had become poison. It appeared like an age before he dared rise to quit. He felt nailed to the spot. To have moved from the inn in the village, in the midst of the conversation, would have incurred suspicion. He determined to wait till the babbler should cease to speak of him and apply to some other subject. "'And I,' said one of the company, "'who have some experience, know that a tumult like this is no place for an honest man. Therefore I have not suffered my curiosity to conquer me, and have remained quietly at home.' "'And did I move?' said another. "'And I,' added a third, "'if by any chance I had been at Milan, I would have left my business unfinished and returned home.' At this moment, the host approached the corner of the table to see how the stranger came on. Renzo gathered courage to speak, asked for his bill, settled it, and rapidly crossed the threshold, trusting himself to the guardian care of a kind providence. End of chapter 16